The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Anusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an XPRIZE, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Anusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an XPRIZE, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. We've seen 
private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Zanusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an XPRIZE, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Zanusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an XPRIZE, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. 
problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Zanusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an X Prize, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The 
The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Zanusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an X Prize, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Zanusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an X Prize, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond where the industry is. Problems that the markets have failed to solve. To help people really now dig into their imagination, creativity is everywhere. We don't care who you are or where you come from. If you're able to accomplish this task, you win, and that's it. A thousand years ago, it was only the kings and queens who could do anything on a national or regional level. Today, it's all of us. Anyone who's truly passionate, driven by a massively transformative purpose, can go and make a change in the world. We are leveraging the genius of folks from all over the world. The tinkers, the entrepreneurs, the engineers. People who are not satisfied with the way things are and know that it can be better. It's all around hopefulness. It's all about collaboration. The long tail effect of a prize has probably as much value as the prize itself. At every single level. I've seen things go from a paper plane to an actual spaceship. seen 
private spaceflight revolution. $300 million invested into the lunar economy. Over 10 million kids integrated in STEM education work. Technology that increased the rate of cleaning up oil spills. Technology to help keep people safe. To make sure everyone is healthy. Feeding people, educating people, cleaning the air, exploring the oceans or space. We're changing what people believe is possible. We want to have an ideal future, and it's up to us to build that. So no matter what challenge you want to solve, join us on this journey. Just don't be satisfied doing nothing. The XPRIZE Foundation runs incredible large-scale competitions around the world that set very clear, measurable, objective goals. The first person to build, demonstrate this capability wins the prize money. And the world gets the benefits. Anusha Ansari is the CEO of XPRIZE, which sponsors competitions to solve the world's challenges. Competitions and prizes can actually bring innovation to solve not just any problem, but really big, challenging problems. I think we're about setting a high bar. You want to set a goal for people that's inspiring, but it's also hard. When we're designing an X Prize, we're looking for something that is audacious and achievable. Goals that are far beyond. to learning should be given to every child. Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them. If you want to protect the next generation, you have to think about their education. years old. I've been working with the fishermen about one year now. I don't go to school. The thing we need more of now than ever is innovators. would our world be if we had kids who were not afraid to take risks? Who were not afraid to think? 
and insist that they become the best that they can possibly be. Welcome, and thank you for coming to the X Prize Connect Future of Learning Lab. My name is Monica Groves, manager of X Prize Connect, and this lab is the first of its kind for X Prize. You are a part of history today, an active player in X Prize's first foray into hosting fully immersive virtual events. The Future of Learning Lab is creating a vision of an equitable and sustainable future for education and technology. This lab's theme is the power of gaming, and we are ready to showcase how video games and virtual reality can be a catalyst to learn, create, and experience the future. Joining us from all over the world are leaders, innovators, change makers, futurists, educators, creators, and motivators, visionaries, collaborators, and accomplices who are ready to get the work done. We come here with passion coursing through our veins, service in our hearts, and energy in our hands and feet. We come here with ideas, visions, dreams, concepts, and plans, and we are ready to get the work done. Because not only are we talking about the power of gaming, we are talking about the power of learning, the power of collaboration, the power of love, the power of curiosity, the power of kindness, the power of compassion, and we are talking about the power of innovation. We're bringing together leaders from diverse fields to have an immersive experience and step out of the arena of observing problems to become problem solvers with the aid of immersive VR education's engaged platform. We will use virtual reality to see how gaming and VR can make learning accessible, opening the world of tech to more learners and putting the power to change the world right into the next generation's hands. At XPRIZE, our mission is to inspire and empower a global community problem solvers to positively impact our world. We believe the solution to the world's problems can come from anywhere, from anyone. The first ever XPRIZE competition, the $10 million Ansari XPRIZE for suborbital spaceflight captured the world's imagination and catalyzed a multi-billion dollar commercial space industry, representing a massively leveraged philanthropic investment. Since then, we have launched 20 competitions in the areas of energy, environment, civil society, human health and longevity, learning, exploration, and mobility. Our role is to define problems, set the targets, and crowdsource solutions through global competitions to really incentivize the development of technological breakthroughs that accelerate humanity towards a better future. We provide the opportunity and the platform for people to take risks that ultimately lead to solutions that seem out of reach or impossible. Instead of simply celebrating great ideas, we reward innovators who follow through on their vision and create tangible solutions that are validated through extensive testing and judging. XPRIZE's work falls into the domains of environment, exploration, and equity. And XPRIZE Connect's work falls within the equity domain. With equity as our guiding star, this Future of Learning Lab is important because it gives us a chance to really talk about and find solutions to ensuring equity in gaming and VR. Launched in May 2020, XPRIZE Connect was born out of our previous learning prizes and stands as the foundation's initiative to push forward new ideals in learning. Our previous learning prizes were the Adult Literacy X Prize, which incentivized teams across the world to develop apps to help adults increase their English literacy skills and get them on a career pathway. And the Global Learning X Prize incentivized teams across the globe to develop apps on tablets to children in rural Tanzania to deliver education via solar-powered Wi-Fi. The X Prize Connect mission is to create a bold, equitable, and sustainable future for young people through technology. And we are empowering young learners through challenges, learning resources, and experiences, giving them the access to tools they need to build a better future. In these four short months, we have launched Code Games, a global game-making challenge, which calls on young innovators ages 10 to 18 across the world to create fun new video games that envision and ultimately help build a better future for everyone. 
and Next Gen Mass Challenge, which empowers young innovators ages 15 to 24 to aid in the fight against COVID-19 by enhancing an effective solution, in this case, face masks. The next generation of masks will redefine the norm of mask wearing behavior and help sustain crucial preventative health measures. At today's lab, the session will fall in three tracks. The social impact of gaming track will explore the impact of video games as effective tools in learning resilience, forming social communities, and the potential of video games to motivate and create transformative experiences in learning, health, and social emotional development. The virtual reality and immersive education track will explore how using a realistic and immersive simulation can increase engagement and effectiveness in teaching specific topics such as math, social studies, and science, and how it can create social understanding and empathy. And the game-based learning track will explore how to motivate students to learn by using video game design and game elements in learning environments. The goal is to identify tangible and proven examples of gamification that have improved learning outcomes and what the future holds for its incorporation into the new normal of education. As we get ready to move into today's programming, I want to remind you to reference the event schedule for sessions and feel free to stay after sessions to chat with people and be sure to visit the conference hub space where you can connect with other attendees. You never know who your next business partner or co-collaborator might be. We will also have X prizes at booths in the hub conference space from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time from the Rainforest X Prize, the Next Gen Mass Challenge, the Code Games Challenge, and x Prize Rapid Reskilling, so that you can talk to us one-on-one -on -one about these amazing challenges and prizes and how you can get involved. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Gordon Bellamy. Gordon is a visiting scholar at USC Games and head of the USC Bridge Incubator Program, helping to cultivate the next generation of leaders in the craft of gaming. He has played key business and product leadership roles at Tencent, Electronic Arts, as a designer on Madden NFL Football, and MTV, and consulted for numerous companies in the industry. He is the 2018 recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award at GDC and was featured on Nickelodeon for Black History Month for his 25 plus years of contributions to the game industry. Gordon is currently the president and CEO of the Gay Gaming Professionals and is on the board Board of Directors for The Way VR. Bellamy has served as Executive Director for both the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences and the International Game Developers Association. Please join me in welcoming Gordon Bellamy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Monica and the team at XPRIZE. It's really a privilege to be here to be a part of the Virtual Future of Learning Labs. And of course, thank you to the team at Engage for creating this wonderful world for all of us to share. So I am Gordon Bellamy. I'm here from USC Games. And we're going to talk about the power of games and specifically about esports, education, and equity, and how they, they've come together uh, to help us all move forward. So a little bit about me. I love knowing the agenda for any meeting, any discussion, and, or the table of contents, as it were. I love to know the beginning, middle, and end. So I'm going to share that with you for this talk. We're going to begin with my origin story. We're going to talk a bit about the history of esports. We're going to talk about esports and education. And most importantly, about the confluence of esports equity and you and, and your ability to, to impact the world going forward. So a bit about me. Uh, I come from a family of lawyers. My, my brother's a lawyer. My father's a lawyer. I'm actually named after my father's law school professor, Professor Richard Gordon at Georgetown. So uh, I've had expectations set for me. Uh, for as long as I can remember. And maybe some of you know what that's like to have expectations extrinsically placed on you. Um, I studied engineering and my path was to be an environmental attorney. And my focus was hydrology, which is the study of water, in my case, water treatment. Now, one of the great things about college or university is it's really about deciding what you want to do and, and who you want to become. So for me, that that real day of reckoning came, we went on a field trip to the water treatment plant. And that's where you learn how they convert some of the sewage or wastewater back into drinkable water. And I learned two very important things that day. One, 
that I hold these people in the highest regard, who we trust with our drinking water and, and all the crafts associated with that. The second was that I'm not one of those people. That wasn't the path for me. Uh, that wasn't where my true passion was. And as important as to know what you care about, it's important to know, you know what's not right for you. So I started to reflect and think about, you know, well, great. If I'm not going to follow this path, what do I love? What does matter to me? And what I love are sports. Now, I've never been like the greatest athlete or the fastest or the tallest, but I'm very, very passionate about the stories and narratives around sports. So by good fortune, my coursework required that I took a whole year off and I needed to find work. And so I decided I was going to apply to ESPN, the sports network, and EA Sports, which was very new at the time. So I sent my resume off and I got no replies. And I was like, ah, confused because I, I thought with my academic pedigree and my passion for sports, that would be enough. But it wasn't. And so in this case, you know, pressure made some diamonds. I decided to take another more direct approach. In this case, there was a game called NHL Hockey that I loved very dearly. And I called every single person in the credits for that game from the manual. Um, and once again, there were a number of rejections I got along the way, but I got down to the, the credits, to the special thanks, and there was a guy named Jim Simmons who was an external developer. That means he wasn't actually even you know, in-house at the studio. And he picked up and he gave me the opportunity to have an introductory level quality assurance test, like the lowest job in the totem pole, the entry level role at Electronic Arts. Uh, so I go there, spring break, 1993, to take the test. And the way the test worked back then, they'd give you an incomplete piece of software called Alpha Software. So all the features were in, but it was still lots of bugs. And the reason I'm here today is because they gave me a sports game to test. <laughs> they gave me a game called Bulls versus Blazers. And I, once again, my love and passion and my love and passion for games intersected at the right time in the right place. And, and that's why I'm here. If I had gotten a different type of game, I might not have been so fortunate. So I got the job and I went back to work um, that summer at Electronic Arts. And that began my life in games. Um, so I worked on Madden and that was another game, obviously football I love. And back then, the way it worked, games were made on cartridges. And so they'd be manufactured in Japan or Puerto Rico. And then they actually bring them by ship to America. And so that created this great time lag. And the result of that was that they'd have last year's rosters. So you wouldn't have all the rookies and all the trades and all the transactions that, that make football, for me at least, so exciting as you enter into a new year. So I spent my spring to summer working on a workaround for this, trying to problem solve. And so my problem solution was I started to call, because that's what worked for me, every NFL team to get up-to-date rosters so I could arrive at EA with the most up-to-date information like day one. So I show up day one, I've got my big notebook of solutions, <laughs> but that's not what they hired me to do. They hired me there for QA. And so I actually got sent to another building <laughs> to QA test a game called The Haunting Starring Polter Guy and actually learn the craft and as importantly, like learn the humility to be like a great team contributor. Uh, ultimately, that worked out. I ended up making my way back to the Madden team and I was EA's Global Rookie of the Year for all my hard work and end up becoming the lead designer um, on Madden football for a couple of years. And that was great. Um, I, to this day, like, I love EA. I love Madden. Uh, but what I learned was that I also wanted to be living our dreams. Like Madden was someone else's idea and someone else's dream that we were contributing to, but we wanted to do like our own things. And so me and one of my best pals, we actually started our own studio called Z-Axis. We called it Z-Axis because back then uh, making 3D games was a relatively new idea. 
Uh, we grew it up to around 70 people. Ultimately, it was sold to Activision, which is another game publisher. And it's still to this day, like the most important financial decision of my life. Um, I moved to L.A., which is where I am speaking to you from right now. And hopefully around the world, all of you are healthy and safe. Um, and I joined the business development side of the game industry. And by that, that's where you discover other developers and give them a chance to be published and distributed. It's sort of my way of beginning to pay it forward, the good fortune that I would had in the game industry. And I have spent much of the rest of my career, whether that be running the Game Developer Association for the World or published organization, uh, trying to help others move forward. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I'm here today, hopefully to help fuel your passion around esports and, and games. And it's also why five years ago, I entered into the realm of education. So I wanted to help people move from point A to point B with my abilities and connections. So I'm here in LA and in LA, there's a school, USC, University of Southern California, and it happens to be the number one game design and development program in the world. And it's really fun because uh, the way it's set up, there are engineers and designers working together at both the undergraduate and graduate level devoted to games. Um, and now there's creators. So there's streamers and communicators, all facets of the craft working together in a collaborative environment around games as their passion and their career. Some of the great things that have come out of the program are like Journey, you see it on the PlayStation, One Hand Clapping, Walden. Uh, we have a collaboration right now with Walt Disney Imagineering. Lots of exciting things. Uh, I myself teach a class where the PlayStation 4 is the textbook and we play games as canon. And I lead a program called the USC Bridge, which is about professionalizing, which is, you know, how do you, once you make games, how do you grow a community? How do you incorporate? How do you get into the business of games? And of course, as you know, I'm passionate about sports and I'm very passionate about esports. I, in fact, love esports. And I saw that students were getting excited about esports as well. I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, so we worked with teams like LA Valiant, 100 Thieves, Cloud9, uh, Team Liquid to bring esports to USC. And so we formed something called the Esports Student Union. And what the Student Union is about, it's, it's all of our collegiate varsity sports, which are like League of Legends, Hearthstone, Overwatch, and Smash. And we're starting Rocket League this year. And it's run by a hybrid of student and faculty together that, that I advise. And I work in it because I love it. And because esports is a new and quickly growing and thriving industry that runs on passion. And the opportunity to help build those connections between grassroots, like the students who just love and play, and now are starting to create the games, and the professional teams to grow the ecosystem, like that's growing the future of esports. So games have always mattered to me. Uh, they've always been important. And the reason why is because, well, as you can see in VR, I'm, I'm African-American. And when you navigate the world as an African-American, and it's, it's come to the fore this, this summer with social unrest, you navigate with a set of rules. And you're taught them from very young. And part of the joy of games is that it's a place where we all play by the same set of rules. We all start at the same point and move together forward, you know, towards, towards wherever we're heading inside of the game. And creating universes like that for everyone so they can have better understanding and shared experiences matters to me. Something else that matters to me is that you're enough. Um, I think that especially now, uh, there can be so much pressure to achieve or to be validated, whether that be in class, in social media, in competition, that you don't hear enough that you're enough as you are. And so I just want to take this moment with all of you and just, just say that. And we're going to return to that later um, in the talk. But if you take nothing else from today, it's that, that you, you. You are enough. Now, I want to take us back and talk a little bit about the history of esports so you can have some context for what's going on today. Go to my notes. So, uh, 
esports back in the 70s, way back in time, and even the 80s, games were primarily isolated arcade experiences. That, that's what dominated the video game market. The first famous esport athletes were like Billy Mitchell, who had high scores for the games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. The very first esports competition was actually in 1972. And we see we're going back to the black and white pictures. You know it's a way back. Uh, so in 1972, uh, there was a video game event hosted at Stanford University in California. And students, players competed in a game called Space War. And the top prize back then was a one-year subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. For those of you who are super young, a magazine is like a bunch of websites taped together on paper. But that was the prize. And obviously, it's grown in measure since then. Video games broke into the mainstream with a game called Space Invaders. And it's amazing because you can actually see it. If you look up there, okay, that is Space Invaders. And so they had a world championship of Space Invaders that attracted 10,000 players. And this really brought video games out of niche into the public eye. Uh, in fact, in that competition was actually run by a friend of mine, Rebecca Heinemann, uh, who ended up working in the industry for a very long time. But this game, like what you're seeing right above my head, was the very beginning of mainstream esports. Um, later in the 80s, uh, televised esports began. So there's a show called Starcade, where contestants would attempt to beat each other in high scores in arcade games. This was very, very popular. Moving forward into the 90s, well, this technology ushered in a new era of competitive gaming. Games, for the first time in the 90s, had the power of internet connectivity. So online multiplayer became a prominent feature, especially in PC games. And a company you're probably familiar with called Nintendo held their first world championships, and they toured across the USA with their consoles. Now, another breakthrough moment, as big as the Space Invaders, was the first true pro esports event of the modern era, and that was Quake's Red Annihilation. That was in May of 1997. This was over 2,000 entrants on the internet playing one on one, and the top 16 players actually attended E3, which is a large gaming convention that's held every year in the summer. And the grand prize, as you can see in the slide, was a Ferrari 328 GTS owned by one of the programmers. So this was like the moment. This was when games became like aspirational, popular lifestyle. And as things grew on through into the new millennium, which is now 20 years old, more and more internet went to the fore and the prize money went up. So, for example, like, gosh, prize money spiked as high as like a million dollars in 2006. And esports grew in Korea, where StarCraft and WarCraft 3 became uh, very, very popular games. And the presence of so much high-speed internet accessibility uh, grew a culture around online gaming. Europe as well. Um, ESPN hosted Madden competitions. And the scope of tournaments, there were about 10 tournaments in the year 2000. In 2010, there were 260 esports tournaments and brands you may have heard of like major league gaming and intel extreme masters began so in the 2010s hold on a second Boop. this was a big change so television is one thing but twitch and facebook are an entirely different world so in both Twitch and Facebook, we experienced the peak in accessibility and the peak in people being able to get to esports now. So anyone with an interest in esports could dive right now into Twitch programming. So in 2015, Amazon bought Twitch. And so video game streaming is actually integrated into the whole Amazon experience. And if you've seen recently, now it's going to be prime gaming alongside prime music and prime movies and prime shopping. Uh, and what that means is that like games are so far away from being isolated. They're a core experience, especially for young people now in the same way that television was for the generations past or even something as broad as music. So what does that mean? So what that meant was 
the growth of broadcast esports. So League of Legends and Dota 2 become huge spectator sports, and you're seeing one of the championships right there. And why these games specifically? I'll tell you why. One, they're free. They're free to play, yet they're strategically complex. So League of Legends World Championship has taken place. It's going to be in China this year. It's been in the Galen Center, in the Staples Center. It's been in huge stadiums around the world. Uh, They attract performers like Imagine Dragons or even virtual performers like KDA. So if you remember like Stanford Space War Tournament that I was telling you about in 1972 where someone got a magazine subscription, well, now look at what's been born out of that. So, for example, Dota's The International is the prize pool is now well over $25 million per year that's spread between the different winning teams. Other popular games, if you're new to esports, are Valorant, which just came out, uh, Fortnite, CSGO, Smash Brothers, of course, and Overwatch. You just wanted to start to look around at different games to explore to, to find the game that's right for you. So esports in your future, sort of looking a bit ahead. So how big is it now? The total esports revenue stream in 2019 was over $1 billion. Over 453 million people viewed esports last year. Over 57% of them are in Asia Pacific region. By 2022, it's projected that by Reuters, that the esports revenue will be over $1.8 billion. And it's becoming present even more mainstream. So again, so for example, in Japan's Olympics, which will now be in 2021, hopefully, there, there's going to be playing Street Fighter and Rocket League alongside uh, the conventional sports. So streams in separate tournaments, mind you, but still, like, it's going to be part of the Olympic experience for people who are there and for people who are watching and streaming over the internet. So streams are breaking free of the internet now and becoming reintegrated with conventional channels like ESPN, ABC, et cetera. And in fact, as games are becoming even more normalized, esports are too. And you're just as likely as a young person to be watching esports on Sunday as you would be to watching the NFL. Something that's happened with that is the rise of collegiate esports. So there are now currently over 128 collegiate varsity esports programs across North America. And over 100 of those offer some kind of scholarship money for students to participate in the programs. Right now, scholarship money is over $15 million uh, that's spread out between these schools to different students who are either playing or managing or helping the program in some way. Uh, over 100 varsity teams competing this year's uh, TESPA Overwatch Collegiate Championship. TESPA is like an officially partnered organization with Blizzard. And so different ecosystems are growing in different ways because what's unique about esports versus conventional sports is that the games are actually owned by a company. And so they share some of the responsibility for lifting up the ecosystem. So let's just to paint a picture for a, a team. So at USC, where I was telling you about the esports student union, that's about 10 core staff, which are students, about 50 players, 50 varsity players across our four teams, and over 250 members of our clubs. You're just people who just love the games and just love being a part of the culture and the tournaments and the operations thereof. And so the next generation is really embedded with the games all, already. I mean, video games are now indisposable because they're both interactive and they have this widespread appeal. Although they were once looked down upon, it's now everyone plays games. And video games isn't just a hobby, it's a job, right? So many of us, like me, who spent their whole career, and, and possibly some of you will, will actually earn money in and around games. And as demographics, interests, and culture change, esports will only continue to rise. So you might go, well, what am I going to do in esports? What would my career look like? Well, working in esports is not just being a player, but rather the entire ecosystem surrounding esports. 
So you'll see some examples here, like marketing and management for teams and sponsorships is a, a huge area. Like foster them, they foster the networks of communication with teams. They talk to higher ups inside the school and inside organizations. They workshop slogans. They do social media. They do events. And they actually work with the players to do promotional stunts as well. Producing tournaments is its own craft. So, of course, there's teams playing, but there's huge teams that are needed to put on these tournaments from camera people, directors, producers, writers, production assistants. And, of course, making the games being played, designing for esports. Now there's a whole generation of, of esports native young people. There's a generation of people who are creating games and creating experiences for esports. The industry is growing and changing so rapidly that there's likely jobs that you'll have that don't even exist yet. And they're just going to be a matter of you following your passion. And in fact, some of those jobs and roles may be created around your particular passion and creativity. But why work in esports? Even if you love it, how does it help you with tangible skills? So I broke it down like this into four key areas that I feel esports will help you develop in if you choose to pursue it and help work with your teams, whether it be in high school or college. Regardless of your position, being involved in esports, I think teaches valuable and widely applicable skills. So those skills that I've identified are teamwork, professionalism, problem solving, and flexibility. Just talk a little bit more about each of those. So in the case of teamwork, Obviously, the players work with coaches and teammates, but the biz dev and marketing people will naturally collaborate with each other and external organizations to set up those great moments that uh, either fund the organization or spread their acclaim. Professionalism. Now, um, Overwatch League is taking really powerful directions with this, and they, it brings it all the way down to college. I think that one of the great things about esports is it takes people who are experts in one thing and helps them develop skills in areas where they aren't. So, for example, press conferences, conducting yourself with an audience, responding to critique, accepting wins and losses graciously is not something that one always learns directly in school. But as an extracurricular activity, esports are a great place to cultivate these skills. I mean, at the end of the day, it is still a, a bit of a, a business and a fun thing to do. So supporting your organization, you might need to connect with sponsors, but across the board, you're gonna need to be professional and just learn manners of communication. Another very important trait is time management. Days of people who work in esports are crowded. Crowded activities and scheduling is everything. And that's something you'll see, and I'll give some examples that you'll be able to carry over into your academic life. And lastly, like problem solving, Problem solving exists. Like this is a real, once again, it's a confluence. It's entertainment, technology, and competition. It is notoriously hectic. Problems, new problems arise. And problems can snowball into other problems. And sometimes actions need to be taken quickly. And there's a lot of learning by doing. There's an attitude we have at USC where it's like, I don't know this, but let me learn. We really try to empower not only our players to solve problems in the game, the coaches to solve problems between players, the, the cast, the crew and directors to solve problems with the bro broadcast, always be trying to learn, like always learning and always trying to solve. And then lastly, flexibility, which is close to problem solving in that it's a way to solve problems. Like there's a lot of improvisation, a lot of problems that are being presented to you in esports only solvable by you because of how new a problem can be. Plus, it's an entertainment industry, so there are things that are running on off schedule, and you've got to be flexible as a temperament to be successful. Esports and your education. So how does it affect? So I want to draw on two specific examples. So I'll talk about some students. I'll call my student A, call him Andrew. So Andrew at our school was assigned to lead the organization execution of an entire event, the Overwatch Carnival. So the Overwatch Carnival was open to the public. It was a chance you got to meet pro players. You got to obviously play in Overwatch events, uh, play fun events like offline as well to win prizes. And Andrew stepped up and organized and ran all this. Now this he managed to do despite it being his first event and his first time handling event of this size. But 
then what he was able to do was to bring his work, it bring that into his work as a team game designer and lead his team on his first class game project because he had the confidence in some of the best practices he took from running an esports event. My second student, we'll call her Kriana. Her name is Kriana. She actually manages our Overwatch team scheduling and she, what that means is their team well-being as well. So she mediates team conflicts. She leads group outings. She organizes the team bonding activities. Now she is also the art lead on a game project, and she uses her social and organizational skills from management to help her art team do the best work. So I mentioned before the need to be always learning. Well, that's a core tenet in esports. So as a player, keeping up with the current metas and strats, that's key. By nature, esports promotes educational values, like all the roles in esports, whether you be a player, a coach, business, staff, must be up to the challenge of adapting, growing, and learning as things change. Because frankly, there's no precedent. It's a new industry, and every game that comes out is a new curveball. And mistakes will be made. But it's how you learn from those mistakes and how you build and grow. That's how the industry improves. It's basically learning via practice. That's the pedagogy of esports. The skills of esports carry over to school projects and other management skills. So school-level esports, whether that be high school or collegiate, are basically grassroots. And people come together and they learn and they harness that passion and energy into their current operations. And that's why so many people are now able to go out of high school and college esports directly into professional roles, either in the craft or into other, other skills, other crafts, where people see they have those management and team building skills and want to integrate them into their businesses. But remember yourself. And I, I have a quote here. I'll just read it because this print may be small in VR. And this is from Quiana, who I was telling you about. She said, when the team wins, you feel like you win. When the team does badly, you feel bad, and it's hard not to internalize the team status because you're so close to it. But esports has helped me realize that I need to build a work-life balance, and it's taught me the importance of self-care. So I just want to slow down because I know I've been talking about how great esports is. It is, but you are super important, and self-care is super important. So sometimes because of passion, people can overcommit in esports, especially school level where there are no defined work hours. And communication on platforms like Discord and other messaging channels create an attitude of people feeling the need to be constantly available at any hour of the day. Something that we encourage our students to do is to define a work-life balance. And that is to set boundaries. Like, Esports, like any activity, should be done like in healthy moderation. And for example, doing that work at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night should never be happening in anyone's job. It doesn't need to be happening in your esports. So in Kriana's case, I mean, she was always, she was working at the high school level always. She didn't see it as work. She would send messages during class, right before bed, et cetera. And it started to diminish the rest of her life. She was working and was on the verge of burning out. And so she actually stopped injecting her esports work into every facet of her life and set up like clear times so that she could be at her best, both mentally, physically, and socially, and avoid many of the issues that stem just from overworking. And thus, she's now able to enjoy esports and life at the same time. And esports is ready for you. One of the greatest examples of esports. Uh, collegiate and professional success is Sabrina Wong. So Sabrina Wong is awesome. Look her up. I recommend adding her on LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn. She was the leader of the UC Riverside uh, esports program. And then she turned that into an internship at Blizzard for TESPA, that organization I was telling you about before, and then went right into the professional ranks working for LA Valiant, 100 Thieves. And now she's a manager with Evil Geniuses. She also has her own clothing line business that she started as well. All things are possible. Basically, she is able to continue to pursue her passion and build on the skills she developed in school working in esports. A great resource for jobs in esports 
is hitmarkerjobs.com. There are over 5,000 jobs right now, and they're global. And right now, while everyone is working from home, there's a great democratization where wherever you are, you can now work for an esports team. As long as you have internet, you can connect and contribute in the way that you can with your skills. Back as far as 2018, when we looked, there are over 681 companies in 34 countries looking for teams. The the big employers are still like Blizzard and Activision, Riot makes League of Legends and Valorant, Twitch, of course. Uh, But there's so many companies and so many roles, big and small, that you can now get into esports professionally or as an internship. Heck, a great example is Philadelphia Fusion. They were once hiring a meme specialist at $17 an hour. So everything from writing, social media posts, to being an on-camera host, to building like search engine optimization visibility, to managing events or even teams, there's really something for everyone. You just got to get out there and go get them. Which brings me to the change of belief. So younger people, and many people are younger than me, are much more interested in esports than traditional sports. Esports is organic. And for those who are older generation who ridicule it, they just don't understand. And if you watch, I'll go back to Overwatch League, and if you watch it on ABC, and you look at the tweets from all the angry people, it's, it, is, it, is, it is something that is being born natively in your generation. And something to do, if you want to get better, is you should know Slasher. If not, look up Slasher. Look him up on Twitter. His name's Rod Breslau, B-R-E-S-L-A-U. He's the most public advocate for esports. He's appeared on CNN, Fox, major news channels to defend esports from critics. And games are, as we mentioned now, very much a shared experience. It's accessible by all. Like, anyone can play a video game. And anyone can become skilled. Like, physical hindrance especially as there's more and more work being done with accessibility is no longer the barrier that it was, Um, nor is physical location. This has become a breeding ground for diversity, which has become embedded into esports and video games. So the rise in esports is just a small example of the changes in your generation's ideology. So, Violent contact sports have been like hyper masculinized, and that in turn has been normalized. But but this generation is steering away from it. You don't need necessarily to to run towards concussions. You could run towards a host of very competitive activities online. And there's nothing wrong with playing a video game. People used to think, you know, or perceive that games were inferior to traditional sports, but they're not. And as the world progresses and beliefs change, well certain things gain different meanings to newer generations. For It's just as, as, as simple as like, well, back when we could and hopefully will again, like, you know, younger people would eat out more because they enjoy the experience of eating out, but they don't love sitting in booths, which is something I learned. Cause it's, so lots of restaurants that were built around this idea of booth sitting have really struggled because they don't speak and they don't interact in the way that young people do. So esports lines up with the values of your generation especially accessibility and equality and equity. And that leads to inclusion. Plus esports are super fun and engaging and and diversity is good. So what can you do, right? Because you are growing the future. How can we emulate the success of games in cultures and businesses and other industries and even the world? Well, there's a number, like the root of a lot of the problems that exist are unconscious biases and ad- adherence to traditional beliefs. And games and esports, though not completely innocent, have been able to begin breaking away from this. Like these beliefs that in the past were around like a, like a pure reliance on logic and analytical thinking to maximize efficiency, right? A, a disregard for diversity and excluding like really the other half of our intelligence, which is really heart intelligence, which is, which is creativity. Things like the tradition of masculinization and feminization of power roles, right? Like the traditional societal system isn't built to harbor diversity. Boys are often taught, taught, taught to harden up their emotions, to, to man up. 
girls are often taught to defer and please in a system where they were never included. This leads to the development of bias, including against yourself, which in some case can manifest itself by not articulating your strength or, or not applying for jobs. Like, so you, you know, read my story, like, and you've heard a bit, a little bit about me. Like I had my own biases to, to overcome and esports are like now a part of helping other people overcome their own biases. And how do we continue to break away from these biases? Well, first, it's by redefining leadership, starting with ourselves and leading while championing what's possible for the greater good. Expanding our awareness to foster inclusion, diversity, and meaningful engagements in equality and viewing organizational culture differently. Like organizational culture, the culture of groups is a work in progress. It'll never be purely established, but we can always strive to improve it by using inclusive values as your guidelines and making sure that your organizations and your groups and your teams are a safe space for failure and for questions about diversity. And you might ask like, well, why diversity? It's a great question. And I'll tell you why it makes us strong. Like I have no doubt that diversity, that people bringing their uniqueness to the table as additive makes us all stronger. I also feel that it's critical to creative endeavors and that creativity is necessary for us to move forward. I'm saying it's not a checklist or just a process, but actually a natural outcome of justice and us being just to each other. And that starts with you. You are the catalyst that will lead us that'll move us forward away from many of the flawed traditional social and business systems that exist. You actively and consciously performing every day, paying attention to how you act on the world rather than letting the world act on you will make our world a better place. There's a lot of extrinsic things going on right now that are beyond your individual control, but you can have so much impact as an individual in the choices that you make, in your choices, how you're going to be in the world. You have that potential. You are valid. You matter. And you're enough as you are. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you again, XPRIZE. This is just a fantastic event, and I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my contact info here. If you want to continue this conversation, there is my Twitter, my Instagram, my LinkedIn please feel free to add me. Uh, everyone, just have a fantastic day. Hope you're all healthy and safe out there. Uh, and thank you again, XPRIZE. CEO of the Foreign Policy Youth Collaborative Nonprofit. Today, however, I'm speaking to you not as a CEO, but as a 16-year-old high school senior who has grown up in a variety of educational environments. I'd like to talk a little about my personal experiences with gaming, both inside and outside the sphere of education, and how those experiences have shaped me as a student and as a person. My first interaction with online games in a classroom setting was in first grade when we were learning how to touch type. We would spend a couple of hours a week in the school's computer lab playing typing games. These games often had animations to go along with them, cartoon animals dancing or running, stopping or slowing down when you made a mistake, stumbling and hitting obstacles. Their speed and agility would increase as you hit a streak of fluent typing. These games incentivized achievements, often giving you a score and star rating after completing a level, much like beloved apps such as Cut the Rope or Candy Crush. I would play these games for hours and still sometimes do for fun. It was one of the first skills I mastered and has been incredibly useful as every year, more and more of our education is online. From writing essays to doing research, 
the typing games were incredibly influential to my development, and I remember them fondly. Even my friends who hated our computer classes enjoyed these games. It brightened everyone's day and left an atmosphere buzzing with excitement as we lined up outside the computer lab. Touch typing is a skill that is almost vital to success, especially in today's digital world. A task that could be menial and dull was made exciting and fun thanks to a few animations. This is a common and effective tactic when teaching young children. Introduce a storyline, bright colors, and characters. So why does gaming stop appearing in education after early ages? For the next few years, the only aspect of my education that could be considered gaming was trying to use the smart boards that had been newly installed in our classrooms. At that point, they were constantly glitching. To draw a straight line about a foot long with no interruptions would have been a miracle. Nevertheless, teachers attempted to integrate the malfunctioning smart boards into every lesson for the first couple of months of each new school year before giving up and using them as whiteboards. As far as my own experiences go, no one is using gaming in its traditional sense in education. In our chemistry classes, it's fairly common to complete virtual labs, online simulators designed to mimic experiments that can be unsafe for a classroom setting or simply too time consuming for the desired outcome. Teachers are hesitant to give students a jar of an acid and a jar of a base and tell them to just go for it. So we use an online simulator to see the effects of mixing the two, often with other mixtures present as well. Virtual labs were usually either really fun or really boring. The boring ones were the ones with very exact instructions, almost as if we were completing a real lab and needed to follow precise instructions for our safety. The fun ones were the ones that took advantage of the fact that the lab was online and posed no real safety risk allowing us to play around with it. We definitely learned the most when we were given a simulator and free reign to reach a set of objectives and observe reactions to different combinations and ratios. Now, I won't pretend to be an avid gamer. I've dabbled Sonic and Disney Infinity when I was younger, Mario Kart with friends, and this year, to my surprise, I had a Destiny 2 phase. My first experience was with Sonic when I was six years old on the computer of a child care center at our local gym. No one had ever explained the rules to me. I sat down and started pressing random buttons until something happened on the screen, which led to very frustrating sessions of Sonic where I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. There came a point where I was stalled. There was nothing more I could achieve without someone sitting down and explaining the rules to me. At that point, I approached the computers two or three more times before stopping entirely. I lost interest in the game. The same thing happened when I began playing Destiny 2 this year. With a new Stadia subscription, I was quickly drawn into the universe of Destiny, customizing a warlock character. I became enamored with the quick rise of my score, leveling up and gaining new weapons and gear. In Destiny 2, there's a soft cap and a hard cap on your score for each season. Once you hit the soft cap, it becomes much harder to raise your score and practically unfeasible for the average player to reach the hard cap. Once I hit the soft cap and advanced about halfway to the hard cap, it became next to impossible to complete the quest that would raise my points without the weapons I would have received as rewards for completing the quest in question. While my score was rising, I was gaining weapons and gear, and I stayed motivated. I could see myself improving as a player by the day. As soon as my score became stalled and I stopped getting exciting new gear, I lost motivation. The only way to advance beyond that point was to Google different hacks and watch walkthroughs, which takes away from the sense of reward and achievement after finishing quests or fending off enemies. The same thing that had happened with Sonic when I was six happened 10 years later with Destiny 2. In short, once there was no indicator that I was, in some way, advancing, I lost interest and motivation and abandoned the game. One reason why Destiny 2 was so appealing to me is that games with that level of complexity, 
another world with its own backstory, often have female characters that are sexualized or don't represent other cultures in a PC way. Destiny had female characters that wore the same gear as the male characters, just as covered and designed to mimic gear that would actually protect rather than embellish the character's features. While still lacking in its diversity of skin tones, it stayed away from inappropriate representations of other cultures or ethnicities as well. However, Destiny 2 involves mythical species that aren't human, so it's still hard to feel represented in the game by my avatar. The main reason I didn't start playing other games after getting into Destiny 2 was that every time I found one that seemed interesting, the sexualization of female characters prevented me from getting started. If we expand our definition of gaming, I enjoy Sims, and I think it's a great example. A large variety of customization for our characters, one of the best ranges of skin tone I've ever seen in a game, and almost entirely custom placement and size of features. In reality, I struggle to think of video games in which I feel I truly have representation. One of my passions is politics and political theory. Like most high school seniors, I'm currently applying to colleges, filling out form after form of information, completing lists of internships and extracurriculars, and writing dozens of essays about myself and my aspirations. As I work through this stage of life, I find myself wondering about the origins of my interest in politics. The first time I clearly remember feeling passionate about political theory was in my U.S. history and government class in eighth grade. My teacher, Mr. Tahiri, was a big fan of incorporating online simulators and games such as Kahoot. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kahoot. It's essentially a trivia game that factors in speed, accuracy, and the number of correct answers in a row calculating a score that determines a ranking for each player. It's been a staple in my education since I was in elementary school, and we continue to use it enthusiastically today. In Mr. Tahiri's class, we eagerly awaited our end-of-unit Kahoot games, the Silicon Valley classroom environment spurring fierce competition. To my surprise and delight, I had a knack for these Kahoot sessions. In my other classes, I was fairly mediocre at Kahoot games, but this subject matter and my ability to retain it, as well as my competitive nature, practically guaranteed a win in his class. This, of course, made me extremely passionate about U.S. government, a passion that I would later realize I had subconsciously retained. In his class, we also used an online simulator to learn the process that legislation undergoes specifically the process of a bill becoming a law. Playing the role of a president, you observed the proposed bill bounce back and forth between the House and the Senate, eventually reaching you where you could either sign off or veto the bill. When I think about an ideal new gaming experience designed to inspire youth and political theory, it stems from the simulation we played in eighth grade. This experience would consist of a simulation allowing kids to design their own system of government, borrowing from countries around the world, as well as famous theories by Locke, Burke, Bentham, and more. They would have the opportunity to design a national economy, guided by computer-generated characters, and compose bills and legislation, watching it travel through their governmental systems and see the impact it has on their general population. In political theory classes, it's very easy to look at historical shortcomings in political systems around the world and believe that you have a simple solution. In fact, it's human nature. However, so many complexities exist that make political theory an intricate and often unpredictable art when being applied. The new game I'm proposing would be specifically designed to help kids understand these intricacies and learn to think both about the details and the big picture of politics. It would lead them away from black and white thinking in politics, learning to think dialectically. The game would have options to play out four years in about 20 minutes, or alternatively, one hour, 
customizing your experience to either a quick simulation or a more detailed game. If I had had the chance to experience this hypothetical simulator, I would have become invested in politics and realized that it's what I want to pursue much sooner. When I think of the future of learning, I think of a learning environment that can be customized to the individual student's needs. When I was little, I used to go to a French international school in Texas, and I was extremely lucky to naturally learn well in that environment. The methods used to break down complex math problems, provide background for each method used, and prove why those methods work were perfect for my learning style, but not all of my friends were so lucky. Some of my closest friends, who were incredibly intelligent, ran into roadblocks when trying to absorb the information during our math classes, often getting low scores on math tests. Their frustration grew by the week and they were scolded by teachers, regarded as less gifted, and expectations for their success were lowered. Most teachers wouldn't take the time to sit down with them and figure out how they learned, leading to detrimental gaps in their learning. I moved to Silicon Valley when I was 10, and I was thrown into a drastically different learning environment which left huge gaps in the math and science I learned in fifth grade, my first year in California. I was suddenly forced to use new methods to solve math problems instead of being allowed to use the ones that I had already learned that made sense to me. My teachers simply glanced over my papers and declared that they didn't understand the method, so I had to use theirs, without ever taking the time to ask me to explain my work to them. It was extremely frustrating and stalled my learning for a year. For my junior year, I was in an early college program which allowed me to study on a college campus full-time to acquire my high school graduation credits. The minimal interference by professors and general attitude that it was up to the student to find ways to absorb the lectures and complete the work allowed students to use their own strengths to work, and almost all the students in the program saw a great difference from how they were expected to succeed back at their home high schools. Students shouldn't have to rely on personal tutors in order to be taught in a way that makes sense to them and allows them to succeed. The learning experience should be customizable and adjust to an individual's learning style with modules for visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. This is becoming a more realistic goal by the day as we see advancements in technology and gaming. From touch typing to chemistry simulators, technology is fairly integrated into our learning experience, but gaming is rarely used after first or second grade, which happens to be around the time that students begin to lose interest in school and declare that they hate it. In gaming, as long as success is being incentivized, whether that be through progressing in levels or a score that increases, players will stay engaged and continue to strive for success. When looking back at my experience in schools, to me, the future of learning is one in which every student has a more customizable education which sets them on a path to success by using their strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. for the XPRIZE Connect Future of Learning Lab. My name is Brianne Ward, and I'm the project specialist for the XPRIZE Connect team. I'm yeah, I truly do. honored to introduce this dynamic panel of thought leaders dedicated to empowering others. Today, we'll talk about the power of gaming and the impact of games as effective tools in learning resilience, forming social communities, and the potential of video games to motivate and create transformative experiences in learning, health, and social-emotional development. In 2020, we have seen a worldwide epidemic cripple our economy and hold the lives of millions of people and ultimately change our proximity to one another 
James Conigle predicted in 2010 that if we reach a critical mass of gaming hours, we can solve the world's biggest problems like climate change or poverty. And it's estimated that 2.6 billion players play hours on end to save virtual worlds today. So it raised the question, why are we not further along in using games to address issues like mental health? This panel of experts here today are all working on using games to empower people to build skills in virtual worlds they can apply in real life. I'll begin with introducing each of our panelists who will tell them a bit about their work, and then we'll jump into a discussion exploring the potential of gaming and social emotional health. Dr. Keisha Waddell is the executive director for the Center for Blockchain Studies, where she supports the applied understanding of new and emerging technologies. Dr. Keisha Waddell, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and I am so pleased to be a part of this inaugural experience with uh, XPRIZE. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, the Center for Blockchain Studies. Studies. We essentially are a, we've called ourselves where the blockchain education meets wealth building opportunities. Um, the Center for Blockchain Studies is the forward-facing education arm of Black Blockchain Consultants, which is a network of uh, blockchain novices and seasoned professionals who collaborate to understand blockchain technology, where it's headed, you know, how we can profit from the $3.1 trillion industry. And um, we basically are trying to recognize, we recognize the power actually, and we recognize the power of the, and potential of blockchain. And we are basically using our uh, network to educate, empower, and equip our members for the greatest wealth transfer since the creation of the internet. Um, uh, you might be wondering what blockchain is and how it kind of fits in here. Uh, blockchain is a distributed synchronized database containing validated blocks of transactions. And relevant to this discussion, it's important to note that the strength of blockchain technology lies in its consensus protocols based on game theory mechanics, along with peer-to-peer -peer networking and cryptography. Uh, the three work together to enable secure, transparent, immutable, reliable, and validated transactions of uh, value on the internet. Uh, Transactions uh, that are of a digital na na nature, like uh, photographs and video, songs, currency, and even academic credentials, or even of an intangible um, asset type, like patents and trademarks and intellectual property, and then even as well as real assets like real estate property, gold, art, and that's all once it's tokenized to represent uh, a symbol of ownership backed by a legal system. But anyway, it's all made secure and honest by the incorporation of cryptography and game theory. And game theory uh, works to incentivize the collaboration of, of good behavior and an, of anonymous nodes that are distributed globally for the common good of the network. So um, in a purely decentralized blockchain network, like a Bitcoin that you might be familiar with, Cryptography and game theory is critical to making the actions of bad actors not even worth the effort. So that's how blockchain kind of fits in there. But um, beyond my involvement in um, the uh, Center for Blockchain Studies, that is my after my full day job, which is actually being a special education teacher in a public uh, school setting in the suburbs. And um, in my classroom, I am known in my actual district, I'm actually known as a person who integrates technology for transformative teaching and learning experiences, which include um, high tech kind of uh, gaming kind of things that I bring into my classroom and learning experience to just uh, reimagining, um, you know, normal kind of games or gaming techniques in the classroom just to deepen my students' understanding. So um, I look forward to speaking with this, this a steam panel of uh, folks uh, who I know have experiences and probably tools that I would love to use in my classroom, to tell you the truth. So I look forward to that discussion. Thanks. Next, we have Rosemary Lockhurst, who is a writer, technology entrepreneur, and award-winning 
game producer. You may know her from her work on Shadow's Edge, multiple award-winning mobile game. As the producer and narrator, she's helped young people find their inner ninja. Thank you for joining us, Rosemary. Thank you very much for having us here, and I'm honored to be amongst these ladies. Um, to go a little bit deeper into what we do with Shadow's Edge, um, we help young people that have had some kind of hardship in their life, be that a chronic illness or like now with, uh, with what's going on in the world, COVID and others, build resilience through our game. The game is based on narrative therapy and on artistic expression. And it's an adventure game where you have to save a city that has been hit by a storm. And you do that by answering therapeutic questions that you find in the game and by painting, spray painting um, in the game and sharing your art with others in a safe community. So the game is free, we're a nonprofit and we just wanna help as many young people as we can to build strength and to build emotional resilience. Amazing, amazing work. Next joining us today is Jessica Murray. She is the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Sank Studios, a media company designing crazy fun interactive story games that happen to prompt behavior change and real world action. So happy to have you here with us, Jess. Hello, hi everyone. Um, it's so great to be here um, with XPRIZE and with these fabulous women around me. Um, so a little bit more about Wicked Saint Studios. So like you said, we create interactive story games that are wickedly fun and actively good. So get out and change the world good. And so and within our interactive story games, you're able to um, uh, practice playing the hero and dealing with conflict. And then we'll prompt you to actually do something in real life. So you get to play the hero and then become a hero in real life. Um, right now, our next game that's coming out that we're currently working on is called Pathways. So imagine uh, Riverdale meets Game of Thrones, and that's what's happening in Pathways. So again, interactive story game on your mobile phone, um, hopefully be available for young people very soon. It's a young episodic adventure game. And um, all of our um, all of our games are really based on um, conflict, and that's because uh, my partner and I, we've spent the last seven years in peace building. And I do social change communication training. So that's where I'm um, training young activists all over the world in um, how to create strategic messaging, storytelling, and even gameplay to start shifting attitudes and behavior. And we have what we call the tattoo method, which is all about having an audience-centered approach to really um, uh, how to tap into your audience's identity um, and to so that they identify with your characters and your messages and um, your gameplay. So how to take young people on a real-life hero journey. And that's what we're, um, that's what we're all about here at Wicked Saints. Our last panelist today is Ada Palmer. She's a professor of history at the University of Chicago, studying pre-modern European thought, history books, reading, censorship, and information control. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. Thanks. Um, so in terms of games, that's my kind of other hat from my historian hat, which is my science fiction novelist hat. Uh, 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 being the author best known for the Terra Ignota series. But I've been using gaming both in history teaching and now in science fiction teaching. So for a number of years, I've used text space and face-to-face -face live action role playing to teach history. I'm best known for my uh, papal election simulation, which for two weeks every year fills campus with uh, people dressed in long cardinals robes and wandering around campus with swords and everyone knows it's because they're learning history. Uh, but for the pandemic, the university has approved a project of mine called Exoterra, in which I'm creating an online uh, text-based uh, collaborative research community uh, via Discord, in which all of the students from across all different disciplines in campus are pooling their research to design a new civilization to be built on a terraformed exoplanet. And so from our planetology and planetary science labs, we have the details about the planets that they're looking at in the new solar system. And all the different disciplines have to pool their resources to do it. So the economists have to design economic systems. 
the uh, oceanography students have to design the ocean biosphere, the law students have to design the new legal system, and it's allowing all of the students, hundreds of them in many different classes, to do collaborative research toward an aspirational and constructive project, which is building morale and community during the separation of COVID. So a great example of how real research within a gaming sphere can be used to facilitate collaboration and community. All right, thank you all so much. You all do such amazing work. We have some concrete examples of games that can impact learning, health, and resilience from all of you. And so a question for the panel, what do you think is the true potential of gaming for learning social emotional skills? The true potential of games? Um, Rosie, do you want to start us off? Sure. So we've had this question when we, uh, when we wanted to translate our book into something digital. And we looked at, you know, what can we do to create a, a product that is, that is digital and that's comfortable for the next generations? And gaming is just so powerful because it has a few values, I think, within games that you can't really match. And play, for example, has been used for, you know, hundreds of years in psychology. Just nobody has taken it digital so far. And I think just that, that method of really being able to create experiences that people can go through, they can experiment with, you can't really kick your brother under the table, well, at least not more than once, right? But in a video game, you can practice that, and you can get better at it, and you can take those skills back into real life. And I think that's, that's something where gaming has a lot more potential than we see nowadays to really teach people certain things, not just procedures and processes, but really teach them things about themselves and have them experience and practice that. I don't know how you ladies see that. Well, I, I yeah. wanted to add to that, actually. Yeah, I know, you know, working with my students who have, you know, clinical um, uh, disabilities, you know, to include the learning disabilities, reading and that kind of thing, I have to say that um, when they are engaged in gaming, they absolutely tap into almost what a sixth sense, I would say. You know, they make sense of what's going on. Um, they, they engage so deeply, which we understand that's where learning even begins. You know, you bring in your existing um, knowledge and you, um, you know, and, and layer on new information. Um, but the biggest thing I see in terms of the impact with gaming, particularly in the traditional classroom setting, and I'm talking K-12, uh, you know, K-12 serves a certain type or of or, or, profile of a student very well. You know, if you think of the bell curve kind of situation, there's that set of kids who are going to do well no matter what. And then, of course, there's a kind in the middle, um, which, you know, they kind of make it, they don't. And then, of course, the folks on the tail end who are just, this is not going to be the right setting. Gaming allows for everyone to show their expertise. Um, and to be what it is they, they want to be in a safe place. As much as a lot of times uh, educators attempt to make their classroom a safe place to, you know, fail, which we know it's a part of learning. Um, it's not. It's not a safe place, you know. But even if, even if it's a teacher, uh, him or he or herself um, is very, you know, empathetic and, and caring. You know, you got this, the whole set of peer pressure and such like that. That those dynamics that go on in a classroom. So when you're able to take on a persona inside of a game. Um, a gaming situation and this and I'm, I'm not even really just referring to a digital space but just even when you're able to role play and really take on a persona whether it's digital you know offline or online people really get into it I mean I, I see how people change behaviors just at you know at Halloween time when they're able to put a mask on they become a whole nother person you, you know what I mean um, are you do you see do you see that kind of um, behavior, uh, Ada? Like on your in the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, on the campus after the role play. Exactly. Uh, you know the the role play that I do in my uh, Renaissance course is in the midpoint of the class, so they've mm -hmm. already been in class for a couple of weeks. 
-hmm. then there's this moment where they take on different roles and they become different people and they have to negotiate and betray each other and help each <laughs> other and invade France or not invade France, whatever they decide mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Afterward, they know each other's names. Yeah. Uh, afterward, the balance of who speaks in the classroom changes yes. totally yeah. so that it evens out. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot more students who didn't speak before do, and the students who were sort of the hyper-enthusiastic, hyper-engaged students who tend to dominate the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, instead are eager to hear what their peers want and address more of their question to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you were King Charles. When you did this, why did you do it? Instead yeah. of it be, being between them and the teacher. Uh, okay. It's amazing how much, and, and another great example of this, it lingers. Mm -hmm. So that oh. this year, as COVID shut the classrooms down and shut the campus down, it was the students who got to know each other through that role-playing game who kept in touch, formed an online community, supported each other, had the emotional and friendship resilience to cope much better than the mm -hmm. students in other courses because they had that experience of having tried together, failed together, planned together, mm -hmm. uh, and accomplished something together or or on down in flames if they were the losing faction uh, <laughs> but even that is an accomplishment because of course in a game as i stressed to them what your your goal isn't to win your goal is to create an awesome experience for everybody mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. if you're the person who's going to go down in flames that is a great achievement too so long as the going down in flames is exciting and dramatic <laughs> oh my gosh this is so interesting you guys because um and so in peace building, we use role playing a ton. Um, and just in, you know, more to say, like, if you're in the field, like, what would you do in this situation? We also use it for uh, violence prevention training. And so I went to this one violence prevention training where all they, they never told you what to do. They just had you read through scenarios. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what's going on what would you do? And, um, and it's so powerful. And, and again, what you're talking about with experience, like we know that behavior change doesn't happen by giving someone information. Mm -hmm. It happens through experiences. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and that's something that we can give through gameplay, through stories. And it's one of the reasons why I train storytelling in so many places is that, um, you know, you can kind of vicariously have an experience through somebody else. Mm -hmm. But through gameplay, you can be that main character. You can decide how to respond in a situation and then safely experience the consequences of that behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, when we're talking about something that's like, a, you know, a real life type of things as well as what, you know, we really address in our interactive story games. It's like, okay, what do you do when a bully's coming at you? What do you mm -hmm. do if a bully's coming at someone else? What do you do if someone's saying something really uh, racist and hateful? Mm -hmm. If you respond in an aggressive way, the chance of retaliation is really high. Mm -hmm. If you respond passively, you become a bystander and you leave victims vulnerable. But between passive and aggressive, there's all these other ways you could respond. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if you could practice those responses in a safe environment um, where you can still ex get that feedback that you need, but you don't have to um, experience that embarrassment or, or being horrified or, or paralyzed mm -hmm. in a moment when it happens in real life. And, and that's what we found when what led us to interactive story games was actually in the beginning, we started with just having a gamified app where it asked you to go and do missions in real life. And we found that the youth didn't have... Um, they didn't have the self-efficacy. So they mm -hmm. didn't believe in their own ability to accomplish their goal. Mm -hmm. um, and that lack of confidence, so social cognitive theory says that self-efficacy is the number one indicator whether someone will take action or not. Correct. And these youth wanted ways to practice dealing with conflict, having these tough conversations, what to do in these situations before being asked to go be a hero mm -hmm. um, in real life. Mm -hmm. um, Rosie, do you also find this kind of thing with the students that you're working with that like are looking for some kind of experience or or is it something different where they're looking for an escape or something else so i i think because of how we advertise the game in the app store they are trying to actively learn something and in our case because it's it's uh, you know mental resilience what they're what people come to us for is self-care or self-help and so they do know what to expect when they get into the game. 
Um, I think one of the things, the combination of really being able to immerse yourself in a game such as our game, Shadow's Edge, where you have a different world, different characters, they don't really look like humans, you know, it's, there, there, there are things that really give you that suspension of disbelief that video gaming can, can bring, but we then combine that with really proven um, therapeutic processes that take them through what they're going through and actually really teach them something about how they react and mm -hmm. how they uh, process certain situations. Let's say, for example, with COVID now, we've seen a lot of our players really ask these questions about, you know, isolation and how they deal with it. And then we encourage them via challenges within the game to actually reach out to people and that takes them back into real life where they also practice what they did in the game, what they practice in the game, and they take that back to their own life. And I think that's something that we see a lot. So they do know what they're coming for. Um, we do give them that, that clear experience. And as Ada was saying too, you know, there's a bit of role play in there. We're a first person game, but there's a bit of role play in there because you're the savior of the city. And you have that power to actually make the decisions necessary to save that city and to do that you have to dig deep into yourself and really talk about what what you're going through and that that's the basis of narrative therapy that they take back into your life mm. dr keisha what, how do you see that uh, working out oh you know um i was really just thinking i, I know we we're talking about digital gaming a lot but i, I really I am really what I'm seeing. I, I'm thinking about my daughter actually. As you guys were talking, she had a, um, a an experience, a collaborative experience in her first year of college, where she was supposed to uh, kind of exchange different things with different people who she never met before. Um, I forget what the. It's a very, very um, famous study. I was just trying to think of what it is, but anyway, she came. She was very reflective. She realized that she really needed to um, kind of you know, scale up her social skills. You know, she she felt a little um, insecure asking people questions, and that was something she wanted to kind of uh, develop. And and as the game went on, because I guess the, there were so many of them doing this game that people were starting to get a little more comfortable with people coming up to them and asking for exchange or kind of a barter thing or something. I forget how it goes. I'll have to look into it. But but anyway, um, she realizes that she, she started to be a little bit more conscious of her surrounding. You know how, how students and people nowadays have earbuds in their ears all the time and they're not really, they're kind of in their own world. Um, she would have to kind of overhear um, conversations because I guess she had to find certain things and, and when she'd overhear different things, she would approach the, the uh, person to talk. And so anyway, that she came away just really feeling like um, she really needed to increase her skills just from that experience. And again, that was a college, a very large, you know, typical lecture study kind of course. And the outcome of it was so much more than just the task. And it really affected her to date. You know, she's a second year college student. Uh, but yeah, it's I, I really do see that um, you know being able to go into a, to gamify instruction really allows us to cover so many uh, learning outcomes and necessary skill development that um, you know an isolate putting putting them in isolation just just doesn't happen. You know, there's just mm -hmm. uh, we know the 21st century requires uh, critical thinking skills and all of that kind of thing goes on you know, goodness, just simultaneously in a uh, gaming situation, um, from what I understand. <laughs> and even with the digital ones, I see how, uh, uh, I, I see, I have, I have a set of twins, and a lot of times they'll be uh, in their very separate rooms, and they're, I hear them, you know, this conversation going on, but they're not even in the same room, but they're interacting through a game, you know, and it's, it's, it's just interesting to me. So it truly does create Oddly enough, even though they're right there, it does create uh, community. Uh, we have another mm -hmm. girlfriend who's, you know, 52 like myself, and she um, does the, the game with the words or whatever with other people. And I mean, it's just, it, it really does bring in community uh, where you would think it's kind of that, that negative um, perception of, you know, some lonely person in the basement playing games kind of thing. It's hardly that. 
it is definitely much more positive. Yeah. And, and on that point, mm -hmm. that connects to something I'd wanted to bring up where, yeah. which I think is one of the elements that tends to be under tapped in digital gaming mm -hmm. uh, and also in what one might call big budget gaming, because there's lots of small scale indie gaming that makes use of it, which is mm -hmm. the power of generating your own words rather than just ge mm -hmm. words. You know, most of the role play that happens in large scale digital games is you get to a point where there's a choice and you have a palette of five pre written answers the good answer, the medium answer, the mean answer, and the you can only do this because you joined the cult of the cat god answer, right? Uh, and you pick one of those four. And you can have very interesting narrative trees from that, mm -hmm. but it's a different thing from generating your own words. Uh, whether you're generating your own words via speech or via text uh, typing. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of games in, and formats that even a very large-scale digital game can tap. So, for example, a really neat format for a very simple moment within a game is you have people that have characters, they're in a multiplayer situation, and mm -hmm. something comes where one of them has to make a decision. If one of them is... Uh, the head of the space agency and this has to decide which character will be the pilot and which character will be the head of the um, mission control. Or, you know, you've come to a place where somebody has to make a decision as to whether to, you know, uh, pass a law or not. Or somebody is the judge in a trial and has to decide whether they think someone is innocent or guilty. And you can then say, okay, there's going to be a half hour timer and we're connecting the players directly to each other to talk. Mm. Uh, whether by text or voice, and debate this. And you have to embody your character and say the things you think your character would say in the interaction. And then in the end, a real human being makes a real human decision based on your persuasive efforts, and you've used your own words to do it. And it's an immensely powerful tool in gaming. Uh, mm. People talk about it years later. Remember that time when we were playing the game with the space decision, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you do mm -hmm. see people doing that. And mm -hmm. we have medical studies as well, which show that there are a lot of different neurochemicals in the brain, but there are some that we associate with fight or flight reactions, sort of stress mm -hmm. chemicals, yeah. Yeah. the stress chemicals that are generated by living in COVID, the stress chemicals mm -hmm. that are generated by uh, trauma or anxiety, the mm -hmm. stress chemicals that are generated, in fact, by um, uh, by some forms of action gaming. Because when you're doing a really awesome simulator of being chased by terrible monsters, mm -hmm. your brain is also, in addition to being filled with fun, being filled with stress chemicals, which can Correct. do damage Correct. and can linger in your mind a long time after mm -hmm. you finish playing the game in a way mm -hmm. that we think might be damaging. Mm -hmm. they've, mm -hmm. they've monitored these chemicals lingering in the brain for up to two hours after playing a game or watching a film. If you have a conversation with another human being, they go away in 15 minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, the, the, a power of just human interaction is so therapeutic. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that can be integrated into any game just by making it possible for the human beings to create their own words and interact, whether as the whole game or whether as a small node within a game with many other structures. And maybe if I may add to that, I think that a lot of these mainstream games at the moment, they go by a certain formula of what a game should be like, uh, which is a lot of it is, you know, giving people multiple choices, as you say, or, you know, you either do this or you do that. There's, there's limited option. Mm -hmm. We've opted to go for a different way where we try to encourage people to uh, create their own diary and create their own narrative and their own story by writing about what's happening to them in real life and then take that experience back into the game and share it with others. And I think with, with what you said, um, Ada is mm -hmm. it's very powerful if you then through what you are going through and what you are thinking, especially if you're like stressed out or anxious or depressed, mm -hmm. uh, it's very powerful to then connect others through that game in that world that is not, as realistic yet as your real life and you can test those things out and you can experiment yes. with them before you actually take you know what you've learned back into your own life and and hopefully start reaching out we've had we've had players that said you know we, i actually did talk to my parents now i've never done that before and mm -hmm. and it's really rewarding to hear that they take things seriously 
um, that have been created in a game, right? And that they actually came to with their own conclusions yeah. through their own words. Yeah. And I feel like that's so important. It, it disturbs me so much when I hear students feel like they have to, uh, they graduate from traditional education. They feel like they now they learn, you know, now they learn what everything uh, means. So yeah, um, having that connection and that deep connection uh, um, you know, with one another and with themselves is, is tremendous. Um, and, and I have to say, too, I, I think that is one of the tre um, tremendous ads for gaming is that whole idea of, of choice, you know, real choice. Um, and then particularly in the way you're talking about, Rosie, that, that was, that's really dynamic to uh, make it choice that is outside of the, the just show, just choosing C as the answer mindset, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, interesting. You all have noted um, some amazing points of how gaming um, can fill in gaps where other technology may fail, and particularly mm -hmm. within the traditional or mainstream education setting. I wanted mm -hmm. to know what you all think about um, using gaming to support those who have more atypical conditions, those who may fall on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. or those with um, who may have gender dysphoria and are working through gender fluidity, and how we can use gaming um, to improve and understand um, those those areas and also how we can uh, create more acceptance within those people and going back to this idea of resiliency. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've touched on it in the sense that games allow for uh, the, the building of empathy, you know, on, on deeper levels. Um, Ada, you just kind of mentioned how when you talk, when, when in that study, when people talk with one another, it, the information mm -hmm. just kind of disappears in, in 15 minutes. And I think that's the, because the a lot stress of, chemicals, yeah. Oh, the stress, yeah. oh, the stress, oh, the stress. Oh, okay, disregard then. I'm going to take it somewhere else then. Um, yeah, well, then. Um, well, what I was what I was going to get at, well, I misunderstood that what you said then. But what I was going to get at was um, just the whole idea of uh, being able to uh, kind of like what we all have been saying, be able to take a situation and, and really play it out without the the danger of offending someone or what have you. I mean, I feel I feel like the power of gaming is. Um, likened to the power of music, you know, how music is considered the international language kind of thing. Um, there's much that can be uh, conveyed in a gaming situation. And depending on the, the purpose of the game, um, it, it could be used as quite a powerful tool, in which case, again, um, I feel like we really need to teach people um, how to evaluate things because, you know, we have we're, we're using games for good, and there might be some really um, some ideas that we don't want, you know, to get locked in so deeply. But that's we know the power of gaming, and it could go that way and in a negative way. So um, that's where we still need to uh, games also play into making critical decisions and evaluating things so that you can identify, you know, what message is really being sent. You understand what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think inclusion um, and representation and empathy are so important to consider mm -hmm. when um, when building your games. You know, we look at um, when, it, of course, I'm always going <laughs> to go back to like conflict and peace building, but uh, the um, what we tend to do is demonize the other. Mm -hmm. And um, when you demonize the other, it makes it easier to harm that person. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, when you feel like you're under attack, it's also impossible to see the pain and suffering of others. Um, and so that's the amazing thing about games and um, more so games. I'm, I'm more um, even like the, the narrative scope of things is, is when you also have a really strong narrative base, you're mm -hmm. able to identify um, with some of these people yeah. and whether and and you start to form a relationship with these characters, especially if you do the whole character development and they feel real. Um, and it goes a long way to thinking about, okay, so if you, to have this person who, if they're on the spectrum, 
or um, however they may be different, mm -hmm. being able to see them as a, as a person, being able mm -hmm. to interact with them, to see the ways that you interact with them and how it affects them in their, in their life and, mm -hmm. and, and in their happiness um, is, a, is a great way that we can start building um, empathy and really starting to, you know, maybe you can go play the game in their shoes for a while. And, um, yes. and, and so it goes across every, every type of difference. And I really mm -hmm. believe that our inability to deal with difference stops us from making progress mm -hmm. on everything we face. And, um, you know, and then uh, the other thing of inclusion is, you know, whether you're creating a messaging campaign or story, people have to be able to see themselves mm -hmm. in it. Um, and if they don't see themselves, whether it's themselves in the language or the imaging or the, how they identify, then that means that, that uh, whatever that is is not speaking to them. You're not speaking their language. And mm -hmm. so it's so important to have um, this kind of representation within games and so kids can see themselves within mm -hmm. the games and interact. So on kind of both sides of it, whether it's creating empathy for how you treat others or being able to build confidence in who you are and that's okay and seeing yourself represented in games, all those are really powerful um, powerful tools. And again, you go down to kind of this power dynamic that you're talking about, Ada, with, mm -hmm. you know, when people are able to come together and collaborate together and that social um, impact, how how powerful that is. With um, contact theory is about, you know, people, um, it's, it's not about helping the other, but it's about engaging them as a partner to accomplish something together. And that's when you see a reduction of fear and an increase in empathy. And mm -hmm. that's something that these games, um, whether they're they're social games or you get to kind of, you know, dive into this world and practice stuff. Um, there's so many different elements that I don't think that we even tapped into all of it that can really help build relationships and and um, lead to more inclusive society if we're conscious about how we build our games. I know, Rosie, you. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say with all the work that you've done around um, mental illness and things like that and how you've seen it kind of play out with your players. Yeah, we, we do a lot of testing with our players and we do one on one interviews with our players. So it's, it's very interesting to hear back, you know, how they perceive certain things. We've had a lot of communication on our in-game platform about what's going on in the world right now with COVID and how that's making people depressed. But also, you know, we've had uh, discussions around suicide or racism in there. And it, it's interesting to see that. Um, these young people, they do feel all of that and they do want to learn something about it. It's, mm -hmm. it's more that a lot of, a lot of times it's fear, uh, fear of being ignorant that stops them from actually finding mm -hmm. out more about the mm -hmm. other person. We go one step further even with games, which, which to be fair, we don't do a Shadow's Edge at the moment, but I think that we, we will in, in the future. I think games are uniquely positioned to also have us as game developers as industry and how people play the game and what they play and how long they play and what choices they make and why they make those choices to really potentially in real life be able to help them and support them better as well. So we could also use gaming as a very powerful research tool. Agreed. Ada, how do you see that? Uh, do you learn a lot from what you do in your, if, for example, in your real world role play games or mm -hmm. uh, that you take back into teaching? Oh, lots. Um, I think it, there are several points I want to touch on in order and the uh, starting with a through thread on uh, inclusion and also disability. Uh, you know, Rolling to what you were saying and also what Jessica was saying about there being an eagerness among pe young people, especially to learn about inclusion and also an anxiety about how to be sensitive about it mm -hmm. uh, to give an indication of the degree of this eagerness. Uh, you know, I'm disabled myself. I'm a chronic pain and sufferer. And a couple of years ago when I had to miss class for a surgery, I you know, went in front of the class and said, you know, I'm disabled. I'm a chronic pain sufferer. I want to give you a five minute Q and a about it so that you'll understand why I'm missing class. They were so eager to talk about it, mm -hmm. uh, eager for an opportunity to ask about it, to ask how, invisible disabilities broadly work, how to be a good mm. ally, mm -hmm. how, you know, mental illness, which is an invisible disability versus yeah. just dis invisible disabilities that affect the other parts of the body work, that they kept asking questions for the full hour and a half. Uh, and wonderful. afterwards, 13 of them came to my office hours to talk about it more. 
there's so much eagerness to yeah. have yeah. a space to talk about how to be a good ally. Yeah. And gaming can absolutely be that yeah. uh, in a really valuable way, especially when it's cooperative, especially yeah. when there's a team and different people on that team have different roles. Uh, because if, uh, you know, if this is, let's take my Exoterra project where students are designing a new planet, if there's a team that's the agriculture team, uh, and there's a one person on the agriculture team who's a microbiology specialist who knows how the microbes in the soil work. You have to listen to them when it's time to make these decisions, right? They're the expert on this. Uh, everyone else there does plants or does consumption or something. And if that person is uh, on the spectrum and talks in a funny way, mm-hmm. everybody wants to listen to them, practices mm-hmm. listening to them, mm-hmm. right? They get to speak to other people who really care about them, feel authoritative, and be the expert. Mm-hmm. Uh, it works the same way in the historical role play where, you know, only one person is the king of France. <laughs> only one person is the cardinal on. They have things other people need. Mm-hmm. And it means all of the students practice really having a strong reason to interact with a person that they don't personally know mm-hmm. who has mm-hmm. an unusual affect. And the person with the unusual affect has the practice of, oh, my God, everybody in the room is listening to me really seriously and taking me seriously. Nobody mm-hmm. is being a jerk about this. Mm-hmm. It's a very positive experience on both ends of that, enabled by the fact that it's teamwork and everybody has something that they're the only one that contribute to this situation. So it's been immensely effective in that. I want to talk a little bit about representation as well. Uh, which is another space where, again, when teaching these things, it's very effective. So, you know, I, I'm always making a point of pointing out, for example, when historical figures we're looking at are disabled, because often we hear about famous historical figures like Lorenzo de Medici, uh, but because his disabilities were erased in the 19th century, they tend to still be erased. And when you point mm-hmm. out to students, you know, not only Lorenzo de Medici, but also King Charles of France in the period are both what we would in a modern sense call disabled. Mm-hmm. Everyone is super excited by the fact that these major figures, the King of France, uh, mm-hmm. are in this category and it becomes a group, you know, conversation. That said, in a lot of the games where the characters are pre-generated, mm-hmm. there are limits to how much you can represent. Right? Let's imagine you have your five-person squad and you've tried to make them as diverse as possible. They can't cover everything. Uh, and even if they do cover a wide variety of things, the intersectionality won't necessarily be what a particular person is looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that you might have somebody who is an asexual uh, black uh, trans woman. Mm-hmm. And that combo doesn't appear. Like each of those attributes might appear, but they won't be together. Mm-hmm. Uh, And there are also, this is about future-proofing the utility of a game. There are axes of marginalization that we aren't thinking about yet, that have not yet moved into the forefront of discourse that exist, right? But we're constantly expanding how many different categories we're caring about. And there's much more conversation now about trans rights, for example, than there was 10 years ago. Think of the equivalent of that a decade from now that we aren't thinking about yet, but that matters to people and will matter. Yes. When you have an opportunity for the person to design elements of their own character, to create part of the backstory themselves and have that backstory matter, not just be in their own head while they go around being a zombie hunter like everybody else, mm-hmm. but to mm-hmm. in a, embody those attributes in a conversation with another person, in a set of actions, in something they write, you make it possible for your game to g- give representation to every intersectional combination and even to axes of marginalization that don't exist yet, right? Mm -hmm. 30 years from now when we have kids who are genetically engineered and feel Mm -hmm. anxious about that and that's an axis of marginalization which doesn't exist now, Mm -hmm. your game, even if it's 30 years old, can still be powerful and cathartic for that student if you've built in the capacity to have some self-generated elements of the characters. Mm -hmm. That is a powerful point. Oh, I love it. So there's work to do, it sounds like, in this, uh, in this space. Um, but yeah, they, that's entirely powerful. I, I was going to mention how, how oh, I think I may have started to talk about how powerful it is to take on uh, personas, but, but just being yourself in your, in your full mm-hmm. self is more powerful, you know? And, and you mentioned that, that there was a statement you made about uh, the difference between uh, empowerment. It was something you shared with us that really was oh, yes. poignant. Lots of, yeah, lots and lots of games offer a power fantasy. 
right? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of games offer, you are the chosen one and you're the only one who can save the world, mm -hmm. rescue the girl, the wolf. Yeah. cure the <laughs> disease, you know, defeat the dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the special whatever it is, whether it's dragon's blood or whether it's the technology or whether it's just you have protagonismos, right? You have the attribute of being the main character and everything will revolve around you and you will solve it. Uh, you know, those kinds of power fantasies are fun. They're narratively powerful. You know, we've been writing them since Homer's Iliad. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. They aren't the same thing as making a person feel personally powerful mm -hmm. so that when they leave the game, they still feel like they discovered a power that's in them. When you yeah. persuade someone to do something, when your words do the thing, when you were the one who solved the puzzle about how do we make the agriculture grow quickly enough to feed the colony, when mm -hmm. you used your expertise, your unique intervention, mm -hmm. you feel empowered. You discover that you are powerful, and it's the same kinds of power you wield in real life. It's not the, in the game, I can lift a 50-foot sword and mm. swing it around, and in real life I can't. So I'm powerful mm. in the game, but I'm powerless in real mm. life. It's, mm. oh, I won this game by being really persuasive and by mm. really knowing my biology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or I contributed to this team project by being persuasive and knowing my biology. That's true of me in real life, too. Mm. I'm powerful. And yeah. you feel powerful as you leave that kind of game. Yeah. Especially yeah. if it went badly. <laughs> this is the last thing I'll add, and then I want to hear what others say, but there are, uh, you know, students come to me over and over. Nothing is more powerful than when they had a plan in the simulation. It totally failed. Mm -hmm. They were defeated. And mm -hmm. then they had to recover, mm -hmm. and they had to get new allies now that they've been defeated and the other king has won, right? And they have to find the enemies of that king and, and rally a defense and recover from setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and they feel so powerful realizing, oh, everything went wrong and then I turned it around. Yeah. And I reached out to people and I figured out the solutions and we came up with a backup plan and it didn't result in the ideal uh, victory for us, but it ended up in a compromise in which we were okay. That yeah. is so powerful, and games can generate that. The because yeah. if one team wins and another team loses, if you let the story continue, and say, okay, the win was the midpoint. Mm -hmm. Now that <laughs> your papal candidate has failed, how are you going to recover and generate a new base of power and defense in the new situation where you didn't win the election? In the new situation where you know the the first colony you tried to build failed, and you're building a second colony. That is yeah. so empowering in yeah. a way that no 50 foot sword or giant robot ever is because you mm. have to leave those behind when you leave the game. You that's don't right. have to leave behind your ability to recover from failure. And, and truly yeah. that, that's, that's so cool. So powerful. The soft skills yeah. are what transfer. That's, that's, that mm. really answers how games can build resilience that lasts beyond the gameplay, honestly. I think it's it's less the good games really make it less about power but more about building mastery and autonomy to make the right decisions mm -hmm. and to really you know learn something and become better at whatever you're trying to achieve. I think mm -hmm. that's that's something that is really um, unique to gaming versus more traditional um, ways of educating. I, I I believe you know to have that. At, uh, in a playful manner where it's easy, where you can go back and where you can experiment again. Um, that's something that uh, that really resonates, I think. Jessica, you were going to say? Yeah, no, it's so interesting hearing you talk about this. This is one of the things that we're currently trying to, we're currently working through with Pathways is that we know from some of the uh, media behavior change, uh, other types of media that we've used, um, with our organization before that we had worked with, um, we'd use like soap operas and a lot of fiction and um, from comic books and all these different types of fiction. And, and what we found was that when things were so um, fantasy that there was no way, like with superpowers and all this kind of stuff, that um, people created dissonance between themselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what um, what they were capable of, and they actually didn't take the skill away. And so one of the things that we're building in Pathways around this world is, like, we want the world, like, it has to be, it's little futures, so it has to be cool enough where, like, kids want to be there, but... Mm -hmm. um, also has to just be like you have the skills that you have 
and how to reward some of these different skills. So like, like when we have, um, so again, everything you're saying with like, okay, like we're going to, you're going to be able to create the avatar and the main character will reflect you and your backstory. And then when you're going in through the games, instead of just having choices, um, you know, um, one, two, three, we are thinking about how how to kind of do this kind of thing to reflect different strengths of different personalities mm-hmm. and some of these soft skills. And so let's say you have a certain amount of courage points and then you need to spend them on some of these choices. And so we're thinking, okay, you have these three kind of categories of choices. So you have, um, you have like the little humor icon because let's say, because wit can be used to cut down someone and to mock someone, but could also, mm-hmm. humor can also be used to de-escalate a situation. Uh, and then you have like the brain icon for those who are a little bit more intellectual, but kind of like quiet. And then you have the action icon, which is like, okay, I want to step in. And you can step into a fight and make it worse, or you can like get people around you to help surround a victim and, and stop it from happening. And then when you have, and then basically reward different types of traits that are powerful in different types of ways. Mm -hmm. So there's not one way to solve Mm -hmm. something. So let's say you, you take a gamble and choose a choice. So you have to, so it costs a certain amount of points, but let's say you actually used empathy in that choice. Now we're going to reward you some points back. And then the backside, you're actually going to have a, um, what you'll have is like your player stats and instead of having a stat that's full of agility and strength and like all this other stuff maybe Mm -hmm. we have some stats on like empathy and trust building and like courage Mm -hmm. and like some other things so that the young and we can actually Mm -hmm. say like this is actually your personality that we that we found by the choices you've made and being able to kind of again build this confidence and this sense of identity of this is who I am and who I believe myself to be This is, I believe that I can transform relationships. I can transform society, that I have the power to do this. I have these skills. And um, it's, you know, and again, everything that you're saying, Ada, with like, we will allow, most games are, you have to defeat the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've been taught. Right. Um, Someone has to lose in order for us to win. But the, but the way that the world works, it doesn't actually work like that. Um, I'm, you know, if I call someone a racist, I might win my argument in that moment, but is that person any more likely to want to help me in my cause? Probably not, but that's mm-hmm. the person I need most. And so within our game, we're going to allow you to go down the path of, like, defeat the other person. That's the enemy. Let's try to get them kicked out of school. Let's try to, like, ruin them or, like, whatever. And you're probably going to hate this person and you can go down that path, but then you'll see what happens. And you'll probably actually need that person at the end of the day to solve the mystery, to solve the conflict, whatever it is. And so there's so much um, kind of interesting things that you can that you can go into and you can use. And like we're still play testing a lot of this ourselves. Um, but again, this is there's so many ways that you can see if you make impact with these games. You can have your baseline testing, but you can also see how choices evolve over time. Um, and then with our game, we're going mm-hmm. to be able to you're going to practice these different types of behavior and techniques without without it feeling hopefully very practicey. It should feel like entertainment. Um, but build your confidence, and then you're going to be able to unlock missions in real life. And so we're hoping to see that some of this transfers of uh, being more confident to be able to talk about some of these issues and then see when we, when we unlock them if they will go do them in real life. And I'm really excited to kind of see how, how that all plays out. Yeah, I have a couple concrete examples of exactly what you mentioned, which I'd love to say, but I'd love to hear what Hesha wanted to say first. Oh, I think, no, I just wanted to let Jesse go. I think I've talked over her, so you're fine. Go ahead, Aida. Oh, well, you, you've reminded me uh, in the first of, of two, di- two different things. So just where you were talking about how, you know, in a lot of games, we're very powerful in an adversarial way, but it can be uh, developing other kinds of skills that are exciting. You know, I'm in the middle of running another game right now. It's a tabletop and text-based game. Uh, but it's a really powerful and, and very grim game. But, I mean, the, the players in there, I've had players, you know, literally jump out of their chairs and bounce up and down with excitement. I've had players cry. Uh, mm-hmm. And I have one player who, 
his character has achieved amazing stuff. He's re-engineered his entire country. He's literally turned himself into a god. The <laughs> thing he cares most about, the player, is his friendship score with the character's best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, he cares about that so much more than the rest because it's rich and relatable and the best friend character is a very powerful character. He was more excited when he reconciled with his best friend than when he turned himself into a god. Uh, which is a good example of how powerful these kinds of stories can be, uh, which relates to a movement within the science fiction and fantasy world, which is sometimes these days referred to as hope punk. Uh, if you're used to cyberpunk and other sorts of punk, hope punk. But we've noticed that there are so many very dark narratives. Yeah. There's so much grim dark. There's so much, you know, the conspiracy turns out to be worse than everyone thought. There's so many plots where... <laughs> You know, you're learning that there's a some kind of conspiracy. What is it doing? It's doing something terrible. Um, that <laughs> that uh, narratively, it's incredibly powerful and surprising when what turns out to be happening is people are being good. Uh, <laughs> and I can use some some yeah. famous and some non-famous examples of this. But many people saw the film The Martian, and there's that moment mm -hmm. at the beginning where they realize that they left him on Mars, and we have the people at the computer seeing the pictures, and they say, "Well, left him on Mars." We have 24 hours to inform the American people of that because that's our legal duty. So better prepare the press conference to reveal that we've left him on Mars. And it's really surprising, right? Because in every other story, they would cover it up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or in the film Interstellar, where they come across mm -hmm. this secret compound and the secret bunker. What are they doing in the secret bunker? It's the good guys, and they're going to save humanity, and they're full of doctors and medicine. It's so <laughs> surprising. Because it's that, that's what never turns out to be the case. And we're in a point, because narratives have been so dark, that we can tell stories that are more surprising and therefore more yeah. powerful and also more accurate by having the opposite. Right? Thank you. And right. there are these observations people make about how we have so many disaster movies where after the disaster also everybody turns into a terrible person and we have mm -hmm. biker gangs, you know, murdering each other. <laughs> we have so many versions of the trolley problem. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas real life isn't actually like that. In real disasters, people tend to pull together pull and together. cook each other right. gumbo and that's help. Right. But that's not what we depict. Mm -hmm. In real mm -hmm. confrontations, a lot of people try to make peace and come up with a solution that isn't A versus B, somebody has to go down, that is mm -hmm. cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Even when yeah. Google was testing the Google cars and everybody's braced for the trolley problem, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone mm -hmm. wants to ask about the trolley problem with the self-driving cars. Because we're so used to the idea that the universe is going to make us make these grim choices. And then they mm -hmm. ran millions of simulations, and it was never the correct answer to hit the pedestrian. It just mm -hmm. isn't actually true that that happens. It's mm -hmm. always the better choice to protect everybody. That's the mm -hmm. way the real world turns out to work. But because mm -hmm. we discuss the trolley problem so much, because we discuss conspiracy so much, because we mm -hmm. discuss mm -hmm. zero-sum adversarial so much, we mm -hmm. assume that's the way the world works when it isn't. If we mm -hmm. tell them more accurate stories where people are better, mm -hmm. not only is it therapeutic and educational, it's also more exciting narratively. Yeah. yeah. Because it's yeah, I, respect. relatable. Oh, yeah, you know, I love oh. how you've touched on a preferred future state, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. telling narratives that, like you said, are relatable. And Jessica, I absolutely love that you're working towards creating that preferred future state within your game um, and everything you're doing with your team um, to make sure that you have empathy and you have this idea, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you have this, this space where the player can see um, exactly who they are in the game, right? And, and applying that to that narrative data is brought up about real world consequences and, and what will happen um, that's more realistic, I think is an amazing way to get again to that preferred future state. Rosie and Dr. Isha, I wanted to give you both the opportunity to talk about your vision for a preferred future state as we're reaching at the top of the hour. Well, you know what? I really wanted to tap right into what Ada said. I was so glad you brought that whole idea up of changing the narrative, because I do feel like that's exactly what's going on in this moment that we're living in in real life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an African-American uh, woman, and, you know, um, I, I know right now we're, we're as a community, 
changing the economic uh, narrative, you know, um, so, and, and uh, we're changing the narrative in a way that is much more empowering, and um, I, I really, really can appreciate what you're saying, because that's something that I notice in movies and and uh, music, you know, there's just the darkness factor just aids to the fear and everything that's going on right now. So I, that is so empowering. Um, and that's one thing that I, that was one of our questions was to, to think about how it can, you know, how things can be impactful beyond gameplay. That right there, being able to truly change the narrative for what's really um, the truth about things. It's just not a trajectory to, to hell kind of thing necessarily, you know, it doesn't just have to be. Particularly when I know I'm here and I know most people around me are like me who are more good and looking to do good, you know, you know, so you, that was, that was tremendous. Yeah, I, I, I'm very, very encouraged by that. And truly, even in my classroom, when I've allowed uh, my students to just, you know, just, at, you know, really be themselves and just, uh, add to a project. It, they they struggle with that because of some of the things you just mentioned, uh, Jessica, about how um, that the opportunity to um, exercise that uh, on a day to day. And you know, students in K twelve setting are in school probably more well prior to COVID in school more than they're with their parents and and whatnot a lot of times. You know, uh, and it has quite an impact on them. So uh, for them to to uh, get into a, a, a have an opportunity of choice and then the choice they actually make is beautiful it's a beautiful thing to see it really really is um so so yeah very good point Ada. great and so rosie your vision um for a preferred future state within gaming as it pertains to mental health and well-being um, do you have any final thoughts there sure um so I think that there are a lot of mainstream games now that touch on the topic of mental health, um, like Zelda with their suicide scene that they have. There's there's a bunch of them that have characters that have uh, you know certain um, traits like depression or other things. I would love to see more of that, but in a more accurate way because now it's always it's not somebody has depression or somebody stressed out, but it's somebody's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's less, you know, somebody has um, issues and, and feels terrible and doesn't mm -hmm. know how to react to things, mm -hmm. but it's they're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And I think that really being able to portray these characters more accurately when we then do choose those characters, that would be something that I'd really love to see more in gaming. The other thing is that I think that there's a lot of gamers and a lot of players that want to do something good, and that's a trend we see really going up. We see that in our game where, you know, so many of our players actually come to us and then want to help us make the game better. Mm -hmm. um, so I would really love it if more of, of not just indie gamers but also bigger games would actually really take that seriously and, and take the input of their players who are wanting to do the right thing mm -hmm. into the game different narratives and, and, and stories around, uh, you know, real situations, I think, that we can that we can use more of the real world within gaming so that then it is easier to take what we learn in games back into the real world. That would be my, my preferred future state, if you will. Agreed, yes. Excellent, excellent. So as we reach the top of our hour, I'm so saddened, but <laughs> filled with such gratitude that I had opportunity to grace this stage with your brilliant minds um, and to be a part of this amazing discussion today. Um, for everyone in the audience and everyone watching our live stream, I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to follow your work and that we can still continue this conversation because as we've noted today, we, we have a lot of work to do, um, but we're getting there. So if all of you could just share maybe your Twitter handles or digital spaces that you can follow and keep to debate. Um, that'd be a great way for us to close out. Well, I'll start. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at um, my full name, Keisha um, Waddell. And I'm also on Twitter at Dr. Keisha Waddell. Um, and then certainly you can follow me on uh, Facebook under, with uh, Black Blockchain Consultants. 
Uh, for me, it's even easier. Shadow's Edge <laughs> is the name of the game. And around that, there's the .com for the website. You can find Shadow's Edge on Instagram, Facebook, etc. All of those, including the website, will then also lead back to me and to my profile. And we have an, an, a direct email if somebody wants to contact us. That's feedback at shadowsedge.com. And um, you can find Wicked Saints. You can follow us on Twitter. It's Wicked underscore Saints. And on Instagram, it's Wicked Saints Studios. Um, so you can find us there. You can find me on both Instagram and Facebook or on um, Twitter as well. Jessica Murray, no space, and it's Murray with an E. <laughs> and, of course, our website. So wickedsaints.studio. And there you can also sign up to beta test our um, pathways for when it comes out. Um, Mm -hmm. And everything, every email that goes through to there, I'll see. And so, um, yep, please feel free to reach out and or sign up for our pathways game. You can find information about all the things I do at adapalmer.com. You can find my history information via University of Chicago's history department. You can find my novels, starting with uh, Too Like the Lightning, which is the first volume, T-O-O, as in Too Much, Too Like the Lightning, first volume of Terra Ignota. I also have a blog, exurbe, E-X-U-R-B-E dot com, where I blog about uh, how history works. The most recent post is a set of uh, healthy work habit and self-care guides customized for COVID, which I produced for my university and the, which synthesize uh, national research with my own chronic pain and experience uh, to get, give guidelines for what the WHO has recognized as a global mental health epidemic. Uh, mm-hmm. And the second most recent one is, is about the Black Death and COVID and what we can learn about what the aftermath of COVID will be like from looking at the Black Death. Answer, it's more complicated than most of the short op-eds have been giving you, which is why my version is a 10,000-word blog post. Uh, As for Exoterra, the current game uh, where the students are creating a terraformed exoplanet, you can find that at voices.u, that's the letter u, chicago.edu slash exoterra. So voices.uchicago.edu slash exoterra. So if you email me, I will, of course, point you at anything you like, and my email is available on adapalmer.com. Twitter is Ada underscore Palmer. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, it's such a pleasure to continue the conversation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been an honor. It's great. Thank you for having us. <laughs> everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining me. My name is Julie Smithson and today I'm going to be talking about the creative design process for 3D. And um, I'm going to be using our Metaverse engine as a demonstration tool to be showing uh, through my presentation. And I'm really excited to be able to introduce the concept of 3D as well as our, our Metaverse engine to help you understand Um, a creator tool and the creative design process for for 3D. So a little bit about myself. Um, Again, my name is Julie Smithson and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Metaverse. I also co-founded XR Ignite and I'm the producer of XR Collaboration. I also am a VRARA member and education student co-chair as well as an XR Bootcamp Advisory Member and Educators and VR Member. So I'm very heavily involved in the education space, uh, as well as understanding how this technology works with enterprise and business organizations. A little bit about our Metaverse family. We have uh, our Metaverse company, which started about four or five years ago, and we started with strategy and consulting, uh, doing projects, everything from augmented reality, 360 video, virtual reality, teleportals, uh, web AR. We we kind of dabbled in all of it just to make sure that we understood where this industry was going and how business was going to be interpreted and how the technology would unfold within uh, within the future of work. 
Um, we also have our Metaverse engine, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about that. We also have XR Ignite, where we're, we actually uh, started this company to help startups understand how to work with business organizations. And um, throughout that, we also built out some resources that we host on xrcollaboration.com. And I'll touch base a little bit later in my presentation about that. We also have our podcasts. Um, I actually host the XR for Learning podcast. And um, it's through there that we talk about the different ways that you learn and you teach. My partner and husband also has XR for Business podcast. And that's where if you want to learn about where, what all of these big companies are doing out there with this technology, um, Alan really gets into the nitty gritty of understanding um, even more about the business applications of XR. So that's our metaverse family. Let's get into uh, a little bit about my story and where I came from back in 2010. Um, my partner, uh, husband, Alan and I, we, we actually created the emulator. The emulator was the world's first touchscreen DJ controller uh, back in 2010 and around Dragon's Den. That was kind of my pathway into technology and understanding the potential of even touchscreen. Um, and it was from there that we, were introduced into, uh, into the VR world and technology world where obviously I'm here today understanding the potential of, and use cases of how we're going to use this technology. This is my daughter and um, right after we had the, the, the emulator company, we, we actually um, ended up inspiring our daughter to create a shoe company and it was within um, this uh, time of her life. She was nine at, at this time, and uh, today she's 16 years old, but for a few years, um, she actually produced 2,000 pairs of shoes and um, sold them, and the idea was the love sandal that left a heart-shaped tan line on the top of your foot. It was through this entrepreneurial experience that we understood how much education you needed to change and change for the better. And then our personal mission, we actually started to build out the Unlimited Awesome Academy. And it's it saw from, you know, creative problem solving and teamwork, um, responsibility for your finances and, and economics and having that social impact um, through sustainability of the environment, and of course, perseverance. And it was through this mission that we decided we, would, uh, we wanted to focus on democratizing education by 2040, inspiring the next generation to think and act in an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable way. And to do that, we would leverage the most advanced immersive technologies in the world. And here I am standing on the stage today in a virtual space. So just overview of the immersive technologies, you know, we have the 2D view in our smartphones. Um, we can also look at 360 degrees. Uh, we also have augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed realities. Um, all together, uh, extended realities is where we are in this space and, and uh, you know, using them on a daily basis, we're starting to integrate these technologies more and more into, into our lives. So let's talk about 3D enabled devices. And right now, you know, with all of these devices that are out there, the computers, tablets, smartphones, and the headsets, there are actually 7.5 billion 3D enabled devices globally out there already and that people are using that we can start to introduce the concept of three-dimensional objects and spatial objects that need to that are used inside of these technologies like virtual and augmented reality experiences um, that are used for different purposes so this is uh, this is kind of why we're we're talking about 3d now you know why xr why now um, you know, for years we've had the personal computer and then mobile took over. And, you know, as of 2020, uh, XR is starting to take over and all of these different technologies. So right now we're in this upswing of how, uh, of the investments that are being made in this space. So it's really important that we understand how this technology will impact everything that we're doing on a daily basis. 
a little bit of reality ever since COVID, um, uh, you know, in, <laughs> invaded our lives. Um, it forced us apart, but this technology has made it possible for us to learn and interact with one another while remaining physically distant. And, you know, being here today on the XPRIZE stage is certainly um, an example of coming together and being able to use this technology to to uh, continue conversations and collaboration. And this quote actually came from XR Collaboration in our mission to uh, build out those resources. So a little bit of reality in this COVID acceleration and how fast things are going. Um, coming right from Nike, uh, they originally targeted 35% of their sales for 2020 to be made online. And they're already reaching that 50% overall sales and now for the foreseeable future will be made online. So already the trend of purchasing online and digitally interacting um, to uh, purchase items like Nike are taking place. And, and this is actually you know, a pivotal move in, in how uh, humans are behaving with this technology and how, how trustworthy they are in, in even their purchase decisions. So, um, a little bit about the ROI on, on the investment in this space, and we're already seeing everything between commerce, marketing, and training. Uh, the numbers of sales conversions going up, um, marketing click-through rates are going up, the increase of retention rates are already going up, and through all of those number changes, companies are obviously saving money and uh, resources. So already the benefits are starting to play out in how it's implemented into the business world. The many use cases of immersive technology can be used from uh, retail and marketing, of course, with face filters and e-commerce transactions, but also through education and product design, out of visualization, uh, education and training for healthcare and medical, um, industrial uh, design and training manuals are, are starting to be implemented and used using augmented reality. And then, of course, entertainment always plays a big part in actually being as immersed, as immersed as possible through all the sensory, um, through all the sensory uh, avenues to, to immerse you into those experiences. So immersive technology is already playing a part in many different industries. And through mixed reality, uh, they're also solving big, huge enterprise problems like remote assistance and collaborative visualization and um, access to, to certain data that businesses make uh, decisions moving forward. So all of these different companies and enterprises are already starting to use this technology, which is really important. And companies like IKEA placing uh, furniture in your space or um, Modiface using uh, AR for face filters. Uh, companies, restaurants are using their menus to augment what those meals look like and um, you know, placing activities within the menus in restaurants. Uh, being able to see some of these uh, retail items through your devices and being able to interact with them obviously leads you down that purchasing decision a lot quicker. Um, GPS tracking through stores to help you find things um, and interaction with characters from certain TV shows using AR. All of these play out into um, amazing to interact with others and uh, that engaging experience to understand whether it's the product or, or the situation um, better. And the best business and education and training applications are really the ones that are expensive or rare, impossible, that they're really dangerous, um, or even counterproductive. You know, everything from body swapping and time travel, taking field trips to places where, you know, you really can't have access to, or you don't even have the money to go there. Um, you know, being able to put students inside these experiences and having them, them go wherever they need to go, or, um, you know, studying what the behaviors of others are like. This technology allows all of these different possibilities to, to become real and for us to experience them. And it does take um, the development side to be able to create these things. So I guess, first of all, I'd like to just acknowledge the stage that we're on here today uh, with XPRIZE. And, you know, we have an environment and we also have a lot of different things going on. Um, you know, we have animations above us and different signs. Um, 
you know, there's cabling ribbon through, and the, the floors are through. So all of these things obviously took a design process to create the environment that we're here in today. So, you know, what does that look like for XR? And really the creative design process, Build XR, requires you to think spatially and in three dimensions. So for us to walk around the stage, we obviously know that there's something above us, below us, each side behind us there's so many different things i have this podium here me and i can look around it and i can actually move around it as well i can move all around this room and it's because i understand that we are in this spatial uh, room this 360 degree space where uh, our entire our entire being is in by all of these different assets that are in our environment. So thinking spatially, thinking um, the ability that uh, things are around you is the first step to designing in, in 3D. So 3D actually stimulates the real thing. It builds connections and it invites interactivity. Um, it sparks curiosity and it makes learning fun. We have access to over 7 billion devices. So it's really that next step to understanding why and how we need to build an augmented reality, virtual and the mixed realities. It's that stepping stone. Understanding three dimensions and, and understanding things spatially is where things all begin. So last year I did a talk or I did a, I wrote an article on um, 3D learning and how to you know introduce it and it's really introducing um, and thinking more in voxels now instead of pixels we're moving from 2D into 3D so how do we start to think spatially start to think in voxels and how we build things and that spaceship on the back there of the stage is a perfect example of know just building blocks and in, in how you need to start to think in a, a spatial way so this leads us to degrees of freedom um, which is used in in a virtual setting when you have a headset on being able to see things in a three degree of freedom just looking around and, and seeing your space but Six degrees of freedom obviously allows you to interact and move within your space. And, and that's where the immersive really steps into it. And, and, you know, being able to go sideways, up and down and forward and pitch and, and move around um, allows you to interact and become more immersed into the scene that you're in. So this is kind of the definition of the degrees of freedom inside the space. So the first step in designing in 3D is really just understanding more about depth and dimension and that spatial understanding um, of multiple different perspectives. And when you're considering building XR, you have to think of a lot of different things. You know, you can start to think about security and logins and that sort of thing, and that's all very important. And that's part of that process when you're building an XR. Um, but there's also, you know, understanding the natural interactions and um, being contextually aware about the things that are around you. And if you have an avatar beside you that you're speaking to, that you understand their space or you understand where the podium is in, in your world. Um, there's a lot of other things like uh, collaborating real time and managing your assets inside of the space or, or even just uh, in the designer mode of, of the digital assets. Um, being able to manage all of these things is part of building an XR. Um, but we're going to get back to uh, 3D and how we can uh, use that to creatively design um, for XR. And um, a little bit about the Metaverse Engine, because I'm going to be using this to uh, show you examples and, and give you instruction on how the design process works. Um, our Metaverse Engine, we just recently released at AWE in June. We're we excited that we could uh, pull forward our development a lot sooner than planned. We were expected to release at CES in 2021, and due to COVID, we we pulled up our delivery date, and we're really excited that we're able to launch um, 3D for the web and AR as well, based on our one app solution. And um, we're working towards um, building out the virtual and um, the virtual uh, support for our system. So uh, that'll be delivered in Q4. 
Well, let's take it back to 3D and that stepping stone that we need to take in order to understand more about immersive technologies. 3D, remember, um, represents it can rep represent content and data visually, and you can also use it to interact and learn and collaborate, presenting a story, a timeline, or a visualization. And it can be used for marketing, commerce, training, and education. So let's talk about 3D for a moment and what it takes to become an asset. And uh, once you have your object that you would like to place in this space, uh, it basically starts off with a layer of mesh. And this mesh comes with polygons. And these polygons all really um, start to uh, invite the uh, different perspective and the customization of the object itself. So when we talk about mesh and we talk about polygons, each asset has its own package of how it needs to be entered into a system, augmented or virtual reality. Just like these items here in this space, they, they were an asset that was dropped into this virtual world. So um, throughout my presentation, if you, see, if you do see a QR code like this one, you're welcome to take a screenshot of it. Or if you're on a desktop, you can actually pull out your smartphone. Um, the QR code will take you to some of our live experiences that you can also uh, take a look at on our metaverse.com slash case page. And these are some, ex some examples of 3D, um, which unfortunately I can't show you the new live animated version here in the space, but um, I hope you do go and try them out. Um, this is an example of our uh, shoe configurator where you can go in and design your own pair of shoes. And the shoes show up in your space, whether they be augmented or just in 3D in your device. And you're able to interact with that shoe and change the colors, the tongue, the laces, the sole. You're able to change all of it. And it's through our engine that you can simply make this experience and build the configurator out to uh, be able to look at the different perspectives. Um, to give you an example of spatial design, again, Lowe's has it right with using a device to be able to show the layout of the architecture of the space that you're willing to build. And that's the same thing when it comes back to 3D models and 3D assets, being able to visualize your space. So when you're creating 3D models, um, you always have to create your own, your own assets. Sometimes they're already made for you, but just so you know where to go to be able to make your 3D models, these are some of the softwares that are out there where you can um, build out your, uh, the models to, to your liking. You can use photogrammetry or or upload CAD files and that sort of thing. And that, these are some of the softwares that are, that uh, support that. So once you've created your 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 model, um, and if you get it at one of these stores, CG Trader, Sketchfab, uh, Turbo Squid, all these um, locations, they all have a library of 3D assets where. Some of them have free models and some of them are actually uh, you have to pay for depending on the intricacy or the, um, the amount of detail that are in the actual asset itself. So there's a lot of places that you can go to get your 3D models and they do come in different formats. Um, and these are the most common ones. Our engine automatically uses OBJ and FBX. And then within the next four weeks, we're releasing the support for USDZ and GLTF. Um, so we're starting to support a lot of CAD files as well that can be uploaded into our engine um, for access uh, to be able to manipulate and work with them. Um, a little bit about our engine in comparison with Unity Unreal and Unreal, um, the two other engines that are out there. Uh, Metaverse was built to be that introductory 3D engine for, for anybody to use. It, it really does um, take the relief of coding off of anybody who is wishing to design in 3D. Um, our, our engine is actually low code and no code. And we use JavaScript on the back end to um, and you're actually able to enter any JavaScript uh, in our uh, system to add further animations or environments and that sort of thing. But we did build out code snippets that allow you to drag and drop certain things that make it easy, like a configurator or adding a button to your, an interactive button to your scene. Um, this is where the code snippets come in. The average learning curve for engine is actually two to four weeks um, compared to some of the other longer times in Unity and Unreal. Um, 
last week I proved myself in, in the fact that I did a, uh, a presentation in the same day that I fully learned our engine and was able to present it to others. Uh, it really took me six hours to gain the understanding of our engine and then I presented to 180 university students um, the same presentation and uh, was able to have that confidence to understand everything about the engine. Uh, the development time to be able to develop anything can be as little as an hour, two hours to one to two weeks, depending on the complexity of the program uh, or the, the experience that you're building compared to months of development time in the other engines. Now, the other engines, they obviously have their purposes. They, they're, you know, a lot more detailed, especially in the gaming or, or more intricate in experiences. And you do need that, uh, those engines to be able to create the graphics detail that's required for them. Um, but they are applications and you need an app to be able to access them and download that. Uh, Metaverse Engine, we are web enabled and um, it's released automatically and published automatically right to um, the options of iOS or Android or QR code or an embed code for your website. So we made it, we've made it extremely easy. I, I'd love to introduce you to our uh, Metaverse Engine uh, video intro. You can take a look at it on our website. There is a QR code that'll take you right there. So a little bit about the uh, uh, the Metaverse Engine and and the benefits of it. Uh, the rapid prototyping is really key, especially during this time of rapid innovation and the need for our um, for enterprise and business to be able to quickly solve the problems that they need to in their business or organization. So already we're seeing design time reduction when it comes to rapid prototyping. And I think this is really key in our engine today is just trying to figure out what to do, what to use and be able to quickly flip that over into uh, something that can be presented or decided um, you know, quickly whether the the actual object is going to work or or not or the process is going to work so um the engine also as i, I said before with the shoe being able to design uh your preference and um you know have what uh you know use it in your um marketing campaigns being able to custom design things obviously increases your sales conversion and we're already seeing that um in some of the examples that we're building um, the product configuration of being able to see whether you like a car uh, one way or in one color or another, uh, the interior design, being able to see if you can see in your driveway and sit in a parking spot or a parking garage, um, that obviously closes the sale of these these um, products a lot faster. And um, that's uh, that's one of the benefits about our engine and of designing in 3D. Um, product showcasing things in three dimensions is really important. Try before you buy. Place it in your space before you uh, before you decide to buy that and have it moved in and shuffling the furniture. Um, this can also be applied to virtual events or to uh, to any kind of um, new design framework. You know, it, being able to design it to see if it works before you actually physically make all of the changes to your household or, or space that you're working with. Uh, virtual showrooms, same thing. If you could see what the bathtub could look like in your new in your new bathroom or vanity sink, which marble color you like, being able to visualize that space before you actually implement it is possible. And being able to see it in three dimensions and alternate between those different colors or styles is really important to uh, to be able to have that user immersed in that experience to see what it would really like if it was this way or from this different perspective. Remote training and education. This is, I think, one of the biggest potentials for our engine and being able to uh, explain things, being able to place images in, in the space to be able to show the user what it, something is really like or explain something. Uh, this experience here uh, that we have on our website is about the solar system. And when you go in and you take a look at your so the solar system, you can actually see all of the planets moving in real time and in the pace that they're moving around the sun. You can place this in your space 
in an augmented way. So you can see the the planets in you know in a field and see between them and see how you know what the distance is. Um, you can even just have it on your phone and play around with it in 3D, um, taking a look at the Earth's inner core, comparing the the planets Mercury to Saturn and how big they are. Uh, this type of interaction and being able to showcase this to another user um, where they can be immersed into that experience and learn for themselves, um, you know, taking a closer look up to the sun or, or those rings, um, you know, the rings around Saturn just to, to see what, uh, you know, what they look up like up close. So this is just one example of how education and training can uh, reduce uh, the training time and increase the retention rates and the interest level of just being able to learn about that subject. 3D instructions and manuals. This is where I believe there is a massive potential and actually one of those first steps of how, how education and business will start to introduce 3D or augmented reality into, into their workplace or their learning space. Um, it really, using 3D technology um, is already bringing 97% less time to gain that information, gain access to that information. So um, this still photo here of our of a blood machine is something that we worked on to build a user manual um, being placed um, in augmented reality right over top of uh, the blood machine itself. So what we did is we took a CAD drawing, a CAD diagram, diagram drawing of the blood machine itself. And um, you can physically place that blood machine in front of you with the user manual overlaid on top to understand how to insert the syringe of blood, where to uh, push the buttons on the screen and, um, you know, going into the back end, you know, changing out the spark plugs or uh, replacing uh, certain cartridges. The entire 32 page um, and 32 step manual on how this product uh, can be modeled was then built into our engine and distributed through one link published that anybody could access from their team and they could do that remotely just by pulling it up on their device and placing that blood machine in their space or beside the blood machine itself. So it really has shown that impact of how 3D manuals and instruction manuals can play a huge part of, um, of usability and accessibility being remote and not having to use paper anymore. And if you think about how we used it in a blood machine manual, Imagine what we could do for textbooks in schools, being able to overlay more instructions or insert assets into a storyline that could help the user understand more about that topic or subject. So um, our engine also does connect with IoT uh, sensors. And I think this was one of the biggest surprises about our engine that we were not really sure that it would work, but it actually did. And we have a use case out there from Sakar Keda from Oracle, um, Oracle's XR lab, where they took our engine and then connected the engine um, with one of their monitoring stations uh, with a sensor and pulled out data and put it into a presentation model in 3D within our engine. And this was a huge stepping stone to be able to, to understand how our engine could work with IoT sensors. And I think this is a huge benefit in building out solutions for innovation, whether it be both business or education or um, you know, innovating a, a, a global solution that could be connected to an environmental problem, um, being able to monitor soil, uh, you know, soil erosion or, um, you know, monitoring equipment in their performance, or even just reporting back the conversion rates in design. So being able to uh, report back real-time analytics use cases and the choices of the user or the monitoring of that system and being able to display that in, um, you know, in a direct and relevant manner for that's very simplified to use is um, one of the greatest benefits, I think, of, of our engine and being able to introduce the reporting of 3D. So, um, so our engine is 
and browser agnostic. And we wanted to make sure that our engine was accessible for everyone on every single device and making things as easy as possible, just like adding code snippets, um, which you can actually break it out and, and code yourself in JavaScript. But the code snippets allow you to drag and drop those more complicated um, coding sections that uh, provide a little bit more intricacy to the experience of like nations and, and uh, configurations. This is a picture of our dashboard and um, it really is very similar to some of the other development engines out there, but it is all drag and drop and being able to um, you know, quickly access all of the different features of the mesh um, in the mesh inspector just on the right hand side and having your assets with it right within your framework. So um, let's go back to a little bit of the spatial design and the design process. And the first thing I want to address is the world or a scene. And just like you're in this space here, the world and the scene that we're in has background and there's a stage. This is our world and this is uh, this is part of how um, you need to build and think about what the background looks like in these virtual worlds. Um, and the metaverse editor, editor actually provides grid lines around your asset so you can understand the XY axis and what position it, it is located in within the, uh, the space that you're building. And this thing right in the middle here is called the GIF and you're able to manipulate and use that to move it up, down, or to the side and position it within the world itself. Um, and when you are adding something to your world or your scene, it's also called a skybox. And as an example here, this cube that I've built in our engine, I added a skybox from Toronto um, that you can see here. And um, it really does provide an environment around Set or the experience of the building. Spatial design also includes textures, and this is really important. It's something that we've never really learned before is that everything that is inside of a 3D space, we're uh, using 3D, um, has textures to make it look as real as possible. And that's the goal is the realism. And you know, what does that look like so that it, it looks like it is as real as it is in the virtual world as it is in the real one. So the first thing that I want to take a look at is the albedo, the albedo textures, um, which is the base color. And this is where you can replace something and make it green or blue or red. Um, but you can also add a texture as an image. Um, maybe it's a logo or uh, maybe there's, we've just added the feature of adding video. So you can actually add a video to the of a cube or to a sign that's in that 3D space. Um, textures that are emissive provide shine and light to something. So if you think something should be a little bit shiny or have a little bit of light on a certain edge, this is where you would adjust your emissive textures. Um, roughness on something, you know, is something made of sand, you know, of sandpaper or is it the sidewalk or um, maybe smooth and there are no there is no roughness on your 3d object um, and your assets so this is where you would adjust um, that reflection uh, ambient occlusion is really important when it comes to lighting and shadows and understanding how things that are um, within a shadow um, are you know not seen or they have a different type of reflection um, understanding where things are placed within a spatial environment and what shadows over something or replaces something is really important to, um, to understand that more about the 3D object. The metalness texture is also really important. Is it rusty and dull or it, does it have a shiny metalness to it? And this is where you can adjust those different, uh, different levels. Um, norm Kind of that last addition onto onto a 3D object, and you would really understand what that looked like until you actually added it, and it really just gives it that little bit of depth and dimension and surface texture to an object that makes it look as real as possible. For me, when I'm creating now in in my engine, I really use those normals in that last moment to just give it that touch of realism. Spatial design also includes lighting, and um, it can come from everywhere, especially when you're in a 360-degree space. So 
you can actually have lights in front of you, behind you, to the back, left, right, top, bottom, and you can change the color of lights. So when you're in a 360 degree environment or you have a 3D object and you wish that object had a little bit of red tinge to it, then you can change your lighting on the right hand side to red and have that object reflect the new lighting. Special design can also include configurator options and that means choices and perspectives. And where you can add that different choice or perspective to your 3D model to see, you know, what does something look like? Do you prefer the gold one or the blue one? Um, you know, and being able to innovate and design and think of different things that could happen to a particular object or an animation if you prefer it to go to the left or the right or um, does the architecture or the innovation of an engine happen to work this way or that way? And this is where configurators really offer that different perspective to make a decision quickly. And that's as easy as adding a configurator in our space. So going back to our dashboard, you know, and having this cube in the middle, um, once you publish your, uh, the cube itself or the that you've built, um, you come to a publish page that looks like this. And you can actually take this URL in the, in the, uh, in the publish space and, and drop that into a particular experience or show somebody if you want to. Um, you can actually show them experience through the QR code, or you can actually um, enter in the code for uh, Android or, and pull up the code for Android, iOS, or the web. And it'll give you the embed code for you to implement that into your site or um, into an app that you're working with. Um, really, it's being able to publish and see your 3D object as soon as possible and immediately so that you can make a decision whether you like it or not. And you can also share these with anybody around the world and they can pull up the same 3D object in their space and in real time and, uh, and take a look at it. So building 3D for business and education, where to start, what are your ideas to make change? Um, really adding um, hybrid models, a digital hybrid model to current systems is the best way to start to engage in 3D and take those 3D steps. So taking a look at manuals or textbooks and adding 3D onto them, whether it be like a user manual or adding a tiger to a page and uh, having a, a 3D object of a tiger sitting right beside you um, in that textbook. This is where our engine makes it possible or 3D makes it possible for that interaction of learning to be more immersive. Um, placing 3D models into your space to learn about them is one of the best ways of this technology to be able to introduce new ways of education. And using different design perspectives with configurators and being able to change out different models is also a, diff a great way to engage in 3D and immersive um, applications into business and education. Visualization data, for example, um, uh, bringing in information from IoT sensors or simply just using visualizations from math or sciences is where, uh, is where the system can, uh, where the engine um, can provide and 3D can display um, a more immersive experience. So your takeaway today, you know, what problem in the world could be better understood with 3D? You know, and how does 3D offer solutions for business and education? And this is where the next generation, you, um, could help us come up with some of these solutions using 3D to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Or maybe it's some of the community's problems, or maybe your backyard problem, your school problem. We want to inspire innovation. We, and using 3D to start to use that in immersive experiences for explanations, for lessons, for operations, for procedures, um, 3D is really that gateway into the other, all of the technologies that are out there to become more immersed and to utilize and under, have a spatial understanding of how those objects reflect in the space. So what will you create? Uh, I would love for everybody to take a look at our website and take a look at these different experiences. Um, you can actually go to our showcase page, uh, metaverse.com slash showcase and put that couch in your space and see what it looks like. And then think about how, you know, place 3D objects into your space. What could you do? What problem could you solve? And um, 
you know, learning as much as you can right now about how these applications work within the space and, and the different business models and industries and how they're using it. Um, here's a list of resources. I've put our podcast right at the top there. The XR for Business podcast by Alan Smithson really is a foundational, under provides a foundational understanding of every single industry out there and how they're using it in their space. And, um, you know, XR for Learning podcast, I'm addressing all the different ways that we're teaching and learning differently and using 3D to, to uh, immerse those experiences. So um, a little bit just to, just to close off in collaboration tools that are out there and the reasons why um, this circle here represents a directory of over 70 different collaboration platforms that are out there that are hosting um, hosting meetings and classrooms and uh, places of learning interaction and communication and collaboration engaged today as we are here they are represented in this uh, it's piece of being able to provide a place of collaboration um, to remotely learn and work and I encourage you to take a look in um, our directory where you can go through the search filters and figure out what kind of, um, you know, assets and, and uh, configurations do you need in your space to be able to, uh, to collaborative, collaboratively work with your team or your class. And um, the directory provides you with a narrowed down version of uh, some of the companies that are out there. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because there are so many opportunities out there to become involved in the XR space and so many jobs and skill sets that are starting to evolve from design all of these things. Everything from a 3D modeler to a creative technologist, um, data analysis, cybersecurity, um, there's so many opportunities there to become involved and to learn and understand all of these roles will, and how they'll play a role in, in the future of work for and of learning. So, um, you know, learn as much as you can, but remember that your most powerful skill is the unique ability to be creative and using technology like 3D to engage in, in any kind of experience is, is really uh, where it's at. And the, the key is you, the key is you to create these solutions and um, to come up with innovative design. So we look forward to seeing what you create. And I thank you so much from the XPRIZE stage here in Engage um, on the creative design process. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, we look forward to seeing how you become involved in this 3D immersive world of ours. Thank you very much. share with you our ideas in how game-based learning can be a teaching skill that will transform the way we learn. I'm Alejandro Suarez, founder and creative of Creativa Kids, and with me is our Director of Education and Learning Experiences, Sara Cuevas, and we will do our best to leave you some content that can be useful for you to teach in a new and different way. Nowadays, learning is being transformed with all the elements that surround us. Children are asked to develop hard and soft skills to be able to solve real life problems and be prepared to enter into the labor force. Also known as the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication are the skills that are being asked for the kids of the 21st century and are expected for teachers to include on the Hayden curriculum. We should remember that the principal aim of the, of the curriculum should be answered to the students' necessities, generating meaningful learnings, which will prepare them for the future. Constantly innovating the learning process makes it possible to teach the children of different generations without staying obsolete. One of the educational trends that are currently permitting the teaching methodologies is introducing games and video games as didactic resources. This seems as an extremely innovative idea, 
But three centuries ago, the German pedagogist Frederick Frevel was already speaking about games as the highest expression of human development. That is because Frevel recognized that gaming allows a person to learn from all the elements that surrounds them and to practice with their knowledge in controlled spaces. It is easy to agree with this idea, but taking it to practice is not a piece of cake. Today, we will mention two ways to incorporate games to the learning process. Each of them could be used in different contexts depending on the objectives of the object that we are aiming to teach. The first one is gamification, which is the strategy that incorporates game elements to a training process. It helps to recognize achievements by rewarding the, the student when he sends a desired behavior or reach a learning outcome. It could be defined as an educational path enriched by fund resources. The second one is game-based learning, which consists on merging the core content and objectives from a training and a game. This permits to make the whole learning process fun. During the game, children will develop specific skills, use and consolidate their knowledge and achieve learning outcomes without feeling part of a traditional learning process. But again, both are great resources to incorporate fun and creativity to educational activities. But because of how it works, game-based learning helps to engage children on their learning and create an environment that boosts imagination and the desire to be part of the process. This itself is one of the things that we as teachers are most looking forward to, producing the kids the licking of an earring. We are sure it is not a surprise for you to hear that video games are the most played game in the present. On a typical Thursday, Steam video game platform registers up to 20 million users playing per hour. The industry is growing so fast that on 2021, the quantity of gamers is expected to be close to 2.8 billion people. This is around the 36% of the population of the world. And it is why, it is why teaching by using this resource is a right guess by approaching the students with something they already like. Now, here is a fact that might not surprise you either, but that will help us to identify our opportunity area. It goes as follows. In 2016, 27.5% of all the games sold in the USA were shooter games. What do we expect society to learn if what is being offered on these daily teaching resources are killing skills. And of course, it is not our aim to eliminate these games, but to take advantage of a great resource to enlarge the opportunities that students have to learn. Even though these popular games can develop some skills for young generations, like strategy, teamwork, and resilience, among others, giving kids the opportunity and knowledge to create their own games will develop new skills like creativity, problem solving, technology literacy, and several others that will become a competitive advantage for them to be successful in many fields for the future of work and at the same time will project the educational platform which we count with. What a huge responsibility trying to create educative games that will apply to all our students. What if, but what if we incorporate developing video games in the curriculum? How can we do it? Let's talk about coding. Coding is the process of creating instructions for computers using programming languages. It is used to program websites, apps, and other technologies. The digital industry is growing at the fastest pace in history, provoking the creation of millions of jobs related with coding. Industries and jobs from several areas like design, marketing, finance, medicine, and many others will consider the ability to code as a must or a competitive advantage on their workforce. Coding develops a variety of skills as logical and critical thinking, vision and problem solving. Also teaching these concepts in early stage will create more profound learning experiences that will stay for life and establish a structural mindset that will become a competitive advantage. Being able to communicate with computers 
is as hard as communicating in any other language. Just adding the complexity of making the instruction perfectly clear for them to reproduce information. The earlier children are introduced to coding, the easier and more natural it will be for them to apply the knowledge in their daily activities. If we choose the correct activities, it will also be fun for them to learn. It is easy to create video games if you know what tools to use. It is possible to create your first video game by using basic concepts of coding and either using them as a didactic resource or as a strategy for the children to learn. As a didactic resource, we can create video games which can incorporate the lesson subjects. For example, this is an easy game for health education. To put the organs on the right place is an easy way for children to memorize the distribution of the body parts. It can help them to create an alternative reality in which they can interact with the concepts on paper to see exactly where they are. On the other hand, we can ask them to create their own games using knowledge that they previously got and take advantage of their interests to impulse significant le learnings while have, having fun. How can we create these easy games and introduce children to coding world? We can start with graphic programming, which will allow us to teach the coding basics and logical thinking since an early age. Mblock 5 is an open source and free to use block based visual programming software. Based on Scratch 3.0, it uses colors and shapes to make it clear how to connect the blocks to create a whole instruction or algorithm for the program and the robots. It has a stage in which we can create animations that will work as a foundation of the video game, making it either consolidate a learning by providing a virtual space to interact with or the key to allow them to imagine how something can be represented and provide the resources to create an imaginary space to make it real. We can make it react with the keyboard or with a simple additional Arduino-based component or robot which will help us to increase the fun and the opportunity to interact with it. So how can we do it? We would like to share with you five very steps to create your first video game in Mblock 5. With this, you will see how easy it can be when we are creative enough to think in how we can make our classes fun. Now, Sarah will show you how to apply these five steps so we can create a video game right now and right after you finish this presentation. Perfect. So, so let's, let's get started. started. Today, Today we're, we're going to use this simple, simple example, example of a video, video game that, that we, we want, want to create right, right here, right now, now with, with you. you. We're going to be using Mblock 5 which is MakeBlocks graphic programming software. And it's one of the most complete resources that we can use to create this type of video games. Um, right now we're going to start name, labeling our program. This is going to be related with add, uh, additions and subtractions. So we're going to just name it like this. And it's going to be related to a monkey. So we will put it here. We're not using devices today, so we're heading directly to the sprites. In these sprites, we can find a panda, which we're not using today, so I'm going to delete it. And now we're going to add some other elements. In the first place, our main character is going to be a monkey. So here we're just going to type monkey. And now we can choose any of the ones that we can find here. We're going to select this one because it has different animations and we like it then we're setting this monkey over here and we will start working out with some fruits uh, since we're going to talk about adds and subtract we're choosing fruits which represents the numbers that we want to add for one we're going to have one apple and for two for example we're going to use bananas we have two right here and uh, for three we will use some beans uh, yeah, we're just going to type it. Perfect. So, yes, uh, we have three beans and we put them right here. Now, for fourth and fifth, 
we couldn't find any fruits that actually had this number. So we're going to use cakes, which actually have the number. So here we're going to choose this cake that has four raspberries. And finally, we're going to add another cake. Yeah, we're going to write cake right here and we're going to choose this one which has five cherries on top. So it's really easy to see the number that each of them has and we're going to work with this for addition. And now for subtractions, we're going to work with a bump. This bump is going to help us to subtract one point each time. Yeah. So we're going just to put it here and yeah. Now for complementing this game, we will be using some backgrounds. And for the backgrounds, we just have to move on to this other part in which it says backgrounds and we will start to select some options. First, we would like the monkey to be on an open place to be able to play. So we're going to work with this forest. It says forest, but it sounds like a jungle to me. And now we can add some other random place. I think we're going to select today and a specific place on space. So it's going to be fun to send him there if he loses. Um, perfect. Once we have this information here, we're going to keep it aside until later. So right now we're going to try to start working with the sprites and begin with all the programming. So let's get started. Yeah, we are selecting each sprite. Perfect. We're going to start today with the monkey because it is going to be the first one that we're going to use and it's going to be our principal character so it's going to have the lead of all the programming that we're doing today we are creating the biggest part of the code on it also joining all the information from the other stuff the fruits will be using this to work so right now we're going to start by using this event block when the flag is clicked. And yeah, with this, we're going to start right now. We're making an easy program, so we hope you can follow it and enjoy it for all long. Let's start with this monkey, and this program will have several elements to complement to create a full working video game. Now, we're going to hide all the other objects to make it easier to work with each of them. So we're going to start hiding all of them one by one. It is really easy because here on the bottom of the page, you can see like an eye. So with this eye, we will be able to select each fruit. And when selecting each fruit, we're just going to ask it to not been shown and that way we're just going to work one by one it's going to be really easy okay so heading to directly to the the program we're going to start by creating some movement for the monkey. We want him to be able to move side by side and have all other stuff to can move on this. So for this, we're going to head to the blocks of control and on them, we're going to choose this if then block to start working. And we're going to use this other block which is used to control with our keyboard. And we're going to choose two different options, the arrows. So we're going to use the right arrow and the left arrow to move the 
monkey on the stage. And we, like, you know that we have two axes, so we have X and J to work with, which permits us to move the character in the whole stage. What happens if we choose the axis Y? Okay, let's look for it. Perfect. So, yeah. Here we can see the one that controls the X and the one that controls the Y axis. So, yeah, right now we're going to use the one with the Y. So, we can see how how it works and understand why we're choosing each of them. We can do this with kids so they can see what is the difference between the axis of Y and the one on the X. Yes, so right now we're going to start trying out what we're doing. And for this, we're going to make a little test. First, we're going to add this forever block, which will help us to keep making this happen. And when we press the arrow, it moves to the top because the Y axis is the one that moves like this, upside down. And if we change it for the one in the X axis, we're going to be able to see that now the motion goes side by side. That's the way that we want to work today. So we're going to start with this one, with the X axis working. And now we're going to try to duplicate this information in order for us to have it to go into the left and to the right. So right now we can see that even though we have selected arrows right and left, they keep going to the same place because the number is the same. So we have to add a minus 10 in order for it to move to the other side. Perfect. Now, once here we will recognize that the monkey actually seems pretty big to this stage. So we recommend it to change the way it looks. So we go to looks and here we can select the block for change the size. We are planning on changing it to around an 80% of the actual size of the monkey. And now it seems pretty okay with all the um, information of the game. It seems pretty accurate the size, right? Okay, so from here, we are going to start working with the other sprites. So we are going to add them to the information that we have right here. We're going to start with this apple. We're going to make it sim. And right now, we're going to start with this one. And then we will use the same information to work with the other sprites. So. Mm, we should remember that the apple value is one because it's just one apple. And now we have to add again this block, the if then block. This will allow us to ask about what is happening on the screen. In this case, we're not going to ask about the side or if we are touching some key, but what does the monkey is actually touching? So yeah, we're going to select this one first and we're going to change the idea of the mouse pointer. Instead of it, we're going to select this sprite, the Apple one, which is the one that we're working with right now. And now if you remember, we said before that this monkey could have some different animations. So we're going to start using this to see how it changed. We're going to collect, um, we're going to see yeah, the different options of how the 
face of the monkey can be. And now we're going to put this same block in two different places. So we're going to keep it with the face to A that it's kind of happy when it's normal. And we are going to keep it with the face to B that it's kind of excited when it goes to the apple. Right now, the apple is not moving or doing anything, actually. But each time we put the monkey over it, it makes him happy or excited. So now we're going to ask him to wait until he stops touching the apple. Right now, it's not so clear why we're going to do this, but in a few seconds I'm going to tell you exactly how it works. So here we can see that we have two moments. One when the monkey start touching it and then when he ends up touching it. So yeah. Right here we're going to start doing some other elements and see that we can find out how to to work with this. Now, this is really easy, and we're going to start working with some variables. A variable is actually a data which will be changing while the program is running. So we are just going to head over here where it says variable, and we're going to create one. We are going to use more than one today, but right now we're going to start creating this one. We're going to name the score. And we will give it the information from different points that the monkey can have. And every time it to the monkey touches a fruit, it's going to change the score. So first, we're going to set the score for zero because we want to, it to start like zero. And then we're going to ask it to change it by one each time it touches the apple. Here on the screen, we can see the actual score. And then each time we put the monkey over the apple, it's going to add one point. Now, what is important about this is what happens if we take off this block that we were saying a few seconds before that we don't know how or why. So here you see that the score is going to change rapidly because it doesn't have any reason to stop. So the information that we are asking it for here is that it doesn't count again the apple until it stops touching the monkey. So that way we just count it one time each time they touch, okay? Perfect, so right now we're going to start with the actual programming of the apple. When we touch the apple and go to this screen, we can see that the code is completely clean, even though the monkey's code is a stator. So, the apple is completely a new spot to work with, and we're starting at the same the same way with this block with the flag, the green flag. And now, please watch the size of this monstrosity. We have to fix it. If this apple ever touches a monkey's head, he is going to get knocked out. So let's change the size by adding this block. Let's set it to I don't know, maybe around. 50%. Let's see how it looks. Okay, touch. Okay, it, it still seems a pr like pretty big, right? So um, I think that we could change it to 45. Perfect. And now, yeah. Yeah, I think that size is a little bit better. Even if you see it big, you can keep changing it. So right now, what we want this to do is to 
keep um, like it start moving but we always want it to fall down so we are going to point it in 90 degrees so yeah we can see that it is right now in this position and so the apple is not going to be turning around now we're going to see where we want it to be um, first we're going to try to move it to the top and here we're going to see where in the axis x and y we can find them so the first thing that we want to do is to set this in the top like the the most top part of this screen we're going to try to make it to 20, 250 but it actually doesn't even move so we know that the 190 is like the limit of the screen in the top so yeah we're going to leave it like in 190 and that way we're going to know that it is on the toppest part of this screen and then we're going to choose the place where we want it to appear so we're going to like we could choose just one spot for it to appear but we don't want that we want it to appear randomly in different spots on the x axis so the the monkey doesn't always know where the apple is going to be so right now we're going to see yeah on the x we're going to set also the x but we are going to add something that makes it differently that makes it appear in different places for this we're going to head to the operators perfect and we're going to add this block that says pick random so it's going to choose random numbers between two different positions so for this we're going to see how long our screen is and we know right now that the number is around 236 minus perfect and then obviously on the other side should be something similar um perfect okay yeah it's around yeah the same the same long length for the other side so now we have it and it can choose randomly any place so each time that we press this code it moves to different places that is something that we want it has to do uh, perfect so right now what we want this to do is start moving upside down and we're going to ask it to move like around minus 10 or minus 5 I don't know I think that we want to try minus 5 on the y-axis it actually just modifies the velocity in which this apple in this case is going to be falling down that way we will have this opportunity or it's going to be easier for us to catch it and to have the numbers that we need so yeah I think that we're going to use this minus 5 option and now we want it to keep going down until it reaches certain level on the down part of the screen so we can choose different things for this to happen it one can be the limit to the down part of the screen but the other is actually the last part in which the monkey can touch it so yeah that's I think that we're going what we're going to decide today so we're going to repeat it until the apple is on the place in which the screen ends for the monkey so if we can see here we're going to compare the information and this way it's going to be easier for the program to understand when so we're going to compare the y position the, the position of the apple in the y-axis to a number and this number is the one that we're going to obtain from this information so it's going to be minus 100 and it's going to be changing by minus 5 until it happens so yeah right now we can see that that's what happens and now the apple is closest to the monkey now 
once we are here, we will like it not to stay on the monkey's hand, but to return to a place above his head. So we're going to set again this spot, the y, like the 190 on the y-axis, and this way we're going to be able to have all the information correctly. So each time it touches the bottom of the page, it is going to be up again. And now here we're going to try to repeat it. So each time it repeats, we are going to be able to see that it changes the place in which it is. So right now we're supposed to catch as many apples as we can. And each time that you catch one, you can see that the score changes. So this is why we're going to have this whole information so right here. We only catch nine up to the 10 apples that we were able to catch because we had 10 repetitions of this activity so yes perfect so in this case we have this but we can change it in different ways so it can be one option is this one repeat during certain amount of moments but we can also use this repeat until and for this one we will be able to add some other characteristics that we can depend on. So in this case, we can see that it's a comparison between the timer. So it will take some time as any other game and we will compare it and it has to be bigger than. And we're going to use 40 today because it's easier for us to start working with this, but later on we could change it to whatever we, we feel like having. So yes, right now we're going to make a small tryout and we're going to give 10 seconds to the monkey to try to catch everything. And he starts running and as you can see, even though he catched almost everything, I think, it's only six points because in 10 seconds it only took like the possibility to catch this. So yes, now we have a whole thing that's working with time like any other game. And now, we could say that this is going to change because 10 seconds, it's really a small amount of time. And we would like to add here that it has to wait. Why waiting? Because it will help us to control when the game starts. So the apple is not going to begin to fall until we press the space bar. In this way, we're going to be able to control the whole game. As you can see now, we have all other elements that we have to work with. Finally, we have this other element that it's going to be waiting. If we don't wait, like we saw before, the apple is going to be falling and falling and falling again a lot of times. But something that is going to make a little bit more interesting our game is to be able to wait different amounts of times easier. So here we're going to put that we are going to wait to fall again a random number between one to 10, and then the apple is going to fall. Let's try this one again. So it is waiting for us to press the space bar. And now once we press it, it's our running and yeah, it waits different amounts of times. It depends on the random number that it obtains and we only have 40 seconds to catch them all so it is a combination of luck and actual good work with this so yeah now it i think it has finished the time perfect we're going to stop this and now let's see so we, as you can see, have a lot of more 
objects or sprites to work with. But it could be a really hard work for us to make all the programs. But if we select this one and then take it to each of the elements that we're working with, you can see, like right now we're going to see it, but we are copying our program on each of these different sprites. So we don't have to make all this programming a lot of times, but on each of them, we have the program and they are going to be doing the same thing that the Apple. So we know that all of them are going to be working. Yeah, so let's see, they are all in the top and now we can go to the monkey and on the monkey we have something that it's missing. Right now we only have this first one that contemplates the apple and among the apple we have a lot of more things that we're going to be using. So let's duplicate this element in order for us to have all the different options. Mm, yeah, we're going to put them all inside of the same cycle so that it is easier and okay I think this one is the last one perfect and let's go to the top so first we have this comparison of the apples but then we will start working with bananas so it is if bananas then it keeps like this we have to change it by two and again we set bananas until they stop touching the same thing with beans we have to set the number three and beans again, perfect. Then for four, we're going to choose, choose, choose sorry, the first cake, and we have to, yeah, perfect. And we're changing it for four, perfect. The last one of the cakes is going to be the number five, and cake again. So I know we're still missing one of these project but it's a little bit different so first we choose bomb the same way that we have been working with all the others but we here we have to change the phase that they do because with the bomb the idea is that he feels a little bit sad perfect and now there's this last one that we also have to add one but we said that we wanted to decrease it so we're going to set a minus one and now the program is ready. So, yeah, let's see. So each time we catch any fruit, the fruits are going to give us a number. It's going to be adding. Perfect, so yeah, we can see that it happens. And in the case of the bomb, it will decrease our number. Perfect. Yeah, it is working exactly how we want it to. Excellent. Now here, we have to work with two more things. One is related with the backgrounds, which will make us feel more like in a game. And the other one will help us to compare the actual information that we have. So yeah, let's get started with the backgrounds. We're going to go to the option look and then we're going to select this one that it's going to help us see differences in the back part of the image. And we're going to set the forest five. That's the one that we ch choose before. And Yeah, this way we're going to actually be on the place that we want to be. And now we said that we wanted to work with some other variables. So right now we have one score that it's the one with we have been working with until now. But we would like to start working with some other variables that will allow us to create some more information. So let's see. Um, we are, 
enter again on this variable and we make a new one. Here, the first one, we are going to create uh, something named Zoom. Perfect. And we are going to work with this later. And we are going to create one more, that we, which name is going to be Time. So now we have two different new variables and we're going to set them all together at the beginning of our program. This will help us to understand what we're doing and to see that our program is working correctly. So score we want it on zero, uh, time we also want it from to value zero when it, the program starts, but we have some. So yeah, we're going to set some here and we're going to give it some values. This value is going to be a pick from a random number. We can change the numbers depending on what we are seeing with our children. So in this case, we're going to choose to be picking random from 10 to 30. And this way we're going to have this first information. Now in the stage, we can see the status from the three of them and we can move them however we like to make it easier for us to understand or to learn what is being said here. So right now we have this information and we are waiting for this and you can see that the score and time starts in zero but some will change each time that we start again our program. Perfect, so right here down, we have this option of a forever, but we actually don't want it to work forever. We just want to work it for a little while. So we're going to repeat it until, we're going to repeat it until the time is over. So it depends on how many time we want to give our children to work with, but we're going to make again a comparison between the time and a number, so it is going to be clearer. And in this case, we're going to respect the 40 that we had put before on the other sprites. Perfect. Okay, so now Um, here, the time has given us some information. And now we're going to compare the time with a timer. But we have this other option that says round. So I would like to use round, but let's see why. If we set just timer and we start the time or start the program, you can see that the timer is moving really, really fast. But what happens when we use round? Then the timer is just counting one by one. That makes it easier to read. So yeah, I think it's, it's better for a game to have this option than the other one. And like all the other activities, we will wait until and the space bar is pressed. This is going to help us to give us a clue the, of when all the program is going to start and how to control it. So perfect. Um, if we want to know like the final scores and all this, we will have to make some more questions. So specifically, we would like to know if the number, the sum that we had before and the score are the same at the end of the game. This is going to tell us if we are winning or losing. So we're going to compare it. It has to be exactly the same and we're going to set score and sum. If score and sum are the same, then, and we have this option of else in this doc that we're using right now. So we're going to do, or the monkey is going to do something. It has, is it, he will say, you win if the sum and the score are the same. And we'll say, try again if the sum and the score are different.
so yeah, we're going to use some other element to make it a little bit funnier. And we're going to try to make the monkey travel if he wins or lose. So in the case of the monkey winning, we're going to add this backdrop. In this backdrop, we are going to duplicate it and put it on the other one too. If it wins, we are going to send him to the beach. And if he doesn't, we're going to send it to another planet. So yeah, right now our program is pretty much complete and we can make some tries. So right now it is waiting for perfect. And now we start trying to catch the different objects. We have a 23. So we're supposed to start looking to get there. We have 24 and we zoom. <clears throat> we're supposed to avoid all the fruits and try to catch just one. Yeah, now we need a lot more of our bombs to be able to win. And the time is almost okay. Yeah, so right now we lost. <laughs> so yeah, I think everything is working perfectly up to here. Perfect. Uh, now, we would like to give some instructions at the beginning. The rules are really important. And if the kid is trying to work this out by himself, it's not going to be clear. So let's set this option. It says, hello. And it says, it's going to say, hello, my name is Changuito. Changuito is little monkey in Spanish. So it's going to be funny for the kids who are learning and now that we have it up to here, we're going to put it to wait for three seconds, the information. And now we're going to start changing a little bit more these options to say more things. So then we will use this, um, use the fruits to reach the sum number. Uh, sum, perfect number okay so now it's going to stay for three seconds also let's see if that's enough mm, then yeah uh, we're going to make another one it's going to say well we can duplicate them as many times as we need and here we're going to ask the program to tell us what is the sum probably we won't need three seconds we may lose like use less sorry so yeah we can put it there and then duplicate again the the block perfect and now we're going to try to write something else here um maybe we can put something like each fruit values as the number of fruits it has perfect and now let's do one more excellent so yeah now the bomb will decrease your addition maybe by one okay perfect i think these two last options should be a little bit longer because i think the the sentences are yeah bigger perfect and i think that it's important for the kids to know what to do next so let's ask them to press the space bar if they want to start yeah perfect excellent yeah okay yeah super now we have this other option that it's going to put the monkey in just in the middle of this so yeah we're going to put it there and then add this element that compares perfect now if you want to see how it fully works let's get started Excellent. So this is the full game that we have been creating. Now we can see how it fully works. 
Um, when we start it, then it starts telling us this information about what we are supposed to see. The number right now is 12, so each fruit is going to help us to add the different numbers. And each time we are past this number, we can subtract them using this information. So once it starts, we try to keep getting this. Right now we're just missing a two. So, okay, perfect. We took it. And let's see if we can keep like this for a few more seconds. Okay. Uh, just 10 more seconds and then we will win. Perfect. So, yeah. Um, okay. If we want to make it a little bit more difficult, we can make the limits of the wall less flexible. And we can also add some sounds to make this activity more interesting. So, yeah. As you can see, we can make a video game pretty quickly. I hope you enjoy this. So what do you think? It was simple or a little bit complex? Sometimes the first time you will do it, it can look a little bit more complex, but it will be very easy uh, with a little bit of practice. We believe it's all about creativity. In developing countries like the one where Sarah and I live, we have to be creative and we need to do big things with very little resources. However, today, more than ever, knowledge and tools are more close to us if we know how to use them and also if we have the willingness to change the way we are used to. Finally, let me give you our best advice we can. We believe that for kids, to get engaged in anything, we have to provide them activities with these five key elements. Number one, it needs to be fun. Nobody likes to learn boring things. Number two, it needs to be easy. Kids need to feel, depending on their level, that they are able to achieve things in order to engage. Number three, it needs to be meaningful for them. It's different to learn while playing with video games, drones, robots, electronics, than any traditional method we can think of. Number four, it needs to be in team. No, not everybody likes everything. And we, and we need to learn to work with others to achieve bigger outcomes. And number fifth, it needs to be with a purpose. It is different when you understand why or how this can change your life instead of because it is required. So we hope this presentation can be helpful for you and. Uh, Sarah and myself are really thankful for you for, for the opportunity to be in here. Uh, and all of our teams in Creativa Kids will be happy to teach you more about this or help in any way we can. Thank you very much. Everybody, Jesse Shell here. Very glad to be here today. Um, I've been doing VR for years. First time I've given a talk in VR, so that's pretty exciting. So what I was going to talk about today, I was going to talk about educational VR games. I've been working in VR a long time. I started back in 1992 at Carnegie Mellon. After that, I was working at the Disney Virtual Reality Studio in the 90s, and. Uh, then I started teaching at Carnegie Mellon, teaching a building virtual worlds class, and I also run a video game studio called Shell Games, where we've done an awful lot of uh, virtual reality games. Some of our best known ones are entertainment games, like I Expect You to Die and Until You Fall. Um, but today I'm going to talk more about uh, educational um, VR games that we've had experience with. We've produced uh, several different ones uh, to this point. I guess four different main ones I'm going to talk about today. 
And uh, there's an awful lot to say about educational VR games. We've been learning a lot of lessons as we've been doing this. So a lot of people ask questions, you know, really, is VR really ready for education? Because aren't there meaningful problems? Like motion sickness can be a real problem. Um, so far, I would say motion sickness with well-designed uh, experiences is, uh, is something that you don't have to worry about, but they have to be well-designed experiences. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait, isn't it too expensive? Um, because obviously, you know, VR is kind of high tech and, and potentially very expensive. But of course, as many of you know, I'm sure many of you are checking it out right now, uh, probably wearing it at this moment. Um, the Oculus Quest system has really made a major breakthrough in terms of platform. Now we have a system that is under $400, requires no wires, requires no PC, requires no uh, phones. And that, I think, is going to be the huge breakthrough for the educational market. Already, we're seeing just the accessibility of that. Is, it's really exploding in terms of mass market popularity. And I think we're going to see that next move into uh, the realm of education. But then you still have the question of hygiene, which has always been an issue, but is now kind of in the age of the pandemic is more of an issue than ever. If you're talking about people sharing headsets in a school environment, that's a real thing that you have to contend with. But even that there are solutions for. There are things like the clean box, which is a relatively uh, inexpensive system that uh, uses ultraviolet light to uh, destroy vi viruses and bacteria inside uh, your headsets. We use these at the studio uh, when we have headsets that are shared and when we go to conferences or, uh, or trade shows where we have to uh, use a VR headset in a, in a public place. Of course, obviously the pandemic makes this a little different, but when things get back to normal, hygiene is getting manageable um, for shared headsets. But then you got the question of, are schools themselves actually ready? Because some of the things we know about schools is they tend to be very slow to adopt new technology. That's just how it is with schools. Um, it, it's part of how they operate. And they, they're slow for good reasons, right? They, they can't be adopting every new thing that comes along because they need things that work. Um, but because schools are slow to adopt technolo new technologies, I mean, think about when was television invented, right? The 1940s. When did television come into schools? Maybe around the 1980s. So it took about 40 years for television to, to kind of make that uh, breakthrough. Think about when the Internet first showed up and then think about when it started making a difference in schools. A lot of people would argue that even now we're still, the television still catching, I mean, <laughs> education is still catching up with where the internet was in the 90s. And so I don't think we should expect virtual reality to go, go streaming into the schools, but it is something that is starting to happen. So in terms of making educational VR experiences, I'm gonna give a few tips today. And the first one is you wanna focus on the body. A lot of people think of virtual reality as an experience for the mind, an experience for the eyes, but really, virtual reality is an experience that's all about the body. It lets you bring your body into a computer simulation. And so that means that when you are thinking about experiences that are going to make sense for it, you want to think about things that involve the body. And this is all about the sense of presence. People who do VR all the time, they're familiar with this idea. But I think a lot of people forget, even if, if you're familiar with it, even if, you, if you've experienced it, it doesn't always mean that you really get how important it is. The idea of presence is that feeling of actually being in a space and in a place, right? Um, because that's the magic that VR brings. It lets you feel like you're actually in a place that you are not. And, and there's real power in that. That can be a very strong experience. We very often see people in VR um, accidentally lean against imaginary objects. And they, of course, they know intellectually those objects aren't real, but something inside their body believes the illusion so much that they're actually willing to treat them as if they're physical objects. This doesn't happen with television or other flat media. <clears throat> and part of that is using your hands. A big part of the way presence happens is your ability to reach into the world and grab things with your hands. Um, and so making experiences where using your hands actually matters is important. So we created something called HoloLab Champions. This is a, uh, a chemistry lab experience. 
and we because we were thinking about what what kind of experiences could like would not be possible without VR and we started thinking about education we started thinking about chemistry labs because what you do in chemistry labs is so oriented uh, towards just being physical learning how to properly manipulate glassware learning you know that the fact that when you look at a graduated cylinder and you're trying to measure it you actually have to bend down so that you can see where it is your body is very involved and so uh, we thought that this would be a, a good way to to bring your body into the lab. And so I'll show you a little trailer of it uh, right here. Welcome to the greatest event in the galaxy. The traditional chemistry lab finally has a modern companion. Developed with input from chemistry teachers, Hololab Champions is an immersive, safe, and entertaining environment that makes mastering lab skills fun. As game show contestants, players can perform a variety of lab challenges, leading to a show-stopping final lab. Or, in practice mode, they can hone their skills on specific tasks. Players are scored on accuracy and safety as they perform work that prepares them for success in a real lab. Paul Lab Champions is the chemistry lab companion you've been waiting for. All right. Uh, so, yeah, you can see uh, how that worked, that um, that was something that the both students and teachers found really engaging and really exciting to be able to actually be in a chemistry lab uh, and learn those real skills. So hands are important and having your and that's that's part of what you want to focus on experiences that use your hands, but also experiences where place really matters. Uh, that there's a team that made a, a, an exciting experience that's all about being inside the Anne Frank house. Now, my whole life, I've heard stories from people who've actually visited the real life Anne Frank house, and they often come away talking about how influential it was and how the feeling of being in there and being in that place really made them understand the situation in a way they never had before. And the same thing is true in the VR experience. The the VR experience is is very um, it really affects people because there's something about being in that place and in that situation that gives an understanding that reading about it, watching a video, it's just not going to make you understand. So this is a thing to think about. What are places that are going to transform people in a meaningful way? Because VR is good at putting you in places. Another thing to think about is being near another person. We have a lot going on in our heads. It's all about dealing with the feeling of being near another person. We have a, we have a special um, nucleus in our, in our brains that is all about that feeling of when something comes uh, closer than arms reach to you, right? If, if, you're, if you're sitting next to another person and like someone puts their hand like into your personal space, you can feel that part of your brain wake up. There's something very real about being near um, other people. And one great experience was created by some Carnegie Mellon students, an experience called Injustice, that was all about uh, confronting uh, situations of police brutality. And by actually putting you in the situations where you have to deal and decide what are you going to say, what are you going to do. And it's one thing to read about it, one thing to hear about it, another thing to be there and have to make decisions on the fly. It's, a, it's very memorable and does a great job at promoting conversations. And then, of course, the idea of being another person, going into somebody else's shoes. Another experience created by Carnegie Mellon students was an experience called Thin Line. And this was designed to help doctors and nurses understand what it's like to be a woman who has had an abortion and then has to go and talk to doctors and nurses about it. Because very often there is prejudice against patients who have had an abortion um, by doctors and nurses. And this experience of kind of hearing the story of this person and kind of going through their life and then seeing what is it like to be a patient going to see doctors and nurses that, that uh, look down on you because of your, your past is something that really helps open the minds of doctors and nurses. And so thinking about situations where you being somebody else actually matters and can help open someone's mind is, is something worth thinking about. 
Um, so related to that is the idea of making VR into something that will let people be creative. It can be tempting to just use VR as a playback device. Um, just like you are right now, you're watching me, you kind of give a lecture and it's a playback device. But when VR is something that can be a creative tool, of course right now I'm using it as a creative tool, um, then people can get much more engaged. I wonder who's more engaged right now, you or me? We'll have to think about that. Obvious examples are things like Tilt Brush, where people get to do 3D sculpting right there uh, in VR, and, and, you, and you, the things you draw and sculpt are all around you. Those are very incredibly engaging. We worked on one called History Maker. We asked ourselves the question of what is going to be the best way to use VR to, to uh, create an experience that connects students to history. And at first, everybody thinks about, oh, we'll create battlefields, we'll create ancient cities. And of course, those things are incredibly uh, expensive to do. And, you know, you're going to spend millions of dollars to build this. And we, we kept looking, how could we do something much more economical that could, could also be influential? So we started thinking about uh, VR as a creative tool. And so I'll show you a little tr our little trailer of how History Maker VR works. Four and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, on this continent, a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Welcome to today's social studies classroom, where the virtual reality content creation tool, History Maker VR, can enhance the learning experience. Students can immerse themselves in history while showing off their knowledge by embodying eight diverse characters across U.S. history, from Ben Franklin to Sonia Sotomayor. It's easy to use. Students set up the scene and select their props, create their performance, import their script, and start recording. Export, edit, and share their performances with teachers and classmates. So you get the idea there. It's uh, not that different from what I'm doing right here, except that it's focused much more on stepping into the shoes of uh, historical figures and actually being able to give speeches uh, as that figure. And it is very powerful to be able to step into the, the shoes of these characters uh, and these, these historical figures and look down and your body is their body and you have their skin and you look in the mirror and there's their reflection right there. Um, we found that uh, not only do the students find it very engaging because creating interesting videos is so culturally relevant for them, but we found history teachers found this very interesting and inspiring because perspective taking is something that they care so much about. So my third tip is finding ways to design for both teachers and students together. Um, Certainly, these are things we focused on with both Hololab and History Maker. We kind of thought about what do the teachers care about, what do the students care about. In Hololab, the students were most interested in kind of finding ways to fool around. And that sounds bad, but it's really not because when they're fooling around, they're learning the boundaries of what's acceptable and what's not. It's always a problem. Students want to fool around in real world chemistry labs to be able to get that fooling around out of your system and actually kind of break some glass and it's okay in, in the virtual world kind of makes everybody understand where the boundaries are. Now, what the teachers really cared about, the teachers cared about um, students learning proper lab practice. We at first were very focused on chemical reactions because we thought, oh, that surely is going to be what the teachers are going to want to teach. But it turns out they really cared much more about what's the right way to use a balance? What's the right way to scoop powder? What's the right way to use um, a pipette? Those sorts of things. And so we ended up turning it into a game show all about are, can you do chemistry uh, practices properly? Um, so another tip is fulfilling educational fantasy because people always focus on oh what's the curriculum and oh what's the fun but thinking about the educational fantasy is an important idea 
And one place we did this was an experience we created called Deep Time Detectives that we created for the Smithsonian Institution. This was something that was designed for parents and children to play together. The concept is that a family goes to the museum. Only one of them can put on the headset. It's usually one of the children. And that the, the person in the headset has the ability to kind of uncover fossils and the the rest of the family is looking at a screen of what they're doing, but they have another screen that has more information about the fossils. And it forces the family to have discussions together um, because only some of them have the different types of information and they have to talk about identifying these fossils. Now this experience, we could have kept it very um, just like, here's your fossils, now let's talk about them. But we realized it was very important to focus on the fantasy of what is it like to be a paleontologist. Um, so here you can take a look at a video of, uh, of a, a parent and child uh, doing this together. So my partner's uncovering a mystery fossil. What kind of animal could it be? So we didn't need uh, necessarily to do the actual brush. We didn't really need to put that in there, but we put it in because it's fun. First of all, like that's just a great VR interaction, kind of using the brush to kind of uncover the fossil. It's just fun to do. But secondly, it's a big part of the fantasy of being a paleontologist. And you hear them talk about it um, in the video. They, they talk all about how, uh, hey, you know what, this is even better than uh, at the actual museum. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so, tip number five is you wanna involve the spectators, right? So, uh, and that you saw part of that happening right there in Deep Time Detectives, is that when you have people who are watching, if you can find ways to kind of get them involved, um, that, that can um, help keep everybody interested. A great example of this is the game Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, a really successful VR game. If you haven't played this, you really should check it out. It's a lot of fun. So the way this works is, uh, if you see on the left here, there's a group of people playing it. They have all these papers they printed out that are manuals about defusing a bomb. And... You see, there's only one person there that actually has the headset on, and that person is the only one with access to the bomb. And this creates a really fun dynamic um, because it lets the people outside do something that's hard to do in VR. One thing's not great in VR, text. Text is not detailed text. It's kind of hard to read, hard to manipulate. But here, these, these people outside can have a lot of access to detailed text. And the person in VR, of course, can manipulate invisible 3D objects. And so that creates an awful lot of fun. So we used a lot of that same idea in Deep Time Detectives and tried to create experiences that required both players uh, to work together. So I talked about it a little bit. But here, I want you to see what it's like uh, when two people work on this together. Oh, okay. Let's tell you where to search. I mean, where to search that? Um, back, behind leg. Oh. You're a fossil. I don't even know what that means. Department looking at an ankle bone diagram from the two animal groups. Describe the fossil and make sure to look at the red arrows. Discuss which of the two groups matches your fossil. Got a sailed dog group, whale deer group. I'm gonna do whale deer group because that that looks like deer. Okay. Like, you see, like the head features and the ears. Hey. So you you get the sense, you know, the um, the the father and son kind of working on this together. One of them can manipulate, the other one has access to other information, and they have to do the discovery uh, together. And that, you know, it, it, there, there's something really fun about designing 
uh, for that, letting, letting people kind of participate together. Because not everybody's ready for VR. A lot of people just, they're like, oh, I'm not really ready for that. But they don't mind watching their friend do it. In fact, it's kind of fun for them to watch their friend do it. And if you create an experience where they can kind of work together, that can be a lot of fun. We found with our uh, successful title, I Expect You to Die, that's often how a lot of people play it. One person will wear the headset, another person's watching the screen and kind of offering advice about how to solve the puzzles. And it's a nice way to create something um, that's a social experience without having to deal with all the headaches of multiplayer, multi-headset um, gameplay. So now you may be still wondering like, okay, well, those are some interesting experiences, but I don't know if I'm ready to kind of embrace VR uh, for education. I mean, the market is too small. It's too early. There's a lot of reasons that you might say, hey, I'm not ready for that. But if you care about educational apps, I want you to look back in time a little bit. When people talk about some of the most successful educational games of all time, Oregon Trail always comes up. Um, it has been a, a game that has been a success in uh, getting people interested in history and through gaming. This game came out in 1971. Can you imagine working on this in 1971? It just, you know, what market was there? It didn't make any sense to be doing this. And that's what pioneering is all about, right? If you are there early working on things, uh, if you're the first one in there, you have a chance at really influencing the way the entire medium is going to be used for the next 50 years. So something to think about that, yep, the market's not giant yet, but on the other hand, you might have a chance to be incredibly influential if you start working now. Thank you very much for having me here today. This was super fun to be here in VR and doing this. I'm happy to chat with anybody about these things. Do feel free to drop me an email um, if you like, and have a great time at the conference. and can have access to a high quality caring teacher. Why is this so critical? Because research demonstrates that teacher quality is the most important school-related factor for influencing student achievement. Teacher quality starts with teacher presence, being in the classroom available to students. Here in the West, we take it for granted that our children's teachers will show up to school. But for more than half the world's students, chronic teacher absenteeism is a serious impediment to student success. Imagine students sitting alone in their classrooms, expecting and wanting a teacher but being left to their own devices. The rise in teacher absenteeism is a fourth sign of a greater problem around the world teachers are burning out and fleeing the profession. And the timing of this trend cannot be worse. According to UNDP, the world will need 67 million more teachers by 2030 in order to, ever, in order to educate every child in the world through high school. We're not on track to add 67 million new teachers. So how do we ensure that every child in the world has access to a high quality teacher despite the growing teacher shortage? That's what we're here to discuss today. I want to speak to you today about a future that's possible that we can achieve if we think big and act boldly. Every child in the world can have access to a high quality teacher. Now, that could be a teacher who's physically present in their classroom, a teacher who's virtually present, or an intelligent agent, an AI that's nearly indistinguishable from a human teacher. 
let's talk about each of these three cases and how they build upon each other and how we'll get there. So first, a teacher that's physically present in the classroom. What makes a good teacher? Do you remember the best teacher you ever had? Chances are there was some moment when a teacher, whatever his or her name was, led you to have a breakthrough where you mastered something that you thought you couldn't have and you felt so proud of yourself. That is what great teachers do. They build your confidence in yourself. They prove to you that you're more capable and more talented than you ever imagined. How do they do it? Empathy and emotional intelligence. Now, listen closely. I'm going to let you in on a teacher secret. And athletic coaches know this too. You've got to push the student beyond their comfort zone so that when they achieve a win or a victory, they feel a sense of pride and accomplishment. Here's where the emotional intelligence of a good teacher comes in. A good teacher can see when a child has reached their limit and is becoming discouraged. This is when a teacher will adjust their voice and say, hey, Tim, you can do this. I believe in you. The teacher may even reach out and place his or her hand on the student's shoulder just to add a bit of extra warmth. The reason why I'm talking about these very human interactions is this. If we're going to launch teachers into virtual reality, we must provide them the ability to emote and to interpret the emotions of their students. How can this happen in a virtual reality environment? There are technologies that will be essential for enabling the exchange of emotion within virtual reality environments. And the first and most important amongst them is 5G, or maybe its successor, 7G. So here's what 5G really does. 5G reduces latency. Simply put, the time it takes for a packet of data to go from your device to the internet and back to your device. What does this mean for expressing emotion in virtual reality? Well, have a good look at my face. Okay, here's my virtual reality face. And think about my real face. You'll notice that the range of emotion on my virtual reality face is limited. When I, and when I talk and move, it's a little robotic. It's not fluid. fluid. If this environment tried to capture the full range of my emotions and movements and update them in real time so that I look more natural, your computer would fail. Our internet systems are not meant to handle that kind of load, but 5G and its successor technologies are. The future is getting closer. Very soon, expect to have more intimate human connections over virtual reality. In our 5G enabled environment, a teacher can project themselves into a classroom halfway around the world and have an intimate face-to-face -face discussion with the student. The teacher's camera can read and interpret his or her emotions on their face and project those into the virtual reality space updating in real time. The student's camera can do the same. It's as if the two are in the same room, speaking to each other, connecting, able to view each other's emotions. Now, once we've enabled any teacher to be anywhere, have we provided every student in the world access to a caring, high quality teacher? Unfortunately, no, we have not. That is not enough. In a regular classroom, 
a teacher can manage about 25 students, maybe 30. In a VR environment, it depends. Now, I'm not talking about a lecture hall where the students sit and take notes, like in college. I'm talking about a classroom with kids. Virtual reality or not, a teacher's ability to manage a classroom will top out at about 20 students at a time. So we still need 67 million more teachers. How are we going to get there? I believe the only way we can close the teacher gap and provide the world enough teachers is to supplement human teachers with intelligent agents. Yes, AI teachers. But could an AI be a teacher, your child teacher? Could an AI interpret a child's instructional needs and respond to their emotional needs? Not just respond with a teaching strategy, but also with empathy, something resembling humanity. This is the gap. This is the leap forward we will need to make so that every child in the world has access to caring and quality teachers. We will need to build agents for virtual reality classrooms that can deliver personalized instruction and interpret and respond to the emotional needs of a child. This may sound like science fiction, but it's within our reach. We just have to look at the innovations that are transforming industries like gaming and e-commerce and put them to use in education. So what are these critical enabling technologies that we need to move forward? Let's look at a few of them. First, voice replication. The ability for AI to replicate and reproduce human voices on the fly. So we're reaching the end of the era of Alexa and Siri voices. Soon, voice applications will speak to you with human voices that will make it easier for you to forget you're speaking to a robot. That will be very helpful in a VR classroom setting. Dialogue technology is another. Have you noticed that chatbots and robocallers are getting better and better, or at least easier to communicate with? That's because computers are getting better at holding conversations or actually faking conversations by having thousands of responses on hand. Either way, um, AI-based teachers will benefit greatly from research in the field of dialogue technology and chatbots. And the last technology, Virtual world creation. Any gamer knows that the best games are the ones that immerse you in a world that is infinitely expansive. Such games are using AI to generate new game components and build scenes on the fly. Scenes and game components that the producers hadn't imagined. So bringing together technologies and voice dialogue and virtual world creation, we can build AI teachers for virtual worlds that provide students the guidance and support they need to grow as learners. An AI teacher could never replicate a human teacher, but can certainly replace an absent teacher. The world needs 67 million more teachers. AI-based teachers must be part of the solution. Let's start working together today to solve the problems of tomorrow, because tomorrow will be here very soon. I'm Daniel Fountainberry, the CEO and founder of CoTeacher, and I'm excited to speak with each one of you about building a future where every child in the world has access to a high quality and caring teacher. And that means using technology to maximize the classrooms of today and also building for 
the classes of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Jack Kelly from Science VR. Today we are going to talk about immersive science labs and game development for young learners. This is me, my family. Here's Ed. He's going to appear very soon. So I want to give you a brief overview of what I've been doing and what leads me here. Um, Ed, actually, he, he's the guy that leads us here. Uh, he's currently 11 years old, a sixth grader. He got his um, promotion from fifth grade to sixth grade just this year. So he's been in the new campus uh, without getting in touch with any of his new, new classmates. He's also an Unreal Engine developer. We've been working together um, since the school closure. So uh, you're going to see him in, in some of our video clips. I'm Jackie Lee. I got my PhD from MIT Media Lab, focusing on understanding human emotions using technologies. And then I worked at Intel RealSense, where we developed 3D cameras, and later on AR and VR. After Intel, I founded Science VR. The goal is to think about this new medium that we can design and put our design in front of others' eyes. So this is a very powerful, powerful tool that I think will bring a significant change to our future of education. So. Um, I'm very fortunate got grants fundings from MIT's Sandbox Innovation Fund program and supports from Oculus Start. And we also receive Epic Mega Grants. We're going to talk about immersive science labs. Why doing this? I think if we can be closer to historical stories, it will be easier for us to learn and discover more stuff. That's a, kind of the general idea. And here we have a few images on, on slides, and we're going to take a short tour um, to some of it. However, the idea is that if we can be closer to historical stories, and this will be very fun to to just take a few steps few steps away from those those famous thinkers, for example, physicists, uh, writers, uh, sci-fi characters, and those writers and thinkers they have great ideas, and what if we can be part of it, their their ideas and tinker around what they what they was working on. I think that'll be very, very, very fun for for um, learners from all ages, especially younger age. We started Science VR by looking at how how we can build science labs inside this immersive environment. We took an approach about we, we want to combine historical stories and also interactive interactive visualization and, um, and and to use those interactivities to get our learners to to tinker and to build on their own knowledge. So this is also a very powerful way of using immersive medium because our users 
they can use their hands. So from physics, we we started to build Michael Faraday's laboratories where he did a series of electromagnetic experiments, and we rebuilt Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage's Salon where they they invented the few the first machine that can calculate polynomials. We also rebuilt Mary Curie and Pierre Curie, their, their journey of discovering uh, radium and polonium. So um, let's dive in more. Michael Faraday. He invented a series of electromagnetic apparatuses that hugely influ influenced our modern life. And one of the discovery he made was the idea of the field. So what you are seeing here is the the field lines around the magnet. So he was the first to conceptualize those invisible force lines. And we find that it's quite matched to our approach because using VR we can see the unseen like the, those invisible force lines. So this is where we started. In addition to those, those visualizing the unseen, we also can visualize how they think uh, in geometrical ways. Um, Michael Faraday, he's also one of the um, scientists that Albert Einstein admired. There, there were three portraits in Albert Einstein's study, as in Newton, Michael Faraday, and James Clerk Maxwell. They are all visual thinkers. They think in visual and geometrical ways. And we believe that we can, in VR, it's, it's a perfect medium to visualize in those geometrical ways. And Maybe we can turn those math become interactive and make them easier to learn. So it's it's hard to communicate those those science concept without you you understand it and and use it. So so that's the idea that we we design those visualizations. So on the left side, if you Google magnetic field, that's what you can find. However, if you come to Science VR, if you put on the headset, we will take you back to the stories where Michael Faraday discovered those invisible field, field lines around the magnet. And you can use your hands to really pick up the magnet and see the four signs um, and to really experience what is it like in front of you? So we find that very powerful to bring the STEM concept in front of you and allow you to use your hands. So, well, you can argue that you can go to Exploratorium. That's a very fun place where you can interact with um, electromagnetic apparatuses like using your hands. Th these are uh, very fun installations in Exploratorium. And well, you can also go to Faraday Museum where you, you learn about the stories. Um, however, you are not allowed to touch those apparatuses because they are vintage and they are so important that they are in a museum. In VR, this is a place we can combine the two where you still use your hands and also, VR will take you back to the 19th century where Faraday and Maxwell did discover electromagnetism. It will be like this. So you and your friend or your teacher and your classmates can all go into Michael Faraday's laboratory where you share the same um, setup and, and discuss physics with Michael Faraday. So I'm going to show you a video 
and and I'm going to also talk about some of the the labs in our uh, in in this video, and this is this is partially funded by Epimega Grants. So this is me typing on an uh, Enigma machine. That's uh, the machine that uh, World War II, a lot of young sci Mr. smart Faraday, scientists want to break This is it. the talented pupil I mentioned to you before. Mr. Faraday explored a series of experiments demonstrating the connection between electricity and magnetism. So we call him the father of electromagnetism. This is Faraday's lab. This is a circuit that you can interact with. Of course, the compass and magnet, invisible forces. This is Austin's discovery for the first electromagnetic apparatus. MPS right hand over there. This is Nikola Tesla. Tesla coil and Tesla tower. How about Earth's climate? You can adjust the year and see our world. This is Babbage's difference engine using finite differences to calculate polynomial and Ada Lovelace. It's very this is a bomb machine more than designed by Alan Turing. All right, all right. Watch me carefully. Watch Chain me carefully. of Logic. Shakespeare in some line stream. Archimedes, Dante, Inferno. All right. And what? Well, let's hear what add. Science VR is like more like a classroom lab. You can learn stuff. Like, for example, Michael Faraday. Um, he is like the teacher of the classroom and he teaches us magnetic fields and how magnets um, make energy. Michael Faraday is like the science teacher. The first is you get the idea and you learn something about them. And then the second part is when you get really interested in it and you keep um, want to um, play it again and again to see which details you didn't notice before. And the third part is when you really want to search up other books to um, help you study about them. So that's uh, some comments from Ed. Actually, the video was recorded about one and a half years ago, almost two years ago. So I want to take you to some of the, the immersive science lab we built, ADAS engine. We rebuilt ADAS workshop based on her publications and also some of our imagination. and. So this machine in the middle is the analytical engine, where, um, if I quote Ada, she said that this machine can be used to um, program um, poets or even music. And the machine would do exactly what you want it to do. And, and she called it um, this, this kind of science. It's a science of operations. So if you put one step after one another, so that becomes a procedural. And the machine will, will follow procedure to execute one after another. And in this case, we, we redesign analytical engine and with a piano keyboard. So our, any users who doesn't know about programming, they can create some inputs from the keyboard, just like you play piano. And use some use those handles and buttons to to modify 
the inputs, which is exactly like a, like a program. So uh, as you tinker around the piano keyboard and and the control panel, essentially you're you're building your first musical program. Galvanic frog. This is where electricity was used to to um, like live. Um, well, electricity was used uh, around the, the animal bodies, and Galvani found out that uh, a frog found that twitch when you put uh, metals around around it. But in fact, it's not really. Um, Electricity what was not from the frog, it's from the two metals, two different metals, and touching each other. So in in this experiment, experiment, our users will be able to discover and explore, explore and discover how what 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 kind of combination of metals will make the frog let twitch. And this is actually very important because it leads to the discovery and invention. Um, of uh, a battery. Curious elements, uh, mercury and pierre we, we want to bring their journey of discovering um, polonium and radium. Uh, so those two elements was um, when they were when they were working together th those, those were the two elements they, they discovered by purifying pitch blend and 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 they named those two elements themselves. Carol's Riddles. This is a um a, a VR, VR experience that blends two books. Uh, one book Alice in Wonderland and another book uh, The Game of Logic. Uh, both books are written by Lewis Carroll. Carroll himself was, was a mathematician and logician. So this experience, we want to challenge our users to think about symbolic logic by solving riddles. And this is a fun one. Archimedes' heat rate. This one, our users will go back to the ancient Greek to help defending uh, enemies coming from the coastline by pointing mirrors, mirrors at them. And of course, you have to calculate um, geometry and trigonometry to, to figure this out. And you're part of the, the early Greek mathematician uh, story. Shelley's creation. I think we have a video for it. Visited Switzerland and became the neighbors of Lord Byron. Then it proved a wet and genial summer. And incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German into French, fell into our hands. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron. I busied myself to think of a story. A story to rival those which had excited us to this task. One which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror. One to make the reader dread to look around, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. sci-fi and biology. And Shirley, Mary Shelley, she was the author of Frankenstein. Richard Feynman. So I really like the quote that he said, science is hard because it takes a lot of imagination. And in, in this experience, we are, we are making one of his um, inventions that led him to the Nobel Prize the Feynman's diagram. So in this diagram, um, you can you can play with the combinations that electrons and other particles interact with each other, and 
by interacting with each other, you can also control the flow of time. For example, if a uh, electron moving through the flow of time, and a positron in Feynman's diagram, it's equivalent to um, uh, electron, but that carries positive charge moving back in time. And so, in in this in this experience, we let you to use your hands to experience what is Feynman's diagram, what is electron, what is positron, how they are different. And when they interact with each other, there might be light and radiations. So um, I worked through a few science labs and they're, they're, just, they're not the full list. And the full list is that I'm we're thinking about maybe you can build a, a scientist, philosopher, thinker encyclopedia in virtual reality. So this this image is uh, the Temple of Aten, and with Plato and Archim and and Socrates in the middle, and I think there are some some more um, thinkers around, and I hope. We can build this kind of universe where, where any learners they can, they can go inside the story first before they start to learn anything, and if they find out what they want to learn, and they're interested in learning that more, they, so, they can go for it. They can see and explore, um, thing, great stories in the history that will lead them to the knowledge that that we uh, that influenced uh, our society today so i think that will be fun it's like wiki of uh, a lot of stories but in in vr when we bring science vr to to museums to places our users always lined up and when they are lining up they chat about science and and they help each other to to figure out things. This is a, this is a wonderful um, thing to to witness because <laughs> um, it's not only like they are learning science, but they are like chatting um, and having fun together. One of our um, young learners said that I just experienced this, the future of education. And we were, we were presenting in schools and conferences, museums, and it's it's quite interesting to see young learners. They can, they can, um, learn about how to use controllers and navigate through this virtual environment, and also learn something from it. Take home th those memories with them. What we want to do is, is very like uh, this image where Michael Faraday, he was lecturing and doing live demonstrations to women and children and to the general public so that science is not only belongs to certain group of people but belongs to the public. So anyone who can put on a headset and witness how science was discovered, and use your hands to tinker, and participate, and be part of the the uh, historical story. This is what we want to do. Okay, so this is the second half. Half I want to talk about the game development for young learners. I'm going to talk about two case studies, um, Aaron, and and Ed. Then this is a photo that we went to. A hacker sound together, and in the back, of course, there are VR headsets and gaming laptops. For Aaron, he was a high school intern. Now he's in college. Uh, he was a very good, um, self-motivated student, at, and he, I think, he learned coding before being our intern, and 
uh, he was interning at a very early s stage of science via where we, we don't have um, uh, published any immersive lab yet. And at that time, he helped, he helped us to study and research Charles Babbage's difference engine. And all by himself, and he, he helped build the first prototype uh, in, in, in VR so that we can have our other users to, sh to share what he built. So he, he did research and he dig into Charles Babbage's publications to figure out those gears. So those gears are a way that Charles Babbage used to represent numbers. If you think about the T's on the one gear, so those are very like very much like numbers. Like if a, a gear has ten T's, that will be one to ten. And if you want to calculate two plus three, so you turn that two to turn you can turn two T's and then turn three T's more. That represents two plus three. So um, by uh, arranging those operations, you can actually uh, compute fairly di complex uh, polynomials. That's when ba Babbage, Charles Babbage find out by building a machine that he can uh, use that to calculate um, uh, polynomials and to help bankers to calculate uh, the interest, for example. And our intern Aaron, he studied uh, this machine. I think that's um, it's quite it's quite good for for high school to take on as a project that they have to master uh, a historical idea and and build it. So the second one is, we're going to talk about Ed. Um, he's been um, working with me to build games. So I serve as a, a mentor, mentor and coach, and we we were um, attending hackathons, and he also present uh, his game in science fair, school science fair. Um, this is the the photos that we we took during the hackathon and in science fair, where he he built a, a he built. A project that make math more fun to learn. The tool we use is Unreal Engine. Uh, I think this is a very powerful tool for young learners because it has uh, this visual programming part. It's it's very it's quite similar to Scratch that has a visual uh, interface. However, in Unreal Engine. This is this is the game engine where the triple A studios they use the game engine to build high quality games that that um, we can download it from from console from iPhone from PS4. So this is a very powerful tool and with a visual programming uh, interface. Um, I think because of the, the visual interface, it's make it much easier to follow when when there's a YouTube uh, video because um, typically they will talk about how it works and and will will play around the the visual interface and do demonstrations and so that uh, it will be I think it's for for young learners the visual way it's it, it make it much easier for them to learn. For Ed, not only we 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 try uh, Unreal Engine, he's quite good now. He consider himself as a intermediate uh, game developer, um, and he's making games and having fun with it. Um, we also try uh, have having him to learn about Python programming. Python is much much more abstract compared to Unreal Engine because Game Engine is quite visual and there's 3D 3D elements of it and uh, it's more like a game. For Python, you basically work with strings like 
a series of uh, char English characters. And to process those thing, those characters, and it takes some, it takes some trainings. So we took, um, we having took some Coursera Python course related to stream processing. However, uh, I I found that it's hard to motivate him to do Python programming. So I I also got inspired by from other YouTube videos from Com AI about to process coronavirus genomic uh, using Python. Because the genomics there, it's a huge string uh, with only four characters, ACGT. And so in this way, I think it motivates it to, to do this inquiries of, of nature as well as uh, doing Python programming. So um, we talk about Ed and it's been attending hackathons with me. I think hackathon is also a very good place where you can spend the, the weekend and um, and do some hands-on exercise. I think the hands-on practice is super important uh, for mastering the skills uh, that he learned from videos. We 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 work together almost like every day since the the pandemic because of school closure. So usually I I'll send him some YouTube links for for the task he he want he needs to to do um, f for the, this week, and of course I'll be around for him to ask questions. I think that's also an important aspect to provide a supportive environment for, for him to um, not get too frustrated when bumping into things that he cannot overcome. So um, a lot of time he was watching, the, watching and following YouTube videos and tutorials. Um, I think practicing, in, practicing um, daily it really helps, and of course, uh, a good coach and tech assistant around him to solve things that might stop him to learn. That's also very important. Okay, um, so in this presentation, we talk about immersive science lab. That's mainly from science VR's uh, virtual labs by providing this playful learning environment where our users put on a headset and we will teleport them into the historical stories and allow them to be part of it and using their hands to, to tinker around and to, to learn about ideas that influence our modern society. We also talk about game development for young learners. I present you two case studies. One is our intern, high school interns. Another is my son who is uh, programming with me. So th I think the key things uh, are we need to enable them to tinker. So we, we need to provide this supportive environment where um, if they have questions, they, can, they were able to get answers quickly. And, and providing uh, a good materials. So for Aaron, it will be historical stories. For Ed, that will be the games that he, he wants to build and have, have fun. And that, because that's, uh, that's what drives them to move forward. All right, so I think this is it. Uh, this is Jackie Lee. And thank you very much.
Hello, uh, my name is Elton Glass with GRX Immersive Labs. I want to say thank you to an XPRIZE and Engage platform uh, for our presentation today. And I'm here with uh, my co presenter and uh, partner in education and storytelling, Dr. Kima Wilson. Hello, welcome everybody. XPRIZE, it's such a pleasure to be here with each of you. I'm so excited to be pre presenting with Alton today. So the title of our presentation is called Storytelling in Action, the GRX Immersive Labs Way. And just a little bit about myself. Um, my background is uh, film and television. I'm a director, producer, and I fell in love with virtual reality about five, about five years ago. And I just really love what uh, virtual reality did for my imagination. And it really, really uh, showed me that, you know, coming from 2D film into VR, that the uh, imagination is frameless. And, and it taught me how to tap into my childhood and my imagination again and to think outside the box and that the possibilities were endless. And, and from there, uh, I really realized just how powerful this could potentially be for education. And I was inspired by the rise of Innovative Learning Labs to take this on and, and take the immersive content we were doing and to move into the educational space. And then uh, connected with Dr. Kimai Wilson. Um, I've been a teacher at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Uh, now I'm a university professor um, in the Charter College of Education. Um, really focused on teacher education. So I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with Alton um, in developing the Verizon app that really pushes forth this whole notion of STEAM entrepreneurship and really taking virtual reality and storytelling to the next level. So uh, a little bit about who we are. Uh, GRX Immersive Labs, we're a collective of bold storytellers, revolutionary educators, and innovative technologists converging together to reimagine worlds in entertainment, education, and technology. And uh, we are a creative technology studio and research and design lab uh, with a dedicated focus on reimagining uh, how we leverage uh, emerging technologies, uh, virtual reality storytelling, and most importantly, as Dr. Kim Wilson said, uh, STEAM entrepreneurship. Uh, and our mission is to uh, break new rounds with virtual reality storytelling and uh, to be able to really, really uh, leverage that into our deep narrative analysis, which is understanding how powerful our own stories can be, how we can leverage our stories into these technologies to make them even more powerful and impactful. Um, our areas of play uh, are immersive content creation, primarily. As I said, my background is uh, traditional film and, film and television, so storytelling is, is the heart of everything we do. Uh, and so we focus on uh, virtual reality production, mixed reality, augmented reality, uh, a lot of creative production in general, uh, IP development, which is really important, and um, game development, and, and just all around intellectual property development. So just taking your ideas and uh, bring them to life. And of course, experiential learning uh, and developing experiential learning platforms is a key area of focus right now as we merge education and storytelling together with technology. And I'm going to show you uh, just a sample of uh, how we bring together uh, projects uh, at the intersection of uh, immersive storytelling and um, education as well. Uh, so we did a project uh, recently with Time, uh, for Time Magazine, it's now called Time Studios, uh, called The March, which is a recreation of the 1960s March on Washington with Dr. King where he gave his um, iconic I Have a Dream speech. And with that, we created an immersive exhibit uh, to really, really tap into how you can reimagine uh, historical narratives, uh, which was the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, and this was done in uh, collaboration with uh, Viola Davis, executive producer, and who also narrated this to, to really, really bring a whole uh, another element to inspire you uh, with her voice and her passion for immersive storytelling and education. So we want to play uh, a short video that uh, shows you just what that project took as we brought to life, uh, recreating uh, the 1963 March on Washington and um, leveraging some of the tools today to um, 
design uh, a 3D uh, rendition of Dr. King. The relationship between Time and Dr. King runs really deep. He was Time's Man of the Year, and he's been on the cover many times. And you know, we're speaking to the relationship that historically has existed between the two. So the March is, a, is an immersive installation, like stepping into a Time magazine cover for the 19th March on Washington and experience up close and personal with Dr. King in virtual reality. Uh, like we've never seen them before. We thought, imagine being able to stand in front of Martin Luther King while he delivers this speech. Now is the time! We're being in close proximity to history. That's where we began our journey. Right now, there is nothing like this in VR. The pinnacle of the challenges is the creation of Dr. King. To have it feel like you are truly looking into another human being's soul is very, very difficult. Um, but I really wanted to try to push that boundary and make a big jump in the industry towards uh, realism with virtual humans. To create a new blend of technology that allows us to do something that is as real as our digital humans for feature films in real time as well for things like VR. And uh, I think it's going to touch a lot of people out there in the country. And that's the intention. And Mole Hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Um, at this point, there's very sophisticated ways of creating a photorealistic 3D environment. Um, the process of getting digital humans that match the level of quality of that environment into a VR experience is still very difficult. So when we first started talking about this project and diving in, we were looking at a number of things that what we would call first. The special task that we had on hand for Dr. King was creating not only a realistic digital human in VR, but also historically accurate to a specific time. Um, and that time is 1963, on the day of the march. The process of creating Dr. King uh, requires a bunch of different teams, a lot of disciplines. And it starts with capturing our stand-ins and our facial bridges to MLK, scanning them through a wide variety of different facial technologies. Three, two, one, scan. Chris's face uh, shape and structure is similar to Dr. King, so it gives us a jumping off point to sculpt Dr. King without having to start from scratch. On top of that, we use a huge amount of reference photography as well as reference video so that the modeling team has something to match to. That's the first part. The second part is to cast a performer that can give the speech verbatim and use him as the driving force behind our digital Dr. King performance. We chose Stefan for this role because... Thank you. So, uh, for educators who uh, are interested in virtual reality, um, it, it's, it's been around for quite some time, but now, uh, as a result of uh, some of the newer, faster technologies and chips and so forth, we're now at a, at a space where we can actually um, use virtual reality. In a, in, a, in a way that makes it uh, a little bit easier to get into the hands of, of everyone. Um, you know, you have companies like Facebook and HTC Vive who are now making, and various other companies who are now making these technologies uh, usable to be able to bring them into the classroom uh, to be a very powerful uh, computing system for um, the generations now to uh, learn from. Um, and this is just a, a brief timeline. Uh, as you see the progression of it. Uh, but what, what I think is, is, is most important is when you look at um, the evolution of storytelling and you look at how you know students learn uh, whether they're watching videos uh, or they're picking up a camera, I think it's very important to see how things have evolved. And myself, being a storyteller, uh, you know, I came up when uh, we were learning 35 millimeter film and then that moved into digital. And now you have young people who are now using uh, cell phones to tell their stories. And not only that, they're, they're creating their own enterprises, their own businesses. They're becoming social media influencers. 
Um, and I think that it's very important to understand how to make sure that you can adapt to the changing times and educating um, the, the next generation on how to use these tools to adapt to the changing times and embracing the technology transition. So like as a result of COVID, now we can see that you know a, a lot of um, new businesses are going to be born as a result of COVID. Um, and a lot of companies and a lot of schools are seeing ways that they can now uh, be more proactive and being prepared for these, these shifting times where education is, is going to be a very, very big need uh, for us to continue to collaborate and communicate. So we want to make sure that, you know, uh, we don't get left behind with technologies. So one thing we like to talk about, especially when you think about youth and education, is meeting the youth where they are. And this is just sort of showing you the convergence of technology and entertainment where a lot of young people are already inside of these platforms, um, such as, you know, the boom of YouTube, um, uh, Netflix, of course, Facebook, Instagram, all of these different technologies um, and, and platforms such as, you know, the iPhone, Google's, uh, are where young people are accessing their content. And to be able to leverage tools now like virtual reality that are being deployed within all of these systems is a great way to reach them, to give them some um, uh, interactive ways to learn uh, through the use of technology and immersive technologies. And what I really love about um, these new technologies and how they're being made is you have a lot of young people who love to play games, right? So what they don't know is whether you're a storyteller, you're a filmmaker, a digital creator, or a developer, uh, or even a hardware engineer or software engineer, you have a convergence of all of these different disciplines that you traditionally were siloed back in the days, right? Where now all of these young people, these, these industries are coming together. So now you have STEM, which is now, of course, STEAM, where you're able to bridge all of these different disciplines to come together. And, and, and virtual reality, augmented reality, or the immersive economy as a whole is a great place to introduce the, these, these different disciplines and these career fields, uh, which is great. Uh, and then you can see all of these different platforms, uh, especially with game development, which is a very big one because you know the kids are playing the Fortnites um, and, and the Pokemon Go's. Um, and, and so this gives us an opportunity to create more immersive technology programs and to get their hands on some of the entry level uh, technologies to start being able to get an entry point into immersive storytelling and leveraging the virtual reality tools. So here I'll show you a, a program that we have uh, that takes young school, students in high school and bridges them into uh, West LA College where we have an immersive media program. And then we also have a program with Verizon Innovative Learning where, we, where we're teaching the students, where we're teaching the students early on about these immersive technologies by, by doing that virtual reality career day experience where they can meet STEM professionals in virtual reality and hang out with them. Join me as we get ready to take these students on a ride they've never had before. You got your headset? This program is about being able to take career day and encapsulate it into a virtual reality experience. These young men are able to get up close and personal with role models and entrepreneurs working in areas of STEM and see that they can do this themselves. Students were able to see how technology is used in careers and entrepreneurship. The kids really got to see that you can actually create a business out of virtual reality and you can have creative opportunities to make VR from scratch. We hope that through that, they'll have a plan to be able to succeed and enter the pipeline into STEM and access to resources and money and careers. I'm pretty excited to see what ideas they bring to the industry. Our partnership with Verizon Innovative Learning is one of our core missions as we continue to build and level the playing field because technology is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. So, I want to talk a little bit briefly about immersive tech readiness, right? And that's the process of preparing individuals and organizations to adopt and deploy immersive technologies such as VR, AR, MR, or what they call XR, cross-reality or extended reality, as a means for increased engagement or collaboration. And uh, as you can see again, COVID-19 uh, has definitely 
rapidly accelerate the use of a lot of these technologies. As you can see here, we get an opportunity to come into the Engage platform to be able to uh, communicate and still do our presentations. And with students, one of the things I really enjoy working with Verizon on is we were able to build an application that had cross-platform uh, capabilities so that whether you were in VR, whether you were on a desktop, or even down to the lowest common denominator of a Chromebook, students still have the ability to engage with each other through an immersive experience. Kima, uh, so, when we, so when we think about really educating our youth of tomorrow, right? We have to think about technology needs your voice. The biggest thing that I've always hear as an educator is that students often feel in the educational landscape, they have no voice. So one of the things that GRX Immersive Labs, we're very intentional on really empowering students to design their future, right? It's the foundation because we know that the future is now. We know that it is very important to understand how we create a level playing field for future generations, particularly in the tech field. Look, we all know the statistics are very dismal as it as it relates to underserved communities actually participating in STEM. And so one of the hallmarks of GRX Immersive Labs is to really think about how can we increase um, underserved and minoritized communities to really be a part of this virtual reality space and really empower them in their own educational goals. So we do that by really looking into What's your DNA? And when we talk about the concept of DNA, we're really thinking about it from the standpoint of deep narrative analysis, right? We understand that everyone has their own unique story that they are bringing to a classroom, to the world. And so it's very important at GRX Immersive Labs that we begin to create programs that actually bring out students' DNA. And so let's dig deeper into what is this deep narrative analysis all about? Well, one of the things that GRX Immersive Labs, we're really intentional about revolutionizing education. And what does that mean? That really means we wanna create experiences that showcase technology as an equalizer, right? We know that if we are able to empower students to become their best selves, really begin to develop a STEAM identity. Very early on in the educational process, they have an opportunity to change their communities, change their families, and eventually change the world. Because we believe that imagination is frameless. Uh, we want to really encourage everything that we design, Alton and I and the rest of the GRX team, we are very conscious that anything we design, we want it to be an opportunity where students have an opportunity to think outside of the box. They get an opportunity to really explore STEAM entrepreneurship through critical thinking skills, through doing collaborative activities with each other, particularly in the Verizon music education module that we're currently designing and working on. One of the things that we thought we really wanted to empower students to go in and really begin their own learning and really take ownership of their learning, right? We want to position the teacher to become more of a facilitator of knowledge. And because kids are coming into classroom spaces with a wealth of information. And so we feel that every product that we design, we want to make sure that that ingenuity and that genius is to the forefront of every virtual reality experience. And to do that, we know that we had to have self-guided experiences, right? You don't need to ask permission to, to be great. We want you to create, we want you to explore, and we want you to expand your horizons and really make the learning experience crafted to what you want it to be. With that, create, build, prototype. Talk to us, Alton. Yeah, so rapidly prototyping, I think it's never too early for young students to start to build their portfolios, start to create, you know, so that so that they're they're learning uh, and they're doing, learning and they're doing. And that's one of the, the philosophies that really helped me in working with Dr. Kima Wilson and our uh, team is, is getting their hands on the tools and being able to get them to insert themselves uh, into everything that they do so that they can understand you know, early on, what problems can they learn to solve? 
not only uh, te technologically, but also within their community, right? Uh, what stories can they bring to life so that they can uh, share and increase their cultural competency for each other and other peers in their classroom, right? And, and, and I think most importantly is making sure that they're, they're creating and building and prototyping is because not only that, like I said, technology, uh, we know is, is outpacing so many different areas uh, in different fields. And we want them to be able to uh, gain those new skills, those, those, those skills that will help them adapt uh, and, and evolve and create those transferable skills so they can, they can constantly be growing um, as they continue to create. Um, and, and, and one of my favorites is um, making sure that they understand that it's okay to want to um, go out there and build your career and, and to get a job, but we also want to make sure that they understand how to be investable versus just employable. And, and knowing that they, their DNA is a part of them understanding how they can take control of their destiny. And I think it's, it's a twofold part where educators are now becoming storytellers because they're laying the foundation for these young people to understand that the most important story they ever tell is the story they tell themselves first. Um, and uh, Kima, would you like to uh, add anything to that? And I just really love the fact that one of the things that we're really conscious about at GRX we want students to be investable and employable. And we know that the futures of tomorrow really are going to be housed in entrepreneurship. And so we just want to prepare our students to maximize that opportunity. And why is immersive education important? Because of this emerging industry, right? So if you look back, uh, it took maybe 100, 100 years, or you can see now, for the traditional Hollywood system to be built. But as you can see, when they started to build that industry, they started to tap into the USC's, the NYU's, you know, and then you had a, 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 a large amount of young uh, filmmakers out there who went out there to create their own lanes and their own pathway. And now you're starting to see this new ecosystem being built with all of these large tech companies. You got the Facebooks who acquired um, Oculus for $2 billion from a young man who was building a development team in his garage and he did a Kickstarter for to raise money for the, one of the first early VR headsets. So being able to get these students to understand that they can go out and they can build these types of opportunities for themselves, I think is very, very important uh, because this, this industry is growing and we're at the very, very beginning you know, with the precipice of, of a great opportunity for them to take an industry to build and create the language and the grammar of what this new immersive economy can be. So not only are they learning at the same time, they're preparing themselves for, for an ecosystem that they're going to continue to build. And, and with that, you, we know what's, what's going to be needed. It's going to be hardware needed, software is going to be needed, and all these new platforms, you're going to need developers and creators most importantly. You might want to add to that one. So the opportunity, creative entrepreneurship. And one of the things that we have in GRX Immersive Labs is even if you don't want to start a business, learn to think like one. Because we want our students to be able to problem solve. We want our students to be able to take the opinions and the advice from co-creators and co-collaborators that they work with. And so in every educational model that we design because a part of storytelling is also making sure that you listen to other voices and make sure that other voices are heard and so creating an atmosphere and creating a space these are amazing tools that really help students become creative entrepreneurs and really bust down the doors of virtual reality And I have this one of my favorite ones is when I talk to kids when we go to different schools and they'll ask you about a job or, or a business and you and they'll say, Well, how much money do they make? Right? And you tell a kid, Oh, this this particular career makes six figures, their eyes light up. And you think the kids don't necessarily really care about that. The kids like to earn and they like to, to, to learn and earn as well. And I think it's really important, it is never too too early to teach them about 
what these opportunities uh, present uh, when you go on certain career fields and certain tracks. Um, and, and even understanding, you know, as, as um, educators, where are the investments, where are the acquisitions, so you know where these industries are going and how to prepare these students to be prepared for that, that immersive economy uh, or what some would consider this, this next fourth industrial, um, uh, new industrial revolution with all of these new uh, technologies that will impact how we live and how we learn. Um, and I think that's very, very important because especially when you start to think about how VR has now started to impact so many different various industries. And then with the next wave of that, implementing things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, these are things that kids can learn about now uh, that they're already using in their hands when they're playing video games uh, and, and they're trying out these new apps. Uh, being able to get them to understand how to unpack those things takes them down uh, a road of discovery uh, that allows them, like Kim and I talked about earlier, of, of, of uh, unpacking new opportunities for themselves and, and learning as, they, as they're doing the things that they love. And here is just sort of a landscape, I mean, of, of companies that have um, started as a result of the immersive economy growing year after year. Uh, all of these jobs, and, and, and most importantly, what's amazing is look at um, all of these, uh, a lot of these are startups. So, you know, when you look at one, you got to imagine at least, you know, three to five jobs uh, are being created. And as that, as you continue to go up, you know, you look at the larger companies, the Facebooks, the Sony's, you know, the LG's, you know, you're talking about thousands and thousands of employees or what we consider entrepreneurs and also entrepreneurs supporting each other. So this yeah. is a, a very large landscape of opportunity for the, for the next generation uh, as they get their hands on these immersive technologies uh, when you're teaching them and to even educate them on uh, the landscape as well. Because you'd be surprised, a lot of these companies uh, and these tools that they use, you know, they, 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 they love sort of, sort of like Fortnite. You know, when you tell kids about Fortnite and then they start to unpack the company that, that created Fortnite called Epic Games, and then you start to teach right. them about, well, how did they make Fortnite? They made Fortnite with a game engine called Unreal Engine. And now Unreal Engine has uh, educational workshops where teachers can teach through Fortnite. So, uh, you know, that really, really gets them going. Um, and then we have, you know, virtual reality experiences, many other experiences that will allow them to learn and, and, and not be just consumers, but also producers. Um, and again, like we said, meeting kids where they are, this is the playground for them. Um, when you look at places like the esports landscape, right? You have companies like Amazon who acquired Twitch. Um, and, you know, and then you have um, Apple, they're buying motion capture companies now. The things that you see in your phone, where you know, that, that the kids are doing like, uh, what is it, Snapchat? When you, when, you tell, when you teach a kid about Snapchat, what's really behind the mechanics of Snapchat is you know facial recognition technology um, that allows them, or augmented reality technology rather, that allows them to be able to create these emojis that move um, to their face. They really get excited about uh, understanding what's underneath the hood. Um, and then you have uh, at Niantic Labs, you know they did Pokemon Go. This company was originally the company that developed Google Maps. So when you teach kids and you say, you know what, you know those little cameras that you roll around and you see with those bubbles around different neighborhoods? Those are 360 cameras that are capturing the entire landscape um, and, and putting it up in the cloud for you to be able to go on Google Maps and see certain neighborhoods and communities. So those are, are, are opportunities for them to learn how to get new trades, skills, and new opportunities for themselves. And of course, you can't forget PlayStation. You know, they have a VR console. And a lot of these young people are using computers. Yeah. So NVIDIA, you know, they're making a lot of the chips. So there's so many different things that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they can be unpacked um, and, and take them on a road of discovery um, of opportunity. Um, and, then, and then what you end up seeing is, again, it, it falls right back to STEM, where these things that they're learning by doing are things like 3D mapping, navigation, uh, 3D capture, 3D content capture, um, eye tracking, audio, you know, there's so many different areas that 
uh, you would just never really think about until you start to really dive deeper into what you can teach and what they can learn. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, uh, the beautiful thing about the convergence of um, technology now and storytelling is that storytellers and technologies are coming together. So now, even though you might not be the type of student who may want to code, they're making programming languages that allows you to still be able to exercise your talent as an artist to be able to still be able to create. And that's one thing I love about bringing them all together so that they now, no one's left out of creating in this new tech, technological landscape. Uh, and I'm gonna play uh, one more last video just to show you um, how we're we able to bring in you know, some of the, the young students from college and get them uh, prepared early as they move their way into uh, college, preparing themselves for leveraging immersive technology. Today was an activation day and I thought it couldn't have gone any better. Everybody was having fun. It was nothing but smiles. I think the students' response to the VR workshop was really nice to see. They were excited about it. It isn't our traditional pathway. It's new for us. My students were really impressed with each other's work, which I thought was awesome. You know, we teach them traditional filmmaking, so um, how to set up shots from that vantage point. And I think the wrapping your head around the 360 camera and that new world and those new possibilities, that's the piece that I feel like the students have been coming up to me and talking to me about, was just this new world created by this 360 camera. So I thought it was really impressive uh, what JRX did. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for people who are just on the traditional film track because immersive media kind of offers you kind of a side door into the industry. You can find a lot of opportunities that you might not get otherwise just because you're doing something that's a little bit more niche. When I attended Hollywood CPR and West LA College, it, it gave me the confidence and the foundation to go out there and get real world practical experience. And that later helped me transition into the local Economy Union and then ultimately into the Directors Guild of America. And I've continued to keep that foundation with me, not only as an individual, but I've also made sure that we continue to use that in GRX Smart Labs and creating that safe space for creators and entrepreneurs and artists and technicians to continue to grow their craft. We talked about uh, the march uh, earlier on, um, and just one thing that's great about immersive tech is that even though when you're creating these virtual reality experiences and stories, it gives you an opportunity to make uh, subjects refreshing and bring new in new insights and perspectives. So one thing I loved about the march was uh, our challenge was how do you take um, the civil rights movement and certain aspects of the civil rights movement, uh, especially with Dr. King and bring something refreshing to it. Or, or our, and our challenge was what they call the nine word problem. You know, when, you, when you're in school and you learn about civil rights movement, you learn about it in nine words, which is Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, I Have a Dream. And, you know, we, we do this from, you know, from the time you're in kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. And we wanted to figure out, if we want to take an experience like the march uh, on Washington, how do we bring something refreshing uh, to this experience. So we wanted to, so it gave us an opportunity to dig deeper into the nuances and the stories and the unsung heroes that were a part of the March on Washington. So so opportunities like that we had to create curriculum. So, so not only when you finish the VR experience, you learn about the rich history of what it took to create the March on Washington. When you come out, there's more information to really learn about how you can continue to uh, be uh, an advocate for change and to be able to move forward and you learn about other people who contributed to the march outside of just uh, the people that you, you learn about through mainstream media. So it, it gives you an opportunity to redefine narratives in a very, very powerful and meaningful way and young people to have an opportunity to take on these new technologies and bring in their culture and their point of view, their perspective uh, that you often may not see. Uh, Kima, you want to close us up, bring us home? 
So our, the question that we really ask a lot of the time is, are you immersive ready? Right? And we know that the immersive economy has a shortage of skills, content, and new talent to meet the demand. So that is why DRX Immersive Labs is very cognizant that we are concerned about educating the next generation because we know there are amazing content creators sitting in first grade, sitting in eighth grade, sitting in 12th grade, right? And so we want to equip them with the tools and the knowledge to really meet this immersive time. And so one of the things that is very important, even as out to show the different companies that are leading the way, we are very, we're very aware that in order to prepare our students, we've got to think in a much bigger way, right? We've got to think about how are we designing educational models in virtual reality that really taps into that student that loves art, taps into that student that loves music, taps into that students that love to go behind the hood and really think about what the software is requiring you to do. And so those are all skill sets that are really going to push students and catapult them to be immersive ready. And as the world becomes our new desktop, what can students develop or create to help build the immersive economy? I, as a teacher, I had a lot of students who had a lot of family members who dealt with various medical issues, right? Whether it ranged from cancer, whether it ranged to HIV, they all had different techniques that they were actually utilizing to help their family member either eat well or just live a more quality of life. And I found that a lot of the system, the current traditional systems that we have in education didn't allow students to really think deeply. And so those are the very students that have some of the cures and they are the ones like Alton said earlier, that are engaged in the Facebooks, that are engaged in various technologies. And so tapping into their knowledge, we actually can find the cure for a lot of social and health issues that we currently face in our world. And, and as GRX Immersive Labs always says, there are riches in the niches, right? And so it's time to really go out and tap into those spaces um, where kids are bored in classrooms, where teachers are not really leveraging all the knowledge that exists. GRX Immersive Labs is poised to create virtual reality content, artificial intelligence content that really reimagined education and really centers our students' knowledge. Uh, this part wraps it up um, on our presentation, Storytelling in Action, uh, Immersive Storytelling in Education. So we just want to say thank you to XPRIZE uh, for a wonderful opportunity to present Storytelling in Action, the GRX Immersive Labs way. Again, my name is Alton Glass, CEO of GRX Immersive Labs. I just want to say thank you. And I'm Dr. Kimai Wilson, definitely. Thank you, thank you, thank you, XPRIZE, for this opportunity for GRX Immersive Labs to really show you an opera showcase all the amazing work that we're doing around immersive education. So thank you so much. We look forward to interacting with you all virtually again. Richard Garriott, and I have been a member of the XPRIZE family since its founding. And I am very excited to speak to you today about the challenges and potential of virtual learning environments. As some of the other speakers in this series, I myself am a bit of a non-traditional learner. In fact, I consider myself one of the first successful products of the self-taught through self-curated videos era. In school, I was a uh, BC student at best, yet I found a way to shine through independent self-paced projects like science fairs, which I excelled at. This allowed the faculty at my schools 
to give me the latitude to take on more independent projects. And I flourished with their great support on my independent exploration of computers. By the time I finished high school, my career as one of the very first ever computer game developers was already well underway. When I went off to college, as my business income soared, my GPA shrunk. And ultimately, with my family's blessing, I left school to run my first company. And while my family expected that era to eventually pass so I could finish my degree and get a real job, at this point, I don't think I'll be returning to school, at least not as a student. You know, I am an example of how, with the right tools and a motivated mind, one can, in fact, not only get the basics of an education, but rise to the top of a field through hard work and sufficient access to appropriate educational content. But I've also learned, by direct experience, about the competition for a learner's attention. You know, whatever the platform, whether it's videos or computer screens, potential learners are bombarded with other non-educational uses of the same technologies, often produced at even higher levels of quality than much of the educational content. This makes leveraging these platforms especially challenging. Let me illustrate this uh, with some stories out of my, my own games. The computer games that I'm best known for was a role-playing series called Ultima. The series started in the late 1970s and is responsible for the modern use of the term avatar, which I will discuss shortly. And the series also spawned the first massively multiplayer online game, or MMO, with a game called Ultima Online, and its successors continue to this day. Through more than 40 years of creating that game series and its follow-ons, I began to recognize the power of role-playing. When I would get fan mail, even for my early primitive works, I realized that players were reading and interpreting my work in many unusual ways. As humans seem to do, they would often speculate, fill in gaps, and interpret a broader meaning than I had ever intended. And while this was generally harmless, I quickly realized the impact I could have by laying a more purposeful foundation in my work. You know, my, my earliest games had simple stories about hunting monsters, gaining power, and defeating a primary antagonist. But players quickly learned that the shortest paths to victory often included morally questionable activities that the game allowed. For example, you could steal from the shops in my games, and while the guards would chase you off, players still exploited these behaviors, all while supposedly on the path of being the savior of the people. And at the end of my games, all my games, my personal character in the game, Lord British, asked players to write to me in the real world and tell me of their quests. I then and now send players who write to me a personally signed certificate of their accomplishments. Interestingly, most who wrote to me after winning in these early games also told me their stories of cheating. So I resolved to make my next game in such a way that while I still allowed a moral behavior, the world would respond more realistically to directly show that amoral behavior would lead the in-game society to decide that you were not their savior, but in fact a rogue unworthy of helping, often working against you. The characters that you might steal from would quickly quit helping you and ultimately work against you in the game, and in this way, cheaters never prospered. You know, at this time in computer games, your persona that you played was generally referred to as your character. <clears throat> your character might be an evil alter ego, and thus you might enjoy pretending to be evil. Evil, But for this game, I wanted you, the real Earth human, to feel responsibility for the actions of your character. And I had come across the term avatar in Hindu texts describing the term as the human incarnation of various gods while they visited Earth as the God's avatar. I adopted this term and created a game fiction that not only called your character your avatar, now in, in my fictional world, but your avatar in the game world uh, also started with a psychological profile test that created its initial conditions in my game world. This was the first use of the term avatar in computer games, but as you know, this uh, term has now become uh, quite ubiquitous. When this game was released, it became my first number one bestseller, and to this day it is seen as a watershed moment in gaming. You know, many people wrote to me about how much they learned through playing the game, 
how their actual personal morality had been affected. And in fact, the New Yorker magazine recently published an article called The Computer Game That Led to Enlightenment, as this is the 35th anniversary of the publication of Ultima IV, Quest of the Avatar. You know, the game showed me that by making the play experience relevant and personal, not only can I make an even more successful piece of art, but also that this new interactive digital art form had potential far beyond what I had ever imagined. All the games that I've written since have attempted to speak to players at a deeper level, to speak to current issues and real life problems, and all of those stories are recast as deceptively as possible into my medieval realms, but they're all packed with as much learning as I could possibly cram in. So throughout the decades, I've often been asked, you know, why don't you or others just make one of your AAA games as a full-on educational experience? And for many years, I started to believe that this was just not possible. And for years, the, the market at large failed to produce very many AAA educational experiences that rose to the level of self-sustaining financially. And I believe that this was largely due to the competitive landscape when trying to captivate someone's attention on these digital devices. Now, I've been in this industry from its inception to the current day, from a time when bringing in $100,000 of revenue in a game was an exciting new threshold to cross. Yet uh, today, uh, now the costs to make a AAA uh, title have reached over a billion dollars, and the revenues of AAA games are often in the multiples of billions of dollars. You know, computer gaming related experiences are now far bigger economically and by social impact than all movies, television, books, theater, and other forms of art combined many times over. Esports now commands as large or larger audiences than physical sports, but it remains a hit based business. If you make one of the top 10 products in a winning category, you can win big. But after that, it gets tough fast. And the majority of computer game-like experiences do not make returns commensurate with their costs. Because of the profoundly difficult competitive race for the consumer's attention, anything you do that is not laser focused on how do I reach the top 10 adds great risk into reaching the top 10 and thus financial viability. You know, I regularly tell people that someone who, as someone who sees the potential power of interactive education, that the price of entry is so high and the odds of earning back your costs are so low that to try and make a self-sustaining educational AAA product that was commensurate with its costs was folly. You know, people would then often lobby me to consider making a budget experience with donated money. But my answer remains similar, that no one would play or stick around in an experience that didn't compete with the AAA alternatives on their digital devices. And, and for many years, uh, this seems to have remained true even in hindsight. The good news is we finally seem to be moving beyond this limitation. Computing devices have finally become so powerful and the reality engines that we create for them have become so readily available that just looking and playing well is no longer one of the key challenges to developers. And finally, since competing purely on graphical bells and whistles is losing absolute dominance, we're also seeing great, massively successful experiences that both abandon the best reality engine look and contain great content that bridges the gap from pure play and begins to move into focused learning. Now, my favorite example of this bridge is Minecraft, which I expect most of you here know well. You know, I happen to love Minecraft not only because it's a great game, but because it's organized in such a way that, that players can quickly move from being pure passive consumers, which they are in most you know, gaming experiences, to actual contributors. You know, first using the world editors to reorganize their own play space, but then by making mods to the game, uh, some even will add their code, their own code to the game and ultimately share or even sell their mods to others. And so Minecraft remains one of my most highly recommended, ex recommended experiences for parents to buy for their kids. You know, um, 
Recently, developers have begun expertly crafting MMOs with a strong educational focus. My uh, favorite current example is called Adventure Academy, which was recently launched by Age of Learning, the makers of ABC Mouse. <clears throat> you know, and while I was personally critical of the slow tech used by ABC Mouse, kids didn't seem to mind. The product did very, very well. well. And, and the company's, the company's new, new offering, offering is, a, is, is great across, across the board. The board. It, it is, is a beautiful, a beautiful integration, integration of all the classic, classic MMO features, features which encourage and reward participation in educational quests. Uh, the, rewards the rewards that kids, kids earn uh, and share, uh, get to, they can share their constantly improving avatars and homesteads uh, within the world. Which brings me to this final section, you know, where we are today. You know, for decades, I've claimed to simultaneously be one of the world's greatest virtual reality enthusiasts, hoping beyond hope that we were close to seeing AAA MMOs in virtual reality, uh, which I hope to be the first to create and have throughout my career. You know, in fact, a fun little side fact is that I was the inspiration for James Halliday, the creator of the Oasis in Ernest Cline's Ready Player One. But simultaneously, I was always sad to realize or come to the conclusion that uh, true, true self-sustaining AAA virtual reality, virtual reality worlds for profit or education remained even further off. I was usually convinced it would be 10 years or more, no matter which decade you asked me that question. You know, today I actually believe we have the pieces necessary to finally begin to truly open this door. Events like this today are a great sign. You know, the newest light wireless virtual reality headsets are also essential. The quality reality engines that are now broadly available are essential. Still, I would argue that the door is just open a crack. It remains to be proven whether we can open it wide and keep it open, but I am now finally hopeful. But remember, any new experience, pure entertainment or educational, are competing for the same audience hours. The on only the really great content, uh, content will ultimately survive. <clears throat> Fortunately, we now have examples of all the pieces. We have great examples of educational experiences driven by AI. We have great educational experiences in compelling open social MMO environments. And we now see great VR experiences as well. I hope and believe that we all, as members of the XPRIZE extended family, can manifest this reality. And since I hope some of you listening will either make or support a team in making this reality come true, I offer a few brief tidbits from my lectures on virtual world creation. For example, do your research. You know, good fortune in my mind is the intersection of preparation and opportunity. Another adage I like to chat about is that no one enjoys an experience that does not run well on their machine. You have to make your experiences stable, fast, and fun in that order. Obviously, if it's not stable, it won't be fun. If it's not fast, it won't be fun. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a final one is that, uh, you know, this work is hard. And, and often bigger teams don't help. You know, your, your development, when you start one, can either be on time, on budget, or on quality. And you can only pick two of those. The third one will often go far out the window in support of the other two. You know, with that, I will begin wrapping up here by repeating that, you know, uh, I really believe that the challenge and opportunities are both great. Experiences which are deeply meaningful, personally responsive, and connecting humans to humans for the betterment of all are now possible. This is the time to demand them for our students. This is the time that uh, creators can create them. But the realities of the hit-based world of digital experiences must still be met. No half-baked ideas will see the light of day. Only the best skilled creators, driven by passion, supported by strong mentors, and sufficient capital, will lead us to this bright future. So I thank you. a really great time today at XPRIZE Connect's Future of Learning Lab. My sincerest gratitude for spending time with us, and if anything, I hope you leave here today feeling energized and fired up 
inspired and motivated and ready to take action and get the work done. Let's use our collective power to become a global movement. So when you get home, make some actionable goals. Say to yourself, I'll implement that strategy in my organization as soon as I get back home or set a timeline by which to do so. Also, be clear on this goal and how it affects you and others and get an accountability partner. Be proud. You are a part of the future and your zest, zeal, and love for positive change has brought you to X Prize's first fully immersive virtual event. You are a part of history. If you're looking to stay up to date on all things X Prize, Follow us at XPRIZE on all social media platforms. And you can find XPRIZE Connect at go.xprize.org forward slash connect or email us at xpconnect at xprize.org. Thank you so much for coming today and being excited and inspired to go and implement new projects, programs, and ideas. And I'd like to close by quoting the great Shirley Chisholm. She once said, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. My name is Monica Groves, and on behalf of the X Prize Connect team, thank you for coming today. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, Endless, who supports Connect's gaming-related programming to catalyze innovative ways of learning.